Sunflowers and Lilies, Fort Wayne Daily Gazette, 16th of February, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sunflowers and Lilies Reposeful, soulful-eyed Oscar is here. The Gazette Aesthete has a long and pleasant chat with him on the too utterly utter and the too intensely beyond. Oscar Wilde, the much-talked-of and heralded on every breeze aesthetic young English poet, who lectures at the Academy tonight, arrived last evening on the Pittsburgh fast train from Chicago, and went at once to the Aveline House, where parlour number eight was assigned to him. As he did not arrive until 9.15, he complained both of hunger and weariness, and asked that he might not be disturbed. However, the young gentleman who looks after Mr. Doyley Cart's interest in the lecture tour acted as mediator with the great aesthetic, who, at 10.30, after Oscar had rested himself for an hour, ushered the Gazette Apostle of the Lily and the Beautiful up to the room of his Gamaliel. When the reporter and his escort entered, Mr. Wilde was languidly reclining upon the sofa, which was artistically draped in a bearskin robe and mauve-coloured travelling shawl, reading a crimson-bound volume of Joaquin Miller's poems, of which he is a great admirer, and in whose writings, he said, he takes renewed interest since he met the wild poet of the Sierras a short time ago. Oscar warmly grasped the hand of the Gazette Aesthete and politely waved him to a seat, and then immediately, but languidly, returned to his recumbent position, daintily helping himself meanwhile to a fresh cigarette from his silver case upon the table. The first glance sufficed to show that he is all that fancy has painted him. He is a very tall and graceful youth. The much-talked-of golden locks were parted in the middle, and hung in wavy masses down upon his shoulders, framing his large expressive features. He wore the oft-described grey travelling trousers, a mouse-coloured velvet smoking jacket, a magenta neck scarf, and slippers each embroidered with a golden sunflower surrounded by a spray of silver lilies, while from the side pocket of his jacket peeped a crimson pocket handkerchief, presenting a tout ensemble worthy of the gaze of gods and men. As he puffed the fragrant cigarette, the reporter asked him how he liked America and his trip so far. He said, I like the Americans very much. When I first read what the newspapers said about me, I was indignant, but now it amuses me. The audiences grow more respectful, and I am delighted at the hearing Chicago gave me the other evening. What do you think of Chicago with all its vim and push? Commercially, it is a wonderful city, but knowing the millions of dollars that have been poured into the city to rebuild it, I was surprised at its poor architecture. There are no artistically beautiful buildings in the city. How do you like American railway travelling? It is very tiresome, and if it was not for Howell's novels, I could not endure it. He is your best novel writer. Being told that Genevieve Ward was at the Academy, and that the reporter had just come from there, Mr. Wilde said, I should have been glad to attend her performance. She is a very fine actress, thoroughly artistic. I knew her very well in England, and the author of her play, Forget Me Not, which, by the way, is an old play to us English people, is an old friend of mine, Mr. Herman Meadowvale. What do you think of American actresses? Clara Morris is your only artiste. She is beyond criticism. What do you think of Mary Anderson, our rising young American star? Well, she may be a rising star, sir, but it will take her a long time to rise. I saw her as Juliet, and I regret it very much, for I look upon Shakespeare as something sacred, and it was torturing to see his finest play so murdered. How do you like American hotels, as compared with English hotels? 
in england we really have no hotels worthy of the name they are so grand and gloomy that visitors once inside of them will submit to any extortion in order to get out of them from this point the conversation became general and learning the writer had lived for several months in london that great capital and its society was fully discussed the poet being intimately acquainted with all its scholars and nobility making a very fascinating running commentary on them at this moment the coloured valet who accompanies him ushered in a waiter bearing the great aesthete's dinner it consisted of a huge steak smothered in mushrooms a dozen raw oysters garnished with sliced lemon some saratoga chipped potatoes all flanked by a bottle of piper hydesick champagne extra dry all making a meal much more substantial than the odour of the lily or the bloom of the sunflower the supposed aesthetical diet and as the poet prepared to move on the tempting repast his confrere of the gazette bowed himself out mentioning as he did so an article that had been published in the morning about east thetics as compared with west thetics and which mr wilde expressed a great desire to read and at once sent out for a copy of the gazette containing it on the whole mr oscar wilde oxford graduate and poet is no ordinary man he impresses one as being an exceedingly clever and intelligent englishman with a knowledge of art and literature excelled by few men of the present day and whoever misses hearing him this evening will miss the event of the season and which the elite and intelligence of this country have crowded to hear from fort wayne he goes to detroit thence to cleveland cincinnati louisville and st louis he will later in the season lecture in dubuque indianapolis and several other western cities having more engagements than he can fill he is also busily at work on a new drama which will soon be produced in new york it deals with russian nihilism end of section oscar wilde the daily sentinel fort wayne sixteenth of february eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain oscar wilde the latest american craze arrives in our city a sentinel reporter accorded an interview last night oscar wilde the languishing young englishman who is just now coining money from the insatiable desire of the american people to run after novelty of any sort arrived in the city accompanied by his business manager j s vale and attended by his negro servant an american addition to mr wilde's service by the way wilde was met at the depot as number six came in by a number of curious people but with his face muffled and his head buried in the folds of his ample english ulster faced with seal he strode towering over the crowd from his drawing-room car to a hack in waiting and was driven to the aveline house where he was assigned parlour eight though mr vale the manager said to a sentinel reporter that mr wilde would be happy to accord an interview the representative of this paper in consideration for the aesthete's fatigue and hunger postponed his visit until this morning the apostle of art does not rise at an early hour and when the reporter was ushered into his room at eleven o'clock oscar was found just about sitting down to his breakfast a substantial one by the way and which was prepared under the special direction of the african servant who occupied a respectful position behind his master's chair as the sentinel man entered wilde put on his professional air and languidly looked up with a very slight and artistically controlled yawn this remarkable young person though not an exponent of the brawn and muscle of england is tall and compactly built and his frame shows signs of its fine physical development at a period before he set himself up as the saint oscar the patron of decorative art 
and when he was stroke oar of St. John's crew, Oxford. His brown hair is worn long, and curls as it falls over the ample collar of his velvet coat. His face is square cut, utterly without sign of beard, and the expression of the face is sullen, except when an occasional smile lights up his countenance and causes him to part a pair of very kissable lips, and display a range of white and even teeth. This morning he was clad in a crimson silk dressing gown of Turkish pattern, hand-painted with lilies and girded about the waist with a gold cord. His feet were covered with flesh-coloured silk hosiery and encased in slippers, of an oriental pattern heavily ornamented with gold cord, and into the decoration of which neither stalks, lilies, or sunflowers entered. The reporter was cordially received, and after some desultory conversation, the interviewer said, You must devote considerable of your time to the reception of representatives of the press, Mr. Wilde. Yes, sir, and I do not begrudge the time. You American newspaper men are wonderful fellows. I talk a moment to you, and you go off and write two-column interviews. Have you been fairly treated? Yes, in the main I have. The American paragraphists have made something of a caricature out of me and my views on art, but I am amused by their fun at my expense. How do you like America? I am coming to like it much as I travel more. I have so far seen little that is distinctly American, there are few things in your cities which differ from the ordinary humdrum of London life. A portion of State Street in Chicago is quite like our Regent and Oxford Streets in London. Did your Chicago experience please you? Yes, sir. I was treated handsomely there. Chicago is a very wonderful city, and I have longed to see it. In my lecture I had occasion to say something about some of their architectural eyesores, and I presume my remarks were not appreciated. The social life of Chicago, I found during my brief experience of it, to differ little from that of Park Lane in London. I found in Chicago more cultured and travelled people than any other point I have visited save New York. How about Boston? You do not certainly place the culture of the Chicagoan on a higher plane than that of the Bostonian. I mean to say, my dear fellow, that I found more cultured people in Chicago. May I ask, Mr. Wilde, the nature of your mission in America? It is to briefly discover those men and women who are susceptible to artistic development, and to give them best opportunities to expand. On the other hand, we take those persons in whom there dwells no capacity for artistic vocation, and produce in them that artistic temperament without which there can be no individuality in art, no actual joy of life. In a word, no civilization. How do you purpose to accomplish this? By making art not a luxury for the rich, but by accustoming the people from childhood to colour and design in their homes. What do you think of American architecture? You have none. In this respect, the American people need to improve. In the cities I have found few public buildings which pleased my eyes. Most of the buildings are rococo in construction. Mr. Wilde here signified his desire to attack his matutinal meal, and the reporter was about to take his leave of this very charming young man when he was motioned with a graceful wave of Oscar's white hand to keep his seat on the sofa draped with a pair of very fine skins. Mr. Wilde then showed his visitor a note from Miss Ward, asking him to attend the performance of Forget-Me-Not last night. 
please say that miss ward is a very particular friend of mine and i should have delighted to run in on the last act but fatigue prevented me i was quite worn out the reporter then prepared to go asking mr wilde how he liked the flourishing metropolis of fort wayne the day is bad and i shall be forced to remain within doors i would have liked to look over your city but must i fear content myself by taking observations from my window mr wilde is a charming conversationalist very little affected in his manners and in brief impresses us as an interesting enthusiastic and eccentric young englishman whose views however visionary is thorough earnest about them a pleasant souvenir of the visit was a copy of wilde's poems the fly-leaf being traced in his own spidery handwriting compliments of the author oscar wilde end of section wilde the cleveland leader twentieth of february eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain wilde the advent of the apostle of aestheticism he readily consents to be interviewed his lecture on the english renaissance what a correspondent thinks of the illustrious visitor he came yesterday on the afternoon train over the lake shore road by he is meant the great apostle of aestheticism the man who proposes so far as lies within the power of one person to revolutionise modern english and american art and bring us to a true conception of the beautiful and a perfect understanding of the graceful if he fail in this attempt as fail he may it is evident that mr wilde has another object in view and this latter purpose is more apt to result in full fruition than the former he has an advance agent and a business manager the same as any other attraction and is fully prepared in other respects to increase the size of his bankroll as his preparations for producing a regeneration in art are much less elaborate than his arrangements for swelling his own exchequer and extend beyond nothing but suggestions without any practical place it is fair to presume that mr wilde's creed was adopted merely as a means to an end and is not the moving cause in his present tour to the energy and enterprise of mr will j cotton the cleveland public is indebted for a sight of the much advertised one the terms five hundred dollars per night made the prospect look misty for a time but mr cotton perfected an arrangement and brought the gentleman here the encounter mr wilde was met at the n y p and o depot by mr cotton and by him escorted to the forest city house at five o'clock as per previous arrangement the aesthetic young man of the leader called at the hotel and was presently shown into the presence of mr oscar wilde the gentleman received his visitor with cordiality not too cordial but just the exact degree and requested him to be seated having done so the reporter took in the surroundings mr wilde had caused his coloured servant to cover the tete-a-tete with a silk shawl of an old gold tint and over this a bearskin a small table had been brought out into the centre of the room and on this rested a small teapot one of the impossible blue kind in which the ladies of two centuries are gone delighted a pair of cups and saucers to correspond and a box of cigarettes were the only other articles on the table a pencil portrait mr wilde is a splendidly formed man of six feet or more in height his head is large almost ponderous and well set on powerful shoulders it is an undeniable fact that mr wilde is most too fleshy he wore a tightly fitting sack coat of brown velvet 
vest of the same material and loose trousers of a subdued tint but of very self-assertive cut his throat was encircled by a pale green tie and the corner of a handkerchief to match stood out in relief against the brown of the coat a large seal ring made gesturing with the left hand somewhat wearisome having satisfied his yearnings by a careful inventory of property and person the reporter by way of beginning asked what shall we do to be saved with reference to art only what you need in america are good art schools academies of design they are the absolute essentials of aesthetic development and progression the great popular mistake is that art should be of a national character people forget that the great schools of art have been purely local there never was a national italian school of painting every city in italy had a different school from venice to naples they were unlike but all beautiful the same is also true of the styles of embroidery and metal-working will you explain to me your conception of true poetry the essence of all art said mr wilde is a combination of perfect freedom with perfect beauty if you ask me what attitude our school adopts toward poetry i will tell you a great deal of careless and bad work has been strutting about the world sheltering itself under the name of inspiration we don't care to discuss what inspiration may be but we feel that it possibly belongs to a man's private life and as a rule never appears in his work we think that poetry is an art like the other arts with rules and laws a thing not to be kept as many young poets have for moments of deep depression but an art dependent primarily on beautiful workmanship a young poet like a young painter must study the great masters of style and must be able to use language as a musical instrument he should be a master of perfect technical excellence romantic sentiments and moral maxims are not the essence of poetry may i ask why people generally associate you with sunflowers and lilies asked the reporter i will tell you why we have so loved and valued the flowers mentioned it is because they are the two flowers of england which are the most perfect in design and which lend themselves most materially to decorative art giving the handicraftsman the most beautiful motives but you must remember that there are no flowers in the valleys and gardens of england which we have not and will not use in the service of art the flowers to be used in america are your own not ours you do not need to borrow our flowers any more than our money then as regards satire and caricature rebellions in politics are shot down rebellions in art are slandered it is the surest sign of the strength of any movement that it should be assailed by the impertinent insolence of ignorance and folly do the doctrines of your school extend any further than decorative art and poetry we embrace all the arts and in this the real strength of the movement lies art must no longer be the individualized expression but must be democratic it must be an art that can appeal to the enormous masses of the people an art that will not be a luxury for the rich but the atmosphere in which men and women are to grow up how do you like america as far as you have become acquainted asked the reporter preparing to leave to begin with america is not a country 
it is a world every city has different types and there is no permanent type at all as regards her men and women i think the society delightful i find new york brilliant and cosmopolitan philadelphia literary baltimore pleasant washington intellectual boston more like oxford than any city you have the people in chicago i found simple and strong and without any foolish prejudices that have influenced east america i found the audiences in chicago very sympathetic and it gives me a sense of power to sway such large multitudes it is grand in fact the side of your american civilization those of us in europe who are watching your young republics are most interested in is not the east but the west we want to see what civilization you are making for yourself and by yourselves during the conversation mr wilde refreshed himself by frequent cups of the potent oolong fusion and blew out vast volumes of smoke inhaled from the fragrant old judge segret the lecture half past eight o'clock last evening found an audience of six hundred persons at case hill awaiting the advent of the lecturer with impatient interest the audience was composed of the most intelligent and refined people of the city some of whom had attended from curiosity others from a desire to hear the lecturer expound his views promptly at the appointed hour mr oscar wilde strode forth and stood before his audience he was attired in a dress coat white vest and knee breeches of a brownish colour his hose were of a dark purple silk and his feet encased in patent leather pumps on which the absence of heels and presence of large black rosettes were equally prominent the unshorn mane of the social lion hung in well-kempt masses about his shoulders in their descent partially concealing the large oval and somewhat heavy featured face a sea of white shirt front a silken cravat white kids and a roll of manuscript completed the ensemble the lecture was carefully prepared and in sections even powerful mr wilde's language is well chosen although somewhat inclined to be flowery every part of the effort gave evidence that the lecturer is a man of uncommonly fine education and no ordinary amount of ability but a meagre synopsis of the lecture which was somewhat over an hour in length can be given in every great country is produced every year a certain amount of artistic power which may be used or squandered it may be storm on the sands or it may build beautiful cities your poet would make a bad business man your painter a poor banker the business of the age should be to take them from their poverty and build for them schools of design it is my purpose to tell you of what we are doing in england for the working people and in spite of what is said to the contrary you will find that the aesthetic movement has a very practical object there was a revival of this kind in germany among the universities during the last century the old professors and students living in garrets spent their time in attempting to discover a formula for the expression of the beautiful perfectly content meanwhile to live in garrets and permit their people to do the same what the life of a nation is its art will be if the people are noble the art will be lofty and beautiful if the people are ignoble so will be the art no matter how grotesque there will be some type of art 
we are now trying to bring together the handicraftsman and the artist as they were in the days of grecian art when they are separated the art dies sculpture at athens and painting at venice reached its height of excellence by the intermingling of artist and workman it was a potter who taught the sculptor to design and a decorator of house walls who taught the painter how to properly conjoin and mix colours the quality of workmanship lies not in the earnestness of the workman but in the power of design beautiful designs cannot be produced unless the workman be surrounded by beautiful objects compare the surroundings of the italian artists with those of to-day they lived in the midst of groves and gardens palaces and beautiful buildings noble men and pure women a beautiful sky above a majestic river and picturesque mountains on either side he saw the noblest motives about him and the result is seen in the eternal life of the art the artist of to-day is surrounded by unsightly buildings and people of deteriorated morals hideous advertisements decorate not only the buildings but cover over every beautiful rock or disfigure every grand view the country over under these circumstances art is sure to die do not think that we are opposed to machinery and new inventions we reverence machinery but let us not decorate it nor permit it to make our decorations nor mistake material aids to civilization for civilization itself shrieking slander into a tube or speaking folly through a wire is no benefit to the world an englishman whirls through italy at a rate of forty miles per hour and the only remembrance he has of his journey is that he had a poor dinner at rome or was cheated at verona and on the contrary the fiery steam-breathing locomotive that carried aid to burning chicago did as beautiful an act as angels could have done to produce a beautiful art we must surround our workmen with stately buildings beautiful objects adopt a simple and bright dress for the men and women then we would have beautiful and noble designs we would create a standard of faith something to set before the workman and say this is beautiful designers must not design first and colour afterward they must design in colour work in colour and think in colour here in america you have the primary elements for an art school all about you these are a clear atmosphere healthy strong physique of the people and the only additional requirement is a sense of individuality in each man and woman this is the keynote find your motives for sculpture and painting in the meadow at the gymnasium on the dock a nation can produce with safety in art only what it has nearest its heart let the japanese designer keep his silver-winged stork you have the turkey let the greek keep his lion the buffalo and deer are for you the motives for art are inexhaustible in this country i know of nothing more commonplace in design or valueless in execution than modern jewellery and we ought to change it the spirit of the movement in england is to have nothing in the house we use which does not give the woman pleasure in making or afford the user pleasure in using art should be taught to the children 
bring a boy up in an atmosphere of the beautiful give him a mind before trying to teach him develop his soul before setting about to save it we want everything beautiful preserved in art we want your beautiful flowers which are never seen in england to live in the decorative art there is nothing in the commercial spirit which is the keynote of your institutions which is opposed to art the beautiful cities of europe were built by the tradesmen do not let your young artists struggle along in poverty lift them up make their paths of youth through asphodel meadows and the american art will live for ever come and gone the cleveland herald twentieth of february eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain come and gone wild sunflower six feet high blooms only to fade away from the city its opinion of art its views on newspapers it lectures it smokes cigarettes it is dined and wined oscar wilde and servant of england room fifty five that was the legend which a herald reporter read upon the register of the forest city house saturday afternoon about five o'clock a card asking the courtesy of an interview and assuring the notorious stranger that the writer would be both brief and unaggressive soon found its way up to the room of the aesthete and by return porter an answer was sent granting the privilege asked but craving ten minutes time in which to finish a midday repast in precisely two minutes the reporter stood at the door of room fifty five and rapped with gentle timidity mr wilde did not answer the summons in person his coloured valet opened the door and ushered the caller into the presence of the far-famed apostle of the lily and the sunflower oscar was lolling on an elegant sofa and did not rise until his visitor had crossed the room he then arose slowly extended his hand reluctantly and pointed the reporter to a chair beside his own luxurious divan in the centre of the room was a small unaesthetic looking table at which the languid poet had just dined the viands which remained unconsumed were just such as would be looked for in the menu of the aesthete jellies custards pastry etc all served on decorated china the sofa upon which the poet languished had offended his fastidious taste and he had accordingly caused to be spread over it an afghan and a silk shawl of an old gold tint mr wilde himself was attired in a velvet coat and vest of brown and substantial-looking pair of ordinary pantaloons in personal appearance he is exactly what the prevailing photographs represent him to be save that a pair of rather obtrusive front teeth are displayed in conversation which have failed to appear in any of the representations of the poet his face is even more smooth and girlish than would appear in the photographs and caused to flit through the scribe's mind the horrible suspicion that oscar has never yet had occasion to shave between his thumb and forefinger he held a dainty cigarette which from time to time he thrust between his rubicund lips puffing the fragrant smoke above his head in circling clouds that delighted his yearning soul mr wilde began the inquisitor kindly but firmly may i inquire what first resolved you of your mission and inspired you to champion this modern aesthetical movement well my passion for art was greatly encouraged if not created by a visit to italy when i was a boy then subsequently at oxford i was greatly influenced by raskin i was also much pained and saddened by seeing how unkindly all of england's great men were received especially her literary men how byron shelley keats wordsworth and all the rest were ridiculed 
this i now conceive to be the fate of all prominent men who depart from the commonplace in any degree and i am no longer disturbed by it then you are able to take philosophically all the sarcasm and good-natured fun which has been directed at you since you came to america philosophically well i don't mind it in the least at the very worst it can only amount to a personal inconvenience as though someone sought to throw mud at you while you were crossing the street why all innovators must be indestructible in crusading against the popular stupidity and stagnation i expect to hear ridicule but i am absolutely impervious to it it doesn't interfere with my serenity or my fixedness of purpose at all it is not done from malice and what is the use then in being troubled by it it is done by a world which cannot understand that has not been educated up to the aesthetical movement how would you have the world changed i would create an artistic temperament i would surround men with elevating environments that their lives might be beautiful this is the secret of all joyousness in life and the keynote of all civilization this artistic temperament and it cannot be produced in any other way than by giving the people an opportunity to grow up in an atmosphere of noble and beautiful things i think that every year in a great country in america as much as in england a certain amount of artistic intelligence and power is produced and that the aim of any rational civilization is to seek out those men and women who have this power of design this nobility of imagination this love of the beautiful and by means of a school of design in each city to give men an opportunity of producing beautiful art you in america don't want that we should look upon you as a mere collection of money-making merchants you would like to influence the civilization of europe you are ambitious and should be so but the only way you can influence us is by producing noble art and a noble civilization believe me that we value your american poets much more than your american millionaires and that we estimate you by the amount of great men you have produced not by your hoarded wealth that's a rather severe implication mr wilde evidently you place a rather low estimate upon american art and civilization when comparing them with english art and civilization why my dear young man said mr wilde springing to his feet with a show of real enthusiasm and addressing his visitor earnestly do you really think that american progress in these departments can be compared with that of england the abashed reporter hung his head in mortification and the poet went on can you seriously compare your art with ours i have just been in chicago and while there i saw millions and millions of dollars sunk in public buildings but i failed to find one single architectural triumph your poets are not to be compared with ours the press sat down upon of course you have been misrepresented in the papers mr wilde would you care to disclaim at this time some of the things which have been identified with your aesthetical movement my dear sir responded the aesthete when i read all this trash in the newspapers about someone whom the editors are wont to call oscar wilde i really wonder what the young man is like after all and wish that i might see him myself if it really mattered in the least what the newspapers say i might take pains to refute some things but it won't pay then you don't have a very high idea of american journalism you know well enough how artificial and meaningless it is if you have been in the business at all the press is comic without 
being amusing or fair nothing which i read by way of criticism gives me pain nothing by way of commendation gives me pleasure who are the editors anyway most frequently they are from the number of escaped convicts and other depraved characters the reporter only weighs a hundred and twenty-five pounds so he smothered his desire for revenge and did not annihilate the six-foot sunflower on the spot besides that he did not care to mar the furniture or gore up the carpet he left and the aesthete still lives to roam through america End of section. With Mr. Oscar Wilde, Cincinnati Daily Gazette, 21st of February, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. With Mr. Oscar Wilde, the Gazette acts as Cicerone to the great aesthete. How he looked like and what he wore his opinion of america and american art doing the aesthetics of cincinnati oscar's views on men and things in general mr oscar wilde arrived in this city yesterday morning from cleveland en route to louisville where he is to lecture this evening he remained over a day wishing to have a preliminary glance at certain objects of interest here before his return on thursday for his lecture on the english renaissance at the grand opera house on the afternoon of that day a gazette representative having early information of the arrival of the great apostle of aestheticism called upon him at the burnet and was duly requested to follow his card to parlour number sixty two where mr wilde was bestowed the poet and aesthete was found rather languidly reclining upon a couch over which was thrown in careless grace a rich fur-lined railway travelling rug smoking a cigarette in a thoughtful mood there was a litter of letters upon the table in the midst of which was a magnificent basket of roses pink and red which mr wilde explained were a rest and comfort to his soul after the horrors of a railway journey against the side of the room stands a battered but substantial english leather box which the gazette representative gazed at reverently in the pauses of the conversation knowing that it was the casket which contained the silken raiment which has excited the rage of the heathen in two continents mr wilde is curiously like but yet utterly unlike the model of the organ of the philistines punch and the fact reminds one of the proverb that a lie is never so dangerous as when it has in it a modicum of truth the large long face framed in thick locks of brown hair parted in the centre and falling on either side of the cheeks almost to the shoulders which gives to it a certain womanly air is de maurier's but in place of the vacant stare is a bright smile and a perpetually changing expression clear grey eyes a tall and manly figure a carriage the perfection of good form and a bearing that bespeaks him a thorough man of the world he wore a morning suit of like mastic coloured tweed the coat of velvet a little pronounced in the matter of braid a pale red silk handkerchief drooped from the breast pocket and matched in colour the ample neckerchief knotted in sailor fashion beneath his low-turned shirt collar he was faultlessly shod in patent leather with grey gaiters and wore no jewellery but a very large seal ring a fine antique intaglio of mercury cut in amethyst with this he seals his billet doux and those other winged messengers which have roused the dull british philistine from his vulgar lethargy or anyhow have showed him the true path out of the mire mr wilde was most cordial 
would the gazette act as cicerone and show the stranger rookwood the school of design the art museum why certainly if the gazette desires one good thing more than another it is to stimulate the zeal and devotion of the people and make room for what is purely true and precious in art meanwhile what does mr wilde think of america i am pleased with it it has great possibilities each city in the years to come will be the centre of a school of art as is venice florence rome it is folly to talk of a national art there is no such thing each city has its centre of inspiration in florence the inspiration was of a religious type god and the angels in venice it was the noble men and women of the republic in rome traditions and noble deeds i am especially delighted with the west it is so new and fresh and the people are so generous and free from prejudice the older cities in the east mr wilde said musingly blowing little rings of smoke from his lips the people are enveloped in a perfect mist of prejudice quite unlimited they have imported so many old-world ideas absurdities and affectations that they have lost all sincerity and naturalness the boston philistines made the aesthete have a thoroughly bad time evidently you have no architecture no scenery but individuals are doing beautiful work and you have great art possibilities in what direction america is the country for a great school of sculpture because it is dependent upon the sunlight which you have and is an art which depends absolutely upon present and active conditions of life and not upon remembrance of tradition i met in chicago mr wilde said reflectively a young sculptor whom we would love and be so proud of if he were in europe a mr donohue he reminded me of the old italian stories of the struggle of genius born of poor people he felt a desire to create beauty seeing some workmen modelling a cornice one day he begged some clay of them and went home and began to model a man who saw what was in him gave him money for a year in paris he went and has come back the way i found him was he sent me a little bas-relief of a seated girl illustrating a verse of my poem requiescat i went and saw him found him in a bare little room at the top of a great building and in the centre was a statuette of the young sophocles leading the dance and the song after the battle of sedemis a piece of the highest artistic beauty and perfect workmanship waiting there in the clay to be cast into bronze it was by far the best piece of sculpture i have seen in america meanwhile the artist starves upon a radish and a crust the stoics fare perhaps he will win in the end and trouble is light if one is an artist a man is not successful said mr wilde sententiously but truly because the world praises him but because his work is good what have you seen commendable in a decorative way in your visit many good houses in philadelphia boston and washington and i have seen a daisy miller i cannot tell you where this in response to eager questionings because i am to go back there and i should never be forgiven but the sight of her has increased my admiration for henry james a thousandfold colonel john hay of cleveland with whom i lunched yesterday 
has a charming house but the room which has most impressed me was a little bare whitewashed room in camden town where i met walt whitman whom i admired intensely there was a big chair for him and a little stool for me a pine table on which was a copy of shakespeare a translation of dante and a cruise of water sunlight filled the room and over the roofs of the houses opposite were the masts of the ships that lay in the river but then the poet needs no rose to blossom on his walls for him because he carries nature always in his heart this room contains all the simple conditions for art sunlight good air pure water a sight of ships and the poet's works i saw another of your great poets in his beautiful home mr wilde looked out of the window into the smoke and mist and sighed it was a day to make the children of light to sigh and the heathen to mock and rage this kind of weather he continued consoling himself with a fresh cigarette always gives me a sense of failure i am always on the side of extremes in winter i would be always slaying in summer always in a summer garden of flowers i went to see longfellow in a snowstorm and returned in a hurricane quite the right conditions for a visit to a poet when i remember boston i think only of this lovely old man who is himself a poem and the bright party of men i met at dr holmes's at one o'clock mr wilde donned his green overcoat trimmed with otter adjusted a boncelaine rosebud in his coat lapel drew on a pair of pale tan-coloured gloves and with an ivory stick in his hand and a brown stiff felt hat on his head was driven first to robert clark and companies where he selected various books among them the works of howells james miss mclaughlin and others and thence to rookwood the school of design the art museum whose doors were inhospitably closed and a half hour was delightfully spent at the delightful home of mrs colonel nichols on the grandin road by request of mr wilde his impressions of the art industries of the city are not made public he will embody them in his lecture on thursday afternoon mr wilde has a keen and quiet wit that enlivens his conversation upon worldly subjects delightfully when shown the school of design with its forlorn corridors and dark rooms his eye lighted on the legend no smoking painted in the window great heaven they speak of smoking as if it were a crime i wonder they do not caution the students not to murder each other on the landings such a place is enough to incite a man to the commission of any crime and then most unkindest cut of all i wonder no criminal has ever pleaded the ugliness of your city as an excuse for his crimes the suburbs mr wilde kindly approved seen through the rain and mist the stately villas of grandin road were quite english with their green sweep of turf and crowding chimneys of all men mr wilde least loves a critic let the poet sing he cries and let the artist paint and let the people look and listen and so they would and learn too but the critic a kind of middleman comes between them and like the bird in shelley's song shuts his eyes and declares it is night sometimes the critic himself lured on by a hope of fame paints 
or writes or sings and then a great and sacred joy fills the soul of all artists and his fate overtakes him the real critic should be a poet mr wilde thinks and in proof cites coleridge keats goethe matthew arnold the greatest of living english critics all poets and quotes with glee theophile gautier's reproof of a critic who lectured him on the iniquity of his ways it is of great advantage to a man never to have done anything but he must not abuse it i forgive everything the critic's ignorance even i applaud banthorne languidly from my opera box i greet de maurier blandly at the club but the unpardonable sin is to say i am impractical that is to stick a dagger in me this aesthetic movement is the first of any practical value in art in england it has changed the whole character of english decorative art it has given to every handicraftsman in england beautiful designs which are at the foundation of all good art we have relieved the whole english people from the incubus of the upholsterer he now exists only in the museums as a warning mr wilde looked in at the opera last night to see the diva and the audience and was in the manager's box for half an hour he leaves this morning for louisville and returns as before stated for a matinee on thursday at the grand end of section oscar wilde the cincinnati inquirer twenty first of february eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain oscar wilde the great aesthete in the city oscar wilde the aesthete arrived in the city yesterday and took up his quarters in burnett house where a representative of the inquirer met him late yesterday afternoon the original of bunthorne was reclining on a fauteuil when our ambassador entered his apartments he arose rather more quickly than poetic grace demanded and with a pleasant smile extended his right hand and gave him a cordial greeting in person he is very tall with broad shoulders and a plethora of arms and legs that is he has the usual complements of limbs but they appear longer and more loosely jointed than perfect accord with manly beauty requires his face is long and narrow and appears narrower than it really is on account of the length of his hair which is light brown in colour is parted in the middle and touches the shoulders like a dark flaxen mane his eyes are large and light blue in colour their outside corners are lower than the inside like a chinaman's though they're far from being almond shaped his nose is long large and aquiline and his mouth betrays his hibernian origin his lips being thick and the upper one so shut that his speech partakes somewhat of the character of a lisp his teeth especially the upper ones are long large and irregular his chin is protuberant and he has very high cheekbones his sack coat and natty vest were of cobwebby grey velvet hue with a cold gravy bloom his trousers were light in colour and loose and limp in make his shoes were of patent leather with buff gaiters and his low-cut byronic collar was encircled by a silk cravat that was tied in a sailor knot and was between a dunducketty grey and a dull pink in colour in the left lapel of his coat was a beautiful rosebud and he held another in his left hand whose delicate exhalations he ever and anon inhaled with evident rapture within easy reach stood a marble-topped table on which was a vase containing four splendid calla lilies whose faint perfume almost drowned the senses with olfactory delight as soon as the greetings were over 
and our guileless youth took the chair which was proffered him by mr wilde he began operations by remarking mr wilde i presume by this time you are sufficiently acquainted with the customs of this country to know that you are face to face with the ubiquitous interviewer oh yes smilingly replied the aesthetic apostle and i am glad of it for some of the brightest hours i have passed in this country have been with the gentlemen of the press who have interviewed me and i have found them among the most intelligent men i have met here taffy mentally ejaculated our reporter and then said how long will you remain in the city only until morning i am on my way to louisville where i shall lecture to-morrow evening then i go to indianapolis and on thursday i return to this city and lecture here to-day i drove to the rookwood pottery with mrs george ward nichols and inspected its work very closely how did you like it some of it was very good and much of it indifferent on the whole i was very much pleased as it showed what can be done for art even by one person as in the case of mrs nichols there is one young man named bowen at rookwood whom i am sure has true poetic art and fervour his productions are wonderful and he should be encouraged i am going to tell you something that i fear will shock you said our scribe shock me interrupted oscar yes was the reply several years ago one of our most promising young artists was employed by a number of our merchants to make a series of pictures for the vienna exposition he executed the commission his pictures attracted great attention and i believe received a medal what do you think was their theme indeed i can't tell hog killing well i don't know but even that could be treated in an artistic manner you see there is no such thing as a poetic subject no more than that there is a natural school of painting you hear people speak of the italian school of painting when no such thing exists the venetian style differs from the florentine as it differs from that of other italian cities each locality has its own school as distinct and separate as the towns themselves the so-called dutch school is remarkable for its warmth of colour and yet its subjects are mostly commonplace all through holland you will see pictures mostly of brawls and quarrels in drinking-rooms yet every once in a while you will see in one of them a gleam of light streaming through a window and tinting the glasses on the table with all the glories of the prism another will display a bit of colouring as warm and as sweet as the kiss of love the men who painted these pictures poetised the subjects until the ordinariness of their character is forgotten this shows that they were earnest and sincere and that their heart was in their work i have little faith in a young man who chooses what are called heroic subjects for his early efforts it looks as though he was depending on his subject and not on his powers for success the lowliest subject treated with loving earnestness and sincerity will if the artist is competent give the best results just as the plainest words are the most effective in the mouth of an actor i understand that you will give us a new lecture here inquired our representative what will be its subject decorative art was the answer will it contain any local allusions yes i think it will i think i will speak of what i have seen at rookwood wherever i go i try to see what there is of decorative art in it and i speak of what i see in my lectures i think it will be judicious to do so here as mr wilde's task in decorative art is unquestioned it will be seen that his lecture bids fair to be very interesting to our citizens in the evening mr wilde attended the opera concert at music hall and was the central figure in the director's box he was dressed in black knee-breeches and black silk stockings white vest 
and black dress coat with white tie and gloves his presence speedily became known to those on the o p side and many were the opera glasses that were levelled at him as he stood up in the box listening to patty and her supports during the performance he was taken behind the scenes and introduced to the diva end of section oscar wilde the cincinnati commercial twenty first of february eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain Oscar Wilde, the Apostle of the Aesthetic, visits Cincinnati, how he looks, what he has to say, and why he's here. Those who visited the Burnett House yesterday noticed at once that something unusual had happened. Proprietors, clerks, bellboys, and boarders wore a semi-amused, semi-puzzled expression, and the question was general have you seen him followed by what do you think of him him was the famous aesthetic apostle oscar wilde he arrived from cleveland yesterday morning and his entrance into the burnet was the signal for a sensation from which the dwellers in that hostelry have not yet recovered he was shown to a handsome apartment on the second floor soon after his arrival he remarked to his attendant that he felt slightly unwell and requested him to send for some flowers a smart young key clerk of the hotel who wanted to get a good view of the famous aesthete went to his room and asked what kind of flowers he would like to have he replied that he was not particular about that but flowers revived and brightened him when he was feeling badly the clerk immediately telephoned critchell to let him know how big a stock of sunflowers he had on hand intending to order them all the florist replied that he was out of sunflowers but that he was loaded to the guards with lilies and rosebuds send us three dollars worth mixed said the clerk the flowers arrived and oscar felt better in the afternoon he visited the rookwood pottery and paid his respects to mrs maria longworth nichols its proprietor at her residence toward evening a representative of the commercial called at the burnet and the response to a card sent to room sixty two was come up at once the reporter had read a great deal about oscar and was familiar with the great variety of pictures and caricatures of the poet but he was scarcely prepared for the reality in the southwest corner of the room was a sofa over it had been negligently thrown a fur robe covering about one half or more from the foot over the other half was a silken drapery cloth of old gold on the sofa reclined oscar in an exquisitely medieval attitude before him was a table on which were lilies and roses he rose gracefully and politely offered his hand to the reporter with a pleasant smile and then resumed his position on the sofa oscar looks precisely like his picture by sarony and not unlike many of the caricatures he is tall and rather powerfully built and would impress a sporting man with the idea that a thorough system of training might give him a chance for the middleweight championship his brown hair falls about his ears almost down to his shoulders and he has a feminine way of occasionally flirting it back with his hand his costume was a study he wore a sack coat and vest of the material so graphically described by lady jane as a cobwebby grey velvet with a tender bloom like cold gravy from the left pocket of his coat was a profuse display of old gold silk handkerchief and from under his low and rolling collar hung a large silk neckscarf of the same colour his trousers were of a somewhat similar tint made loose and his feet were encased in neat-fitting shoes made of patent leather and yellow morocco his conversation was almost entirely about art in spite of the fact that the reporter endeavoured to turn his attention to the river the streets patty concerning patty 
he said that he had been invited to go and hear her, and would probably do so. The three great arts, he said, were music, architecture, and decorative art. Of the ceramic craze, he remarked that people who can not paint pictures in oil or watercolours imagine that they can decorate pieces of china. He believed that only artists who had the ability to design could be successful in decorative art. The ability to design is a requisite of the true artist. Referring to his visit to the Rookwood Pottery, he said that he noticed several vases on which the decoration showed original design, and was sure the same hand had designed them all. He found that he was right. The artist was a Mr. Boehner. He paused in his artistic talk long enough to remark that the wretched weather reminded him of London, and to say that the streets of Cincinnati were horribly dirty. Instantly the reporter's opinion of the poet rose several degrees. During all his conversation there was the suggestion of a mischievous twinkle playing about his eyes, which seemed to say, This air severe is but a mere veneer, This cynic smile is but a wile of guile, This costume chaste is but good taste misplaced. Oscar's views on art are probably valuable, and they are certainly expressed in rich and flowing English. Indeed, he appears to have a wonderful command of the intricacies of his mother tongue. But, unfortunately, the reporter was too busy studying his physical peculiarities and eccentricities of costume to stem the flood of artistic eloquence, and, as he gazed at Oscar, he murmured to himself, if this young man expresses himself in terms too deep for me, why, what a very singularly deep young man this deep young man must be. The poet came here principally for the purpose of getting some idea of decorative art in Cincinnati. He intends to devote a portion of his lecture at the Grand next Thursday afternoon to this subject. He lectures in Louisville tonight. As the reporter walked away from the poet's room, he turned to the coloured boy who had been his attendant all afternoon, and said, Well, Charlie, what do you think of Oscar? With a puzzled shake of the head, he replied, Hardly know what to think, boss. He looks like an engine. End of section. English Renaissance. Louisville Commercial. 22nd of February, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. English Renaissance and its Apostle Oscar Wilde I find nothing unique in America, said Mr. Oscar Wilde, the distinguished English poet and apostle of art culture, to a commercialist who spent a short time in Parlour 101 at the Louisville Hotel yesterday. To a stranger like myself, it appears monotonous. Mr. Wilde was reclining easily upon a sofa, over which was spread a dark skin and a soft olive cloth of some kind. He leaned easily on his right arm, and his left was thrown behind his head, except when he removed his cigarette and puffed little pale blue circlets of smoke above the marble-topped table which stood directly in front of him, and upon which was a vase containing some lilies and roses, and a slowly settling glass of champagne that had apparently been just touched. The room was darkened a little, and the shutters of the window just behind his head were partially closed, throwing him as a picture into a soft but not indistinct light. It was a fine and graceful figure upon the sofa. Six feet of manly outline were displayed. He wore a dark olive smoking doublet, lined with rose-coloured stuff, and profusely ornamented with cord and lace. This was turned back from the throat, encircled by a low-cut Byron collar, at which a dark necktie was negligently knotted. 
his pantaloons were light and loose and limp the patent leather shoes pointed and topped with lavender gaiters in all these details there was only the suggestion of the tastes and appearance of other men of leisure in their smoking parlours the head and face however were remarkable and disappointing to one who had become familiar with his photographs which to say the least flatter him the face is very long sallow and oval the cheekbones high the chin prominent the nose long and aquiline his eyes almond shaped full and dark are unusually fine and intelligent embedded in the face as if upon cream cushions his mouth is a poor feature the upper lip is heavy but short the front teeth long and protruding and there is a slight suggestion of lisp in his enunciation the forehead is not remarkable but on the contrary his head is small at the crown and on either side falls a long straight and ungainly mass of dark flaxen hair which is not parted and is totally devoid of any beauty it gives him an uncertain womanish appearance i find nothing unique in america mr wilde said in answer to a question whether the peculiar bustle and rush of so representative a western city as chicago had nothing unique in it chicago is not unique it is bare-looking and monotonous the architecture is so poor that it amounts to none at all that is true of all american cities and yet you must depend on the individual cities for your architecture as for all art there is no national school of art in europe each city has its own school this is more noticeably true of architecture because when architectural monuments are raised they stand there for ever impressing a character upon the locality which cannot be removed the same is true of painting when you see italian pictures it is not enough to know they were painted in italy you must know whether they were executed in venice or florence or naples these cities form schools of their own and do not all form a national school it is not so with music to as great an extent a piece of music when composed goes out to all the world and its influence is felt universally still there is a local colouring in the composition and there are local schools buildings and art galleries remain where they are erected and formed and are exclusively the result of local development american architecture is cold and bare it amounts to nothing as art what do you think of the american himself i am exceedingly pleased with their kindness to me and the intelligence and appreciation everywhere to be met in this respect how does the west compare with the east oh i have only lectured once in the west in chicago the people there were very cultured and intelligent and received me with every indication of attention on the whole i believe i think better of the west than the east in the east you know there is much folly flying it comes from european association and influence in the west you are working out your own civilization by yourselves and there is more readiness to hear thoughtful suggestions and opinions you have not been annoyed in the west by the impertinences you met with in the east mr wilde had spoken before with an easy earnestness his face was serious and there was none of the drawl which has been attributed to him more than any man would display under the irksomeness of newspaper interviewing 
long continued at this question however a furtive and half amused smile crossed his face eh said he i met with some annoyances in two provincial towns but i do not think the less of the eastern people because of the impertinence and ill behaviour of a few schoolboys i assure you my reception has been too cordial for such incidents to weigh against i notice he continued after a moment that your river is swollen and high it was hoped by the interviewer that he who had been disappointed in the atlantic ocean and stood unmoved before niagara would express himself upon the waste that engulfed shipping's port and the coal yards as in a maelstrom vain hope he added the worst of this is that it gives you very bad water the people of the great rushing west responded the reporter have not the time to object to a few ounces of mud more or less to the gallon of water haven't the time inquired the great aesthetic with mild surprise why pure water is as necessary as pure air every drop of the water for your city should be filtered until it is pure the reporter paused and contemplated the suggested millennium when the water company would furnish more water than mud and president long and councilman feely would lie down together the idea was so overpowering that he needed fresh air to recover in mr wilde said he would leave this afternoon for indianapolis where he lectures to-night and bidding the reporter farewell bowed him with evident relief out of the room louisville commercial End of section. Oscar Wilde, The Cincinnati Commercial, 24th of February, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde, His Lecture at the Grand Opera House. A large and fashionable audience greets the famous aesthete. Although it was for a Thursday matinee, the grand opera house was well filled not only in parquet and dress circle but in the balcony with an audience curious to see oscar wilde and one that remained attentive listeners to the close of his lecture the stage was set with a parlour scene with door looking out to a garden elegant rugs covered the floor and were laid on the furniture back of the speaker the reading stand was covered with red while at oscar's right was an artistic little table that certainly was a rest to oscar's eyes if they became tired of looking at the commonplace audience directly in front of him the table was round the circle is the line of beauty over it was a cover of infinitesimal pieces of silk and velvet of octagonal pattern and falling in graceful departures from the strictly perpendicular on this cover was a basket of flowers in full fragrance and beauty where the stately calyx of the lily obtruded with an artistic prominence from the bed of roses it is to be hoped that the surroundings were favourable but from the quiet unconcerned unhesitating attitude of the speaker no one could tell whether or not he was gazing at his surroundings or going through his lecture like a well-learned lesson there was an undeniable disappointment in the fact that the knee breeches had been again replaced by the commonplace long pants the colour of those nether garments was grey the coat the apostle of the beautiful war was the same he had on when the representative of the commercial called upon him at his hotel and which can best be described by the lines of lady jane a cobwebby grey velvet with a tender bloom like cold gravy his hair still had its artistic length of lock his throat displayed much white colour and a necktie loosely tied and in colour like old gold with a dash of sunset over it the hair is well enough 
would look especially well in a picture but the mouth is not the mouth a painter would long to paint for a person of aesthetic tastes oscar wilde cannot care to gaze upon his mouth nor yet to listen entranced to his delivery it is english to an exaggerated degree english to the degree of almost obliterating every letter but the open vowels english in its constantly rising inflections until the speaker goes up a scale that could be noted down by a musician he has a ready flow of language and the monotony of his delivery was in a measure compensated for by an unhesitating continuity in the lecture he commenced by saying that in each generation there was born a certain amount of art influence and if properly made use of it would produce a grand result the movement differs with each generation and in every country in germany during the last centuries the movement consisted of the writings of professors who cared not for their surroundings while writing learnedly on art he said that the recent and present movement in england was a practical one and that the life of the nation was the art of a nation an era in art was either the discovery of some new material for artistic expression or the influence of some great man the reason of the grecian art taking the form of expression in sculpture was the freedom and the use of the beautiful marble of greece the phoenician school was the discovery of the use of oils in painting the primary idea of the art movement in england today was to bring the handicraftsmen and the artists into loving relationship without that the artist becomes isolated and the handicraftsman a being without imagination and creative power it was the greek potter who taught the sculptor decorative art includes all arts for all art is decorative the highest expression of old italian art was the decoration of the sistine chapel then the lecturer went on at length to plead for right surroundings for the decorator and the workman he asked how he could understand and produce colour if he saw nothing bright or natural in his immediate surroundings he could not reproduce life and motion if his life were barren of incident and if he saw no cultivation of sympathy and admiration then followed a description of pisa in other days and the influences that formed the artists and the workmen he then compared that city with the aspect of modern cities and dwelt at length upon the ugly costumes of the men the advertisements that disfigure the outside walls he said however that a pisa was not wanted but a modern city and a modern art he said that the aesthetic people do not object to machinery as has sometimes been said of them but only when it is used to make things that are valuable only because of the work of man and not to relieve man from labour then he gave his ideas of what a modern city should be and dwelt at length on clean streets but forgot to say that was an entirely modern view of art and decoration because they were rather sad affairs in the way of cleanliness those narrow streets where rose once the marble palaces and the beautiful churches of the thirteenth century and of the days of the italian and french renaissance the rushes and the straw the students used to have for benches while listening to the professors of the great universities discourse upon art were afterward thrown in the streets adjoining the building so oscar wilde was right in asking for a modern art if he included wide and clean streets the next idea he advanced was that the art of the day did not concern itself about a theory of life but with life itself he asked that the school of design in each city should be a beautiful building 
and that designers should have beautiful and noble surroundings because they are asked to make designs that are to render homes beautiful the beauty in nature and art depend upon gradations of tone colour answering colour and that when an artist wanted to learn gorgeousness of colour they should be told how the windows of the old english and french cathedrals are rendered so gorgeous then followed a dissertation on the excellence of japanese art and the means used by the japanese artists out of few objects to give the impression of filling space with pretty things and the fitness of the treatment of objects in japanese decorative art then he told that in a certain school of decorative art he found one young lady decorating a soup tureen with a moonlight scene and another covering plates with sunset scenes and said that nobody wanted to take soup off of moonlight or eat terrapin off of sunsets then he told how the japanese artist would have treated such decorative subjects in speaking of pottery he said that in its decoration it should be remembered that not only should it be decorated but rendered more round and beautiful that one art should not have to borrow from another and that clay had properties of its own for creating beauty then oscar wilde gently tapped cincinnati and in a mild persuasive way told that he had been greatly pleased with what he had seen here of the art movement in the pottery he believed that the school of design would soon teach the true principles of decorative art and give beautiful designs he praised miss louise mclaughlin and considered her work original and excellent the designs of mr bower he thought showed real feeling he then said that cincinnati had begun an artistic movement and had done and would do great things for art one necessity he said was that designers should possess more technical knowledge and that the school of design was the proper teacher of the handicraftsman he then said that the notion that art was national was a mistake that it was on the contrary local during the best days of the renaissance each italian city had a school of art of its own one of the conditions necessary for art cultivation was a clear healthy atmosphere melancholy never made an artist the next desideratum was the cultivation of individuality in art he referred to the fact that art had most flourished in a republic and that if one wanted to know what a king can impose as art he should look at what the era of louis the fourteenth had produced he might also have added what napoleon the third had cultivated in france he said that in this country everything needed in art could be found that there were materials in fields and flowers and also for the sculptor in the man who worked either in the city or in the country he gave the advice what you have with you keep and express to others don't imitate the art of any other nation use what you see around you if japanese art has made beautiful the stork you have not reached that point until you have made of your turkey as much of an object of beauty in decoration then mr wilde had much to say about jewellery and claimed that the gold that was found hidden in the mountains and strewn on the seashore was not for speculative purposes only further on in his lecture he made a good bit in saying that the first education should be the teaching of how to make something that there was too much cultivation of the mind before it was certain there was one and too much saving of the soul before it was found out that the person had one another point he made was that beautiful cities had been built by a commercial people so that the fact of american cities being marts of trade would not prevent their being beautiful and artistic the lecturer related that when he was at college 
Ruskin persuaded some of the students to go out and dig a swamp, and they did so, that their friends and enemies stood on the bank and laughed at them. Said Oscar significantly, We did not care much then, and we don't care at all now. As he said it, his voice reached the climax of the rising inflection. He seemed to also touch the real climax of his personality. It was an effort when, behind the scenes, to get the lecturer to descend from his clouds of rhetoric on art to a statement of the plainest kind. When the question as to the reason of his lecturing here in the afternoon was put to him, he said, "'Oh, that was business, and I never make any inquiries about business. I go like a lamb and lecture whenever the time is set for me.' But when he was asked if he would lecture at six in the morning, he was a little staggered, and, without considering the aesthetic aspect of lecturing at the time of Aurora's coming, he was practical enough to say that would be a little early. End of section. Utterly Utter. St. Louis Post Dispatch. 25th of February, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Utterly Utter Oscar Wilde, smoking his cigarette, descants on The Beautiful. Some of his rencontre with newspapers, a chat with the apostle of aestheticism. An unusual bustle was visible about the corridors of the southern this morning, which puzzled the guests as they entered. Knots of young men, generally known in society, stood around the pillars in attempted attitudes and seemed to be waiting intently. The clerks were more chipper than usual and appeared to be expecting something. Many of the ladies who were downtown shopping extended their promenade to Walnut Street, a thing very unusual, and as they passed the hotel, craned their pretty necks in an attempt to gaze inside. Each carriage that stopped was watched curiously, and the appearances all indicated that something was going to happen. Every time a tall, slender young man with hair longer than usual advanced towards the register, the aforesaid young men would form ranks and follow him as he registered Fritz Hofsleutel, Omaha, or something equally astounding. The followers would turn, somebody would say, Tchah, that's not he and back they went to the waiting place the cause of the commotion was the coming of oscar wilde he was expected on the morning train and the loiterers were on hand to see what he looked like at ten o'clock he'd not come and the watch was nearly given up a half hour later oscar alighted from a hack at the ladies entrance accompanied by his agent stepped into the elevator and went to his room he was clad in a large, heavy, all-fur overcoat, with a slouched hat, such as Texans affect. His arrival soon became noised about, and the great question was what did he look like? A post-dispatch reporter sent his card to Parlour 70, where the aesthetic apostle had been domiciled, and was immediately invited to walk up. The tap on the door was answered by a musical, "'Come in!' and the entrance was followed by disappointment. Anybody who imagines Wilde to be long, lank, and angular is badly deceived. At one side of the room a sofa was placed, over one corner of which had been thrown a large and heavy drapery of old gold with tassels. The back was covered with a robe of long fur which hung down from the seat to the floor. Carelessly seated in the middle of the robe, and leaning back in a graceful pose, sat Oscar with a tiny cigarette between his fingers. As he rose to greet the visitor, he looked as unlike the general description of him as could well be imagined. He is a stout, rather heavily built young man, possibly five feet ten inches in height. His hair, which is of dark brown, is his distinguishing feature. It reaches to his shoulders, is thick and heavy, not parted at all, but combed straight back in front, 
and he has a feminine way of tossing back stray locks which occasionally attempt to hang over the sides of his face he wore a sack coat and high buttoned vest of grey velvet trimmed with wide braid of a like shade his pantaloons were of a rough grey material cut loose and he wore shoes of patent leather and yellow morocco his smooth face is large and pronounced and suggests at once the features of henry ward beecher the eyes are big brown and norman shaped the nose slightly aquiline the lips rather thick and the chin pronounced and heavy oscar's worst features are his teeth the upper ones being large projecting and uneven he wore a dark pea-green scarf under a turn-down collar which concealed the shirt-front a handkerchief of about the same shade appeared from his side pocket he wore no jewellery save a large seal ring on his left hand a pair of wide flapped cuffs at his wrists being fastened with plain pearl buttons he looks like a stout well-fed active young englishman and his long hair gives him a poetical aspect the reporter gazed anxiously over the room but wilde understood the glances and with a smile seemed to say no there are no sunflowers and lilies no flowers of any kind i suppose you thought i could not travel without them well i can you see i did you must be fatigued after your journey ventured the reporter not knowing how to begin an aesthetic interview and therefore dropping to everyday subjects oh no said wilde with a smile in which the english accent was very noticeable i do not think i would have been able to endure it however but for one of your delightful novelists w d howells i have read all his books since i came here and he is a most charming writer a pause occurred here while oscar hunted under his yellow dogskin gloves on the table a little box was found out of which a small cigarette was fished out and lit and the aesthete was himself again i was much disappointed in this way continued he we in england have no idea of the distances in your country the impression seems to be that all the large cities are located in the suburbs of new york then come the rocky mountains next the indians and then san francisco in the ocean we do not half understand that large cities like chicago and cincinnati are located in the heart of your country how are you pleased with your visit so far oh your country is so large it is a world but it looks so barren and rugged in winter time to one accustomed to a little place like england which has been tilled for centuries this change is remarkable what do you think of your treatment by the newspapers i do not mind that said wilde with a smile it does not cause me any annoyance do you read what is said about you oh yes every line when i come in at night tired and weary the reading of a good vigorous attack acts like a dish of caviar of course some of it is not what i have been used to as the english papers still have a sort of old-fashioned regard for truth they are not so much given to imagination as the journals here then the attacks come from such curious sources i remember i was dressing at washington for a dinner party when a card was brought to me the name was a curious one and the card detailed for how many western papers the owner was correspondent i think there were eleven in all i was slightly flooded you may suppose i said now here is the man who moulds the thoughts of the west i must be in my best behaviour i requested the gentleman to come up when in walked a boy positively not more than sixteen is this your card i asked oh yes said he the scene was too ridiculous have you been to school much i asked the juvenile interviewer said he had have you learned french no he had not i told him that if he wished to be a journalist he ought to study french 
i gave him a big orange and dismissed him what he did with the orange afterwards i don't know but he seemed very much pleased to get it now i have had this experience several times boys have been my critics what do i care about the expressions of a man who does not know anything in regard to my writings it does not affect me any more than if the writer should say i had written a good sonnet or a bad sonnet he does not know and i do not care but there have been more bitter attacks oh yes before i came to baltimore the american there published a most uncalled-for attack upon me it stated that i had accepted an invitation to attend a club reception there and at the last moment had sent word that my terms were five hundred dollars for such services that the club had very properly declined the offer and that i would therefore not be present i had never heard of the club at that time had never received any invitation and the fact is that when i came to baltimore they tendered me a reception but the story was printed and was believed there is no use denying such things and i did not do so when i went to baltimore however i found out the man who wrote the article and sent for him he came he was a young man about my own age i simply asked him what he was paid for writing the article he said six dollars well said i the rate for lying is not very high in america that is all i wanted to ascertain good day it must have annoyed you considerably no i mind nothing about their attacks but the effect they have on the public i am not injured at all but the public is deceived after all there is so much to do in life that there is not time to be troubled by such matters our duty is to admire and worship the beautiful and the good everything else including the annoyances is mere failures simply shadows what are your impressions of the people as you've met them ah there is a wide difference between your papers and your men and women from the latter i have always met with the kindest treatment you have a great country and the things that are said about me i am willing to bear of course the treatment is not fair some of our best lecturers would not come here ruskin for instance on account of the newspapers when i declared i was coming they all wondered why said mr ruskin everything will be said about you they will spare nothing but i said i would come and i came the feeling there is almost fear of your papers but i do not mind it the ludicrous things are said in good part and as for the rest i let it pass me by mr wilde will remain in the city until monday morning tonight he lectures at mercantile library hall immediately after the lecture he will attend a reception given in his honour at the press club number seven twenty chestnut street later in the evening he will be the guest of the elks social club at the rooms of the people's theatre building end of section speranza's gifted son st louis daily globe democrat twenty sixth of february eighteen eighty two this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Speranza's Gifted Son Oscar Wilde arrives in St. Louis, drives around, delivers a lecture, and attends a reception. His appearance, and the manner in which he talked to an aesthetic Globe Democrat reporter, a large and fashionable audience bored by his talk on art at the Mercantile Library Hall. The press club receives him in high style his autograph when the ohio and mississippi railroad train rolled into the union depot three hours late yesterday morning there alighted from the rear coach a young man conspicuously clad in a heavy fur overcoat with a brigandish hat of mighty brim slouched over his head but failing to conceal an open boyish countenance 
and light brown locks somewhat dishevelled which fell to his shoulders he was closely attended by two men who hurried him to a carriage in waiting and the party were rapidly driven to the southern hotel were the young man a trifle taller and his locks less tawny he would have been mistaken for our own america's own aesthete berry mitchell tragedian poet and lecturer there was the same stately tread the same disposition to press the overcoat into duty as a roman toga the same lofty indifference to the presence of gaping bystanders and when he ascended the grand staircase on his way to parlour seventy it was with the same air of hamlet on his way to keep his appointment with the ghost which all have observed in our berry this stagey individual was the apostle of aestheticism the demigod of the sunflower worshippers of england the youth who walked into a regent street restaurant and after gazing rapturously at a lily for a half hour remarked i have dined and departed untroubled with fears of indigestion the poet who has written a really meritorious book the author of unquestioned literary ability who to quote a recent magazine has lent himself to a double scheme of advertising both of himself and of a dramatic caricature of himself unprecedented in the annals of either literature or the stage and has thereby counted himself out of the company of well-respecting men of letters the lecturer who for two hundred and fifty dollars per night invariably in advance has appeared in knee pants and velvet jacket before large audiences in the leading american cities and talked of art and beauty in short it was oscar wilde the two men with him were w m traquair and j s vale manager of the mighty exhibition that the two hundred and fifty dollar young man makes of himself both are professional showmen and handle mr wilde as they would tom thumb the tattooed man or the two-headed wonder recognising that curiosity to see oscar wilde is greater than to hear him every precaution is taken that he is properly secluded previous to his public appearance and no time was lost in immuring him in the sumptuous comfort of a private parlour which he only left during the day to enter a close carriage and pay a brief visit to the crow museum of art oscar was followed to his room within a few minutes by his personal servant and two large tin-clad trunks of the saratoga pattern the long ride of the night before through from cincinnati by boat and rail had prepared the poet for something more substantial than a lily and the aesthetic chief cook who anticipated an order for a reed bird and the white of an egg beaten to a froth was more than surprised when told by the jeems of the languid creature that his young master would be made supremely happy by a tenderloin of beef broiled lamb chops stewed potatoes three boiled eggs not too boiled but just boiled enough buttered toast a pot of strong coffee a bottle of claret and waiter you may give me a nice juicy onion for mr wilde is very fond of them you know a reporter for an evening paper sent up his card while oscar was waiting for the gastronomic poem to the construction of which the chief cook of the hotel was giving his personal supervision and was surprised to receive the answer brought by front tell the gentleman i am washing my neck but will see him in five minutes mr wilde was accessible to the reporter only sending a polite desire to be excused to all others with a very few exceptions of the favoured few was mr h l dowsman whose invitation to visit his house and inspect his art treasures was gratefully accepted and three o'clock this afternoon set as the hour for the pleasure a globe democrat reporter awaited an hour when the prince of langer had presumably suspended the delights of deglutition and then sent up a lily-white card decorated with the legend by which he is known to his creditors he will see you in ten minutes said front on his return 
Mr. Wilde evidently desired time in which to run through the authorities on aesthetics, in order to meet the reporter on equal terms. It must be remembered that he had entered the city at the Union Depot, had obtained a rear view of the jail and the four courts, and had been whirled through the delightful boulevards known as Clark Avenue and Myrtle Street, and having seen so much of the utterly utter in that brief ride, he was prepared to find in a St. Louisan a poet, and in one who assists to mould the opinions of St. Louisans he naturally anticipated a poem. When at last the repertorial aesthete entered the apartment where the lord of the lardy dar sat enthroned upon a sofa, over which had been carelessly thrown a dressed bearskin rug, it was to meet a boyish-faced young man, long-haired, smooth-faced, long-nosed, thick-lipped, uncertain-mouthed, of the general appearance of an overtasked medical student. His hair brushed back from his forehead and hanging about his shoulders gave him the romantic appearance of the tenor lover in an opera, as he rose from the cushion on which he half reclined in an attitude that somehow suggested the back line of a ballet, for, studied as it palpably was, graceful it positively was not. He extended in a very languid manner a large, soft, rather fat hand, which, half closed upon the aristocratic duke of the Inquisitor, then relaxed, and fell slowly to position, where it dangled at the end of an angular arm. As if exhausted by the effort, he sank back onto the sofa, and assumed another position suggestive of cramp colic. Our Berry could have done this much better. In a few moments he summoned strength enough to light a cigarette, which he puffed contentedly for a while, and seemed to await the first twitch of the reportorial rack. He said nothing, and the reporter hesitated to begin, for it is not often that a genuine worshipper of the sunflower happens along. Oscar sat, continuing to look intently at the reporter in the dim light. Oscar always affects Rembrandt shadows. He looks better in the dark, perhaps. The reporter, feeling that he was the object of the poet's attention, and evidently filled his thoughts, at length ventured, "'Talking about the beautiful,' what do you think of st louis i have seen so little of your city of which i have heard so much tell me have you old families here old french families that speak the delightful tongue as handed down to them from generation to generation i have heard that your city is so blessed am i wrong not exactly there are some old families here came here many years ago set up as cobblers, tailors, etc., and took land in payment for their work. Couldn't sell the land, left it to their children. The boom set in, prices went up, they held on to their property, and left it to their children. Prices still booming, they in turn left it to their children. Prices are still booming, and the children have still got the property. Some of them talk French a little, most of them talk German. It's very useful in trade. But your city has schools of design and art academies. That is where you're wrong. There are no schools of design or art academies. Have you no art, then? Yes, some. Mr. Dousman, a rich man, buys a great many pictures. And then there is the sketch club. And every year we have a picture show in connection with the cattle fair. And there's the Hornet, an illustrated paper. The Sketch Club? That must be artistic. It is. It is aesthetic. Pray tell me about it. The Sketch Club is an organisation of all our leading artists. Good. And once a month they meet and each artist brings a sketch illustrating some subject selected at the previous meeting by one of their number. How truly bohemian! Yes, the man who picks out the subject sets up a lunch of beer and sandwiches and things like that, and he gets all the pictures to keep for his own. 
oscar looked disappointed and braced up on another cigarette then he said but you have certainly some art institutions yes there is one art institution it's called the crow art museum and was built by a very wealthy gentleman who had a son that longed to be an artist the father disapproved of the son's ambition and discouraged it the son died they say partially of grief because he could not become a great artist and the repentant father recognising the error of his judgment when too late built this beautiful museum as a monument to his memory how utterly pathetic poor boy i must visit that place this afternoon st louis cannot be utterly without a love for the beautiful it is not for you will find in st louis more beautiful homes than in any other large city the artistic taste crops out also in the architecture of public buildings the city hall the grand tower block at fourth and market the lucas market buildings and the church at the corner of eighth and washington avenue are specimens that you should view before you leave the city i shall endeavour to do so but i have so many engagements i shall at least view the church you speak of do and you will never forget it you have not seen our streets at their best there are no avenues like the boulevards of paris you will certainly agree with most travellers that there are no such streets as our own in the known world if fortunately it should rain to-night you will see them as we know them best to-morrow i shall await the morrow with supreme interest i had forgotten to ask you how do you like our country i am lost in wonder and amazement it is not a country but a world englishmen know little of its extent and but half believe when told of the existence of such cities as st louis chicago and cincinnati thousands of miles from the seaboard i confess that i myself was greatly deceived in your magnificent distances looking at the map while at home i planned for myself a trip through colorado california mexico the southern states and canada i now realise how foolish were such dreams i shall barely have time to fulfil my engagements and return to paris where i expect to be by may first the west i like best the people are stronger fresher saner than the rest they are ready to be taught the surroundings of nature have instilled in them a love of the beautiful which but needs development and direction the east i found a feeble reflex of europe in fact i may say i was in america for a month before i saw an american my audiences in new york and boston were cold critical in chicago and cincinnati they were so warm cheerful and enthusiastic i shall return to both of those cities and lecture before i go east on monday i go to springfield is that near the centre of the state yes most of our capital cities are the hardy pioneers located them in the days when the members of the legislature travelled by horseback and canoe and the geographical centre was chosen instead of the centre of wealth population or art you would find a visit to the capital of this state of interest it is most picturesquely located on bluffs and would be considered a poem were it not for the boarding-houses and the penitentiary penitentiaries are not artistic how do you stand travel by rail the long trips are more than wearisome and i hardly think that i would be able to survive them were it not for the charming companionship of howells novels he is america's greatest author have you visited mr tennyson grand old man i spent a delightful afternoon with him he is not only a poet but a poem and there is your walt whitman dear old fellow a poet that indeed writes poetry america match him if you can have you found time to read the newspapers i read all that is written about me do you like it all 
i expected ill-treatment at the hands of the american press i was warned of it by my friends before i left for america it is the certainty of this unfair treatment that keeps our great men at home dickens hughes forbes and others were received with open arms and treated with distinguished consideration on the occasion of their visit here and lectured to large and delighted audiences until the press everywhere gave vent to nothing but encomiums without noticing the interruption oscar continued at first i was greatly annoyed and with difficulty restrained my feelings but latterly i have schooled myself not to notice them when made the object of absolute falsehood as in the case of the baltimore paper which stated that i had refused to attend the reception of a social club in that city unless i was paid five hundred dollars i endeavour to set myself right as i did in that instance my critics have for the most part been mere boys who knew nothing of the subjects of which i treat and why should i annoy myself by paying attention to their utterances i must say that my experiences with the press in the west have been very pleasant and i have met gentlemen whose intelligent conversation i have enjoyed they have talked with me of art and literature and understood the subjects such persons i like to meet returning thanks upon behalf of the western press the globe democrat reporter ventured a little way into the field of literature mr wilde is under the impression that england has no great story writer to-day b l farrison may be looked upon as the successor of dickens in the field of christmas stories william black is a delightful novelist he deals with the beauties of nature and is a true poet walter besant and james rice he considers great writers the purely english performance of writing a novel to accomplish a reform while ably carried out by charles reed and wilkie collins savours of the mechanical and is perforce not beautiful justin mccarthy is a writer of brilliancy and in the history of our times has given a most enchanting resume of the dry and repellent mass of information found in the files of the london times and mccarthy has a son of great promise who may excel his father in brilliancy what has he done asked the reporter he has written a volume of poems and several very clever sketches replied oscar with a smile he resumed his essay on literature and had just remarked that the greatest writer since shakespeare was balzac when a card was brought in oscar twirled the pasteboard in his fingers for a minute arose and held out his hand for a farewell shake remarking another gentleman desires to see me now and the globe democrat reporter left as another newspaper reporter entered the room to subject the by this time justly languid aesthete to what an arkansas aesthete would call a course of sprouts oscar wore a look of calm resignation when last seen end of section Oscar Wilde, The Republican, St. Louis, 26th of February, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde. He arrives, is interviewed, and lectures. Not so greenery yallery as he is painted. He talks on Swinburne, Joaquin Miller, and Walt Whitman. His impressions of America and Americans his views of journalism and journalists his lecture at mercantile library hall on decorative art before an audience which he did not understand and which did not understand him oscar wilde came yesterday and this morning st louis has seen him heard him weighed him in the balance and found him wanting in what was expected of him between him and his audience there is a mutual disgust yet no one who has seen him and conversed with him off the stage taking him altogether aside from what he has said or written but is forced to recognise that he has genius which seems to be of the abiding type 
few who heard his lecture will dissent from the opinion that his lecturing at all is a great mistake the imagery which appears beautiful when condensed into poetry in a prose lecture goes to seed and becomes absurd off the stage and off his guard he shows for what he is a young man of no small talent natural and acquired but a talent which is yet to be matured by experience on the stage appearing before an audience which has paid two dollars a seat to see him dressed in knee breeches he must not think it hard if forgetting the man of genius they remember only the male pantaloon and laugh at him accordingly it is their right and they have paid for it but off the stage and away from constraint he is a thorough gentleman and not the greenery yallery grosvenor gallery young man that he has been painted the air of the college still clings to him and there never was a better-natured better-mannered collegian came out of oxford he is what he calls joaquin miller a splendid fellow he arrived from cincinnati yesterday morning with his manager doily cart and his valet registering at the southern where he remained until afternoon when he visited the wayman crow museum how good-natured he is is shown by his ready compliance with the request of a southern hotel bell-boy who asked him for his autograph he wrote the following lines which the bell-boy showed with infinite pride the sea is flecked with bars of gold the dull dead wind is out of tune and like a withered leaf the moon is blown across the stormy sea and overhead the curlews cry where through the dusky upland grass the young brown-throated reapers pass like silhouettes against the sky oscar as he is the pen pictures which have been drawn of oscar wilde universally by american newspapers are like the reflections of the convex mirror faithful and yet distorted no one seeing the true oscar wilde could fail to recognise him from them and no one of any perception could fail to recognise just as clearly that the man is not what has been described the pictures have at once been true and untrue with the untruth predominating a republican reporter who called on him at the southern yesterday afternoon and was shown up to his room was forcibly impressed with this mr wilde met him at the door with a pleasant good afternoon and an invitation to be seated speaking with the broad english accent which still obtains in portions of america especially in virginia an accent which is rhythmic always and which appeared to be perfectly natural with him his appearance was much as it has been described so repeatedly in the different newspapers of the country barring the exaggerations his dress which would have seemed outre enough on the street did not seem out of place as a chamber negligee he wore a short drab jacket hanging open and showing a waistcoat of the same material loose pantaloons and a collar turned negligently over a neckcloth tied in the loose sailor fashion and there was something suggestive of the sea in his whole make-up the writer who went altogether undecided as to the light in which the apostle was to be considered found after only a few words had been spoken that there was a serious side to him which was altogether undeveloped for newspaper purposes and which could be utilised to advantage perhaps no one has seen him who has not been disappointed in some way the disappointment here was that he was not the grotesque being that has been described but a thoroughly well-bred and well-educated young gentleman with a large share of good humour disposed apparently to carry out the maxim from his own beloved greek of especially thinking well of himself above all things apparently too with much 
theoretical and little practical knowledge of men this was the impression but in his conversation there were keen flashes of wit which made it doubtful after all if he were not more the man of the world than he seemed taking a seat and motioning the reporter to another he lighted a cigarette and waited to be questioned while his servant who evidently from frequent experience knew that his master required something to sustain him through the ordeal placed a small glass of what appeared to be sherry punch very weak on the table before him leaning his head against the easy chair with his long hair flowing over his shoulders oscar waited with an air which was at once resigned and quizzical not without a suspicion of embarrassment shall i put the question which was put to your countryman mr chuzzlewit and ask you what do you think of our country sir asked the reporter you may if you like was the reply though i might find some difficulty in answering it it has changed greatly since dickens day no doubt every city in america is different from every other city quite different the west interests me more than the east because the people of the west have created a civilization by themselves and for themselves the east is a reflex of europe and therefore chicago was more interesting to me than boston even though then i met oliver wendell holmes with whom i dined and longfellow with whom i spent the afternoon eastern cities are imitations chicago is entirely american i have read an account of your meeting with joaquin miller said the reporter that was true one of the few true things that have been written about me yes joaquin is a very fine fellow full of colour one of the first american poets who is really from and of the new world there is in his writings a resonance and an odour of not seen flowers a breath of the sea he is quite swift and strong as the sea full of new imagery and whitman by the way what do you think of whitman yourself was the parry which met the thrust there are lines in his blades of grass which insane as he is generally counted remind one of homer but my opinion is valueless and my question unanswered he smiled as he took a fresh cigarette from a little box on the table and lighted it with the air of one who was weighing his words before answering when he did answer he said whitman is a great writer you are right as it seems to me there is more of the greek feeling in him than in any modern poet his poetry is homeric in its large pure delight in men and women and in the joy the writer feels and shows through it all in the sunshine and breeze of outdoor life and since we speak of living poets what of your own swinburne we look on swinburne as one of the great poets of the day in england in america you seem to judge him entirely by his first volume his laus veneris which had in it many of the extravagances natural and proper enough too in the first attempt of genius you judge him solely by this and not by his later writings such as the songs of democracy and the songs before sunrise swinburne shelley and milton are the three great poets of liberty in england and swinburne is the greatest master of the english language living wonderful in his power of expression and his control of words language to him is what the beautiful musical instrument is to the musician the violin from which he draws what tunes he wishes 
no one of our times has written poems more full of the fervour for liberty and the strength of democracy and no one singer has sung such delicate and dainty little songs where else can you find the refinement of feeling that there is in his poem if you were what the rose is and i were like the leaf where such poems as his garden of persephone and his hymn to persephone you have been accused of imitating him suggested the reporter do you think it worth your while to make a defence that accusation of imitating someone has been brought against every english poet and besides people forget that the first thing a young artist in painting or poetry should do is to study the great masters the only way to do really original work is to acquire a knowledge of the style of all great teachers and to use that knowledge to produce an entirely new effect no man in our age has studied milton and shakespeare so deeply as swinburne and yet from that study of shakespeare and milton he has produced a work entirely different from theirs take for instance the poems which appeared in the periodicals through the country many of them show that the writers possessed feelings which for lack of this study they could not express hence their poetry is bad although the idea is back of it we of the younger school in england love swinburne better than we love tennyson and consider him a much greater master there is a breadth a depth to him which there never was to tennyson you have been questioned so much concerning your school that i had not intended referring to it but since you yourself have spoken of it tell me if you think that your designs are practicable do you think that we the young men of england would give our youth our energy and whatever of intellect we may possess to their fulfilment if we had the remotest intention of failing if it were an experiment we should achieve success but with us it is a matter of actual accomplishment we have already changed the whole condition of english decorative art every handicraftsman in england is now working with the noblest designs and models before him and as for the opposition that people sometimes make particularly in america you must remember that only one thing is opposed to beauty and that is ugliness everything is always beautiful or ugly and utility always goes with the beautiful never with the ugly anything that is ugly is merely what a bad workman makes the only way to get good work then in any trade is by means of good designs if you have bad designs no good workman will work for you did you meet emerson while in the east i did not have the opportunity to call on him i am sorry to say and i understand that he confines himself closely at home it would give me much pleasure to meet him on my return he is one of the most brilliant men of the nineteenth century the only man of letters in america who has influenced the course of english thought the american press has not given you fair treatment mr wilde said the reporter changing the subject suddenly i think he replied that the ordinary critic belongs to the criminal classes and that in many cases the newspapers of america would employ people to write on art whom in england we would not consider qualified to report any case of petty larceny above the value of five shillings 
i think that if american journalism continues to supply nothing to the public but slander that is shameful and jokes that are bad they will cease to have the slightest influence and will merely increase the already too large number of comic papers which are not amusing in new york he continued in answer to another question they wrote entirely fictitious interviews with me after having called on me i think that they might at least have spared me the trouble of talking to them in chicago they put down what i said more exactly we have no interviewing in england but it is not so objectionable after all if it is genuine does it not then strike you as objectionable that the details of a man's private life should be dragged before the public even in such small matters as his eating onions for breakfast the best answer that i can give to that question is perhaps the one i gave to a reporter in washington who called on me and asked me to give him some of the details of my private life i told him that i wished i had one the conversation ended here being interrupted by the entrance of his manager mr wilde stated before the reporter took his leave that he would lecture in springfield monday and that he expected to be in paris in may it will doubtless be observed that in the interview which is as near verbatim as it is possible for an interview to be given the use of aesthetic terms which characterised the first part of it gradually disappeared as the speaker grew earnest as when referring to swinburne the writer was forcibly impressed with it and when he did leave the room he left it with a feeling that there was something under the sunflower and lily strangely akin to that practical system of metaphysics so unaesthetically styled horse sense and perhaps the young gentleman with the sapphic speech and the mane of absalom will not be so much ashamed of it when he has grown older and abandoned the lecture platform end of section a home ruler st louis daily globe democrat twenty seventh of february eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain a home ruler oscar wilde has some well settled opinions on the irish question he believes the government should purchase the land and sell it to the peasantry what are your feelings with regard to the land league queried a globe democrat reporter of oscar wilde last evening the aesthete was sipping a glass of apollinaris and smoking a cigarette he promptly replied as regards the general principle that the only basis of legislation should be the general welfare of the people and that is the only test by which the right of any citizen to hold property or possess any privileges should be tested i am entirely at one with the position held by the land league replied mr wilde he continued the land of ireland like the land of england is perfectly and fairly divided and the peasantry of ireland have never had the proper conditions necessary for any real civilization at all they have lived in the most impoverished way in a certain state of life in which the only opening for improvement was for them to leave their own country in this connection interrupted the reporter i will ask you do you believe in the wholesale emigration of the irish from their native land the question was scarcely asked when mr wilde replied i shall always hope that there shall be some people left in ireland after thinking a while he said with regard to emigration from ireland it has a great deal of influence in one way in the way of reaction from america 
not merely in people returning from america a people bringing with them money to an impoverished country but in a reaction of american thought on irish politics this modern public spirit with irish politics is an entirely new departure in the history of ireland it is due entirely to the reflex influence of american thought the aesthete here lit a cigarette and continued with regard to the land bill the mistake which i think the english government are making is in thinking that they can permanently benefit one class in a community by permanently impoverishing the other up to this the gentry of ireland have been rich and the peasant poor they have merely transferred the burden from the peasant to the educated classes they have not really alleviated the poverty of ireland they have merely removed its position and in one single act of legislation have swept away a great deal of the best civilization in ireland what i should wish to see would be the government purchasing the land of ireland from the landlords at a fair rate giving them compensation as they gave the members of the irish church and distributing that land amongst the people issuing state bonds on which the people would pay an interest this was the method adopted in prussia and it has there been in the highest degree beneficial what do you think of the no rent manifesto asked the reporter it is the one foolish thing that the land league have done replied mr wilde why so because replied he it strikes at the root of all civilization of all fair dealing and of all common sense the no rent manifesto having been explained to mr wilde the latter replied you must remember that a manifesto of that kind besides the mere words of it there is always a latent spirit in it which is always understood to mean more than it expresses in ireland it was understood to be absolutely no rent which however i have no doubt that the most thoughtful amongst the land league would not approve of you know parnell sullivan mccarthy and other members of the land league i do he replied do you think that they would advocate anything unreasonable or nonsensical it is no compliment to generalize about a man answered mr wilde with regard to any agitation of this kind it is entirely a question of result the means of every revolution are justified only by one thing by the success of that revolution a compulsory sale and a fair compensation clause seems to me to be the remedy for the present evil system of land tenure in ireland it is easy he added for one to point out in revolutions great excesses even great crimes no measure probably in the world ever produced so much immediate suffering and immediate crime as the french revolution and no measure was ever productive of such permanent good afterward it is very easy to object to the means of a revolution to lay one's finger on certain excesses the only way to judge of an agitation is by the success in a political party it is not a question of whether they were wise or fair the only way we can tell whether they are wise is by their success their measures are unwise if they do not succeed certainly politics is a practical science an unsuccessful revolution is merely treason a successful one is a great era in the history of a country are you in favour of the total separation of ireland from the united kingdom there is another folly replied mr wilde it is only a question of whether a country is able to assert its independence at present i think it would be unwise in ireland to claim total separation 
because I do not think she would be able to preserve it, and to attempt anything that one cannot do is the only crime in politics. The first step to do should be a local parliament, which I sincerely hope they will get, and it is an issue which my father was one of the first men in Ireland to advocate. Then, said the reporter, as he took his leave, I may put you down as a home ruler. You may, he emphatically replied. End of section. Oscar Wilde, Chicago Evening Journal, 28th of February, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde. Return of the Apostle to Chicago. A chat with him concerning America, journalism, and personal matters. How a Baltimorean lie has followed the Eastheat. Oscar Wilde arrived in the city this morning, and took up his quarters, as before, at the Pacific Hotel. He was visited, in the course of the forenoon, by a representative of the journal, with whom he entered into a friendly chat concerning his personal impressions of America and Americans. He had just come from St. Louis, and had lectured in Cincinnati, and now he was booked for eleven consecutive nights in some of the smaller towns in the northwest. His visit to the United States, he said, would terminate in April, and he proposed to spend the summer, where he generally does, in Paris. Being asked the customary leading question, how he liked America, Mr. Wilde said the country looked more dark and barren than he'd anticipated. That, however, was to be expected, since he had come here in the gloomiest season of the year. And, in one sense, he felt he had missed much in not having seen the land in her summer glory. He was not particularly interested in any of the eastern cities, nor in eastern men and women. He found there merely a reflex of European modes of thought and manners. But in the West, and right here in Chicago, he had found a distinctive type of American character, or at any rate what promised to develop into such, and therefore he had been more interested in the West than at any point in his sojourn. The conversation drifted into the subject of journalism. Mr. Wilde said that to him there was something almost tragic about it. Never, he said, in the history of civilization did literature have the advantage of such an audience. Imagine, said he, such a soul as Jean-Jacques Rousseau having an audience of millions every day listening to him. Now here, a boy of sixteen, just entering what may be a grand career, finds easily an opportunity to speak his thought in the presence of multitudes. It is a rare opportunity for an ambitious soul. But somehow they seem to have no ambition, and they drift away into the current of humorous drivel. But, it was suggested, the American newspaper covers in some ways a new field, and has acquired another kind of an audience. The audience that would listen to the philosophy of Voltaire or Rousseau is probably as limited as ever. Journalism gives many things besides the results of science. It furnishes gossip, news. American journalism does not seem to me, said Mr. Wilde, to have a deep influence on public sentiment. Everything that is written seems to be accepted as a joke. It would be all well enough for the America that Charles Dickens saw, but it does seem to me unworthy of great cosmopolitan America. The journalism of Paris is the concentration of the intellect of the city. It is a power, and has overturned dynasties. The visitor happened to mention, in this connection, a ridiculous story to the effect that he, Wilde, had been in the habit of levying contributions on the homes of persons where he had been invited. Such a bit of gossip had even found private circulation in Chicago. Mr. Wilde said that was one of the most unaccountable things he had met on his tour. A story to that effect had been published in the Baltimore American, in an article of the dull stamp, 
that seemed to have the aspect of being true it had followed him from one city to another and while he paid no attention to the comic squibs that were showered upon him here and there he had been obliged to nail this copper shilling to the counter i found said he the young man who actually invented the lie and asked him to come and see me he was quite a young man i said i should not care to express my opinion of his performance but he must know himself he was a liar i only wanted to know how much he received for writing the article and he told me he got six dollars i only wished to ascertain just what was the tariff that an american newspaper was willing to pay for a lie some reference was made to professor swing's caustic criticism of the aesthete which mr wilde said he had not read on its being stated to him in substance the young poet said he imagined his critic asked too much of him a man must work in any department of labour or art within certain limitations at the same time he contested the charge that his theories had no reference to moral aesthetics the visitor seeing that mr wilde was exceedingly busy with his correspondence here took leave of him impressed with the idea that he had met a very courteous urbane intelligent and well-bred gentleman End of section. Oscar Back Again, The Daily Interocean, Chicago, 1st of March, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Back Again. Mr. Wilde returns to Chicago to lecture and to be interviewed. Favourable impressions on art prospects in st louis and cincinnati eulogy of john millet the painter views on drama and actor oscar wilde is in the city for a short rest from his lecturing tour and has rooms at the grand pacific a reporter for the inter ocean called yesterday afternoon about two thirty o'clock and sent up his card the bellboy returned in due time and said mr wilde is asleep sir did he tell you so himself asked the reporter no sir said the bellboy with dignity his servant told me so sir the question then resolved itself into two points should the reporter wait for mr wilde to finish his nap or should he rattle him up anyway and remind him of his duty to society after some mental debate the latter course was decided upon and he climbed the stairs and stood in front of number eleven all was still a good solid rap on the door had the effect of producing a smothered sound from within but whether it was an invitation to come in or to go to somewhere else the reporter was not sure he gave mr wilde the benefit of the doubt and rapped again this time there was no mistake about it come in was hurled at the door as if it was a bootjack the reporter entered the room at first glance seemed empty but it was pervaded by an unseen presence that seemed to fill it to the transom but where was the eastite there was no couch in the room the reporter even glanced under the sofa although he well knew it was useless upon a chair were mr wilde's sacred breeches at a little distance a pair of exquisitely all but gaiters and near them a pair of ecstatic socks various other articles of lingerie were scattered around in graceful if somewhat careless forms but the reporter had no time to take an inventory he is found a voice came from the alcove which the reporter now saw for the first time and which was concealed by a closely drawn lace curtain saying where is my servant i don't know said the reporter wishing he was at home 
but taking off his hat to the pantaloons, gaiters, et al. Well, what do you want? I am a representative of the press. Just then the missing servant came in out of breath, and brushing some cracker crumbs off his coat collar. Plainly he didn't drink lemonade. I have been travelling night and day, and wanted some rest, said the gentleman behind the curtains, while the servant looked as if he would like to receive an order to bounce the intruder. Oh, couldn't you come up again in an hour? Certainly I can, said the reporter, thanking heaven for the escape, and he went down to the office and matched pennies with Sam Parker. When the appointed time had expired, the reporter rapped again at the door of number 11, and upon entering was much relieved to see that the gaiters, etc., were no longer on the chairs, but were on the graceful form of Mr. Wilde. He was as cordial as ever, and seated the caller with great politeness. His dress was a black velvet smoking jacket, light brown pantaloons, or perhaps a wood colour, socks of the same grade, and patent leather shoes finished at the top with cloth off the same piece as the pantaloons. The room was arranged with an eye to picturesque effect. The chairs were draped with skins of beasts, and Mr. Wilde's own chair was ornamented with a silk shawl. A bright fire blazed in the grate, and the table was heaped with books, letters, and papers of all kinds. The interview begins. St. Louis. What were your impressions of St. Louis? asked the reporter. In St. Louis, he said, they have the best arranged museum of art that I have seen in America. The collections are not extensive, but all is most excellent and beautiful. It has the first quality of a good museum, nothing in it that could possibly lead a young art student astray. Of all things in it, oil paintings, plaster casts, or statuary, there is nothing but good. That is high praise from such a source, Mr. Wilde, said the reporter. He swallowed the taffy without winking, and continued. But I think in America you are a little too exclusive, a great deal too exclusive, in your admiration for the French school, the modern French school. The examples of English art that I have seen in America all belong to the period of Benjamin West and Hayden, but of the modern school of English painters I have seen no examples. I have not, for instance, seen in any of your public museums or private galleries any of John Millet's work. He is one of the greatest painters that England has ever produced. He will be remembered with Gainsborough and Sir Joshua Reynolds as one of our greatest portrait painters, and no man now living in England, or indeed in the whole history of English painting, has done such a splendid amount of artistic work in style so entirely different. When he was a young man, he belonged to the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, and was their greatest painter. His early pictures are full of the most beautiful imaginations, and most wonderful technical power, and his picture of Christ in the carpenter shop is the only beautiful religious picture, with the exception of Rossetti's Annunciation, that I have ever seen. More about the painter Millet. From the earliest poetical sentiment of his pictures, when he chose his subjects from Florentine legend and sacred story, he passed with an increased realism of technical power to nature drawn from the life of our day. 
the highland woman delivering the order of release to the jailer for her imprisoned husband the girl bidding good-bye to her sweetheart who is going to the wars are great witnesses of how much splendid imaginative work can be got out of modern life millet then passed to landscape in which he is a really great master his picture of chill october is one of the most pathetic and beautiful landscapes i have ever seen and lately his fame rests upon his powers as a portrait painter in which he will rank with sir joshua reynolds and gainsborough no one has painted children with such delicacy and love of the beauty of childhood and perfection of treatment as he since reynolds painted penelope boothby no one has painted great men with such dignity and strength his picture of mr gladstone is one of the great pictures of this century and he was painting one of lord beaconsfield at the time when that wonderful genius died any museum or gallery is quite incomplete without a specimen of his work what do you think of the mississippi river asked the reporter getting ready to write grand majestic etc he was surprised to hear mr wilde say quietly and without a gleam of fun i don't think a well-behaved river should run over that way don't you know the reporter thought it was rather reprehensible conduct the want of pure water he continued in each city caused by the overflow and the dreadful condition of the streets in nearly all the cities i have visited seem to show a curious want of provision against what i suppose a not extraordinary test it is quite impossible to have any art unless you have good air good water and clean cities you have visited a number of western cities have you not yes i have lectured at cincinnati st louis detroit cleveland indianapolis fort wayne springfield illinois and some other cities opinion of the american athens how did you like cincinnati in cincinnati i was particularly pleased there is not merely a great love of art but of fine collections of course all schools of art which are young and inexperienced will commit many faults but still their work is very good a great deal of it and they are going to work in the right way you like the west better than the east i believe the western cities seem to be more distinctively american and as such are objects of great interest to all englishmen in the west seems to be the civilization you have created by yourselves and for yourselves so much in the east is a mere repetition of european thought and so much that is a mere misunderstanding of it what do you think of the london press the two best written papers in london are the world and truth you have already heard mr edmund yeats the editor of the world when on his lecture tour he is a very brilliant lecturer i understand mr labouchere editor of truth is to make a lecturing tour in america i am sure you will be interested to hear him are not the poor people of england all radicals there is no connection between poverty and radicalism but there is between handicraft and republicanism 
to work at any handicraft induces that sense of independence which is the keynote of all republicanism in the great cities of england there is a constant spirit of discussion and a certain clash of ideas which make men think for themselves so that the political thought of england progresses always in the manufacturing towns and never in the agricultural places an agricultural labourer's view of politics is founded entirely on the weather estimate of dramatists would you please talk a little about dramatic art oh yes i love to do so henry irving is our greatest tragedian he stands at the head of our shakespearean actors he is a man of most curious and wonderful personality with an interesting realism in his acting which was for us in london an entirely new departure from the new-found school of macready he is certainly as great an artist as charles keane if he comes to america he will bring with him our most beautiful and fascinating actress miss ellen terry do you not have a dramatic censor in london yes he would not allow sarah bernhardt to play la dame aux camellias for a long time and has recently decided that the most moral system of british morality would be undermined if the paris royal company played divorçant if there was a censor to prevent bad acting we all would support the office with all the means in our power but unfortunately there is no law to prevent any man or woman from murdering any great part in public that kind of a censor would be popular in chicago said the reporter do you think mrs langtry will come to america she will probably come she is one of the most beautiful women in the world her figure is moulded like a greek statue she is not petite but i wouldn't say she is tall she is a perfect artistic height she has a most beautiful voice on the stage she has a joyousness of manner which is the beauty of all good comedy acting and when she has studied her art she will be able to act shakespeare's rosalind in a way in which most of us have never seen the part better than nielsen the same vein still you can't compare artists but you can easily compare mediocrity i have not the slightest doubt of her dramatic genius she is one of the most remarkable women of this age in england how do you like jefferson i saw him in rip van winkle he is one of the greatest artists i have ever seen his acting in london was for all of us who loved and studied acting one of the greatest we had ever seen in that play how do you like booth booth is a very very great artist he speaks english much better than almost any of our own actors his perfect enunciation perfect ideas of blank verse and knowledge of emphasis and consciousness that when he is speaking shakespeare he is speaking music is a source of the greatest delight to all of us in london his acting of king lear i consider to rank along with salvini's othello henry irving's shylock or the greatest thing in acting i have ever seen do you like mcculloch i saw him the other night in spartacus he is very strong exceedingly powerful and is a master of stage effects you have seen clara morris yes she interested me wondrously 
Sarah Bernhardt told me that there were only two things in America worth seeing. One was Clara Morris, and the other, some dreadful way you have of killing hogs in the Chicago stockyards. I have seen Miss Morris. The other visit I have postponed indefinitely. You lecture here again, I believe, Mr. Wilde? Yes, at Central Music Hall on Saturday evening, March 11, on Interior and Exterior House Decoration. Would you mind giving me a few points on the lecture? No, I can't do that, he said good-naturedly. But I will begin with the doorknob and end with the attic. Beyond that, there only remains heaven, which subject I leave to the church. End of section. Oscar Wilde, The Chicago Daily Tribune, 1st of March, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde, the Apostle of the Dado, after his visit to the suburbs. Cincinnati Art caught him, and St. Louis Museum was all but 2-2. America too exclusive in art matters. The Aesthetes' enthusiasm over Millet. Mrs. Langtree moves him to raptures. His high opinion of American actors and actresses utter ignorance on the subject of prairies the mississippi beautiful but not well behaved mr oscar wilde the celebrated aesthete arrived in the city yesterday morning from springfield illinois where he lectured monday evening he registered at the grand pacific hotel and was assigned to parlour eleven about two o'clock yesterday afternoon a tribune representative called at the hotel to see the apostle of the beautiful and to obtain his impressions of the great west the reportorial card was returned by a bellboy who also brought the information that mr wilde was asleep and could not be disturbed a journey to his parlour was then made but a stalwart african stood guard at the door and would allow no one to pass him with the assurance that Mr. Wilde would arise in an hour or so, the reporter repaired to the rotunda and waited. About three o'clock, a second tour was made to the regions above, and it was discovered that the coloured gentleman had abandoned his post. A rap at the door brought forth a timid, Come in! And the reporter cautiously turned the knob and entered. No one was visible, but the effeminate voice of the aesthete, proceeding from behind a pair of lace bed curtains, asked what he wanted. "'The Tribune would like to see you, Mr. Wilde,' said the reporter. "'Well, you can't see me now,' he answered. "'I am very tired after a long journey, having come clear from Springfield, Illinois, and I want to take a nap. I'll see you in about an hour.' The coloured gentleman entered at this point, and the reporter withdrew while Mr. Wilde was giving his servant an angry talking to for having deserted his post. At four o'clock the newspaper man approached parlour eleven a third time, and the "'Come in!' in answer to his rap was delivered in a firmer tone of voice. On entering the room, Mr. Wilde was discovered sitting in a tastefully draped chair near one of the windows. He wore a black velvet jacket, a pair of brown breeches, a brick-red necktie and handkerchief, low shoes, and maroon socks. His long hair fell gracefully over his shoulders, and his taper fingers toyed delicately with a cigarette. He gave the reporter a cordial handshake and bade him be seated. "'When did you arrive in Chicago, Mr. Wilde?' asked the reporter. "'I reached here this morning from Springfield, Illinois, where I lectured last evening.' 
what cities have you visited since you left here i have lectured in cincinnati st louis detroit cleveland indianapolis fort wayne springfield and other places which one of the western cities are you most favourably impressed with easily pleased in cincinnati i was particularly pleased not merely at the great love of art shown there but the people are doing a great deal of beautiful work of course old schools of art disagree when adopted by a young people but experience will correct many faults still a great deal of their work is very good and they are going to work in the right way how do you think the west compares with the east asked the reporter the west interests us in england more than the east you are making civilization by yourselves and for yourselves so much in the east is a mere reflection of european thought and so much of that a mere misunderstanding of it what do you think of st louis i think st louis has the best arranged museum of art i have seen yet it does not contain very much but all it does contain is excellently and brilliantly chosen that is the first qualification of a good museum nothing in it could possibly lead a young student astray out of everything in it oil paintings or plates cast or etching there is nothing but good to be got but i think continued mr wilde that in america you are a little too exclusive in art matters in fact a great deal too exclusive in your admiration for the modern french school examples of english art seen in america all belong to the most dreadful period of english painting the period of benjamin west and hayden the wonderful modern school of english painting has no examples here i have not for instance seen in any of your public museums or private galleries any of john millais works he is one of the greatest painters that england has ever produced and will be remembered along with gainsborough and sir joshua reynolds as one of the greatest portrait painters and no man in my time in england or indeed in the whole history of english painting has done such a splendid amount of artistic work in styles so entirely different here mr wilde paused drained a glass of lemonade lit a fresh cigarette and having gained his second wind continued millet when a young man belonged to the pre-raphaelite brotherhood and was their greatest painter his early pictures were full of the most beautiful imagination and most wonderful technical power and his picture of christ in the carpenter shop is the only beautiful religious picture with the exception of rossetti's annunciation that i have ever seen from the pastoral sentiment of his pictures when he chose his subjects from florentine lyrics and sacred story he passed with increased realism of technical power to motives drawn from the life of his own day the highland woman delivering the order of release to the jailer for her imprisoned husband and the girl bidding good-bye to her lover going to the war are great instances of how much splendid imaginative work may be got out of modern life he then passed to landscapes in which he is a really great master his picture of chill october is one of the most pathetic and beautiful landscapes i have ever seen and lastly his fame rests on his powers as a portrait painter 
in which he will rank as i said with gainsborough and sir joshua reynolds no one has painted children with such delicacy and love of the beauty of childhood and perfection of treatment as he has since sir joshua reynolds painted penelope boothby and no one has painted great men with such dignity and strength as he has his portrait of mr gladstone is one of the greatest pictures of the century and he was painting one of lord beaconsfield at the time when that wonderful genius died any modern gallery is quite incomplete without a specimen of his work you call millet your greatest painter mr wilde said the reporter who do you consider your greatest actor i call henry irving our greatest tragedian as he stands at the head of our shakespearean actors he has a curious and remarkable personality with intensity and realism in his acting which was for us in england an entirely new departure from the more formal declamatory style of macready he is in the matter of scenery and costume as great as charles keen is he thinking of visiting america i believe he is if he comes here he will bring with him our most beautiful and fascinating actress miss ellen terry mrs langtry is expected to visit this country soon is she as beautiful do you think as she is said to be she is one of the most beautiful women in the world said mr wilde enthusiastically she is possessed of a figure moulded like that of a greek statue and is of a perfect artistic height she has a beautiful stage voice is joyous of manner which is the element of all good comedy acting and when she has studied her art more she will be able to act shakespeare's rosalind in a way in which most of us have never seen the part acted there is not the slightest doubt of her dramatic genius i truly believe that she is the most remarkable woman of this day in england have you seen any of our great actors asked the reporter oh yes i have seen those of your actors who have visited england and others i have seen since my arrival here i think joseph jefferson is one of the greatest actors i ever saw i saw him play rip van winkle in london and was greatly impressed with his acting have you seen edwin booth i have and i think him one of the greatest artists i ever saw i saw him in all of his great parts in england and i think he speaks english much better than almost any of our own actors his perfect enunciation his perfect delivery of blank verse his knowledge of emphasis and his consciousness that when one is speaking shakespeare he is speaking music was a source of the greatest delight to all of us in england his king lear i consider to rank along with salvini's othello and henry irving's shylock as the greatest thing in acting i have ever seen what do you think of john mcculler i saw him the other night as spartacus and i think he is very strong exceedingly powerful and a master of stage effect who of our actresses have you seen clara morris interested me enormously sarah bernhardt told me that there were two things in america worth seeing one was clara morris's acting and the other was some dreadful method of killing pigs in chicago she advised me to go and see both i went to see miss morris immediately upon my arrival in new york city 
but the other i have deferred quite indefinitely you have what is called a censor of plays i believe in england yes we have the lord chamberlain has control of that department and the censor of plays reads all new works before they are produced his decision is final he has recently decided that the whole moral system of the british nation would be undermined if the french palais royal company acted divorcant which he considers an immoral play if we had a censor to prevent bad acting we all would support the office with every means in our power but unfortunately there is no law to prevent men or women from murdering great parts do you lecture in chicago again mr wilde asked the reporter yes i shall lecture at central music hall saturday evening march eleven on the subject of the decoration of houses what are your ideas on that subject well it wouldn't be fair to tell you before i delivered my lecture the subject covers an immense amount of ground and i shall begin with the door knocker and go to the attic beyond that is heaven and i shall leave that to the church will you remain in chicago long no sir i lecture every night now until i reappear here how do you fancy making these one-night stands oh i don't mind it much in fact i rather like travelling in this country have you seen any of our prairies in your travels what are they why vast stretches of rolling lands as far as the eye can see no i don't think i have seen anything like that i have done most of my travelling in the night how did the mississippi river strike you well i think no well-behaved river would overflow as it has done though i am quite ready to admit its beauty i noticed a want of pure water in each city along its banks caused evidently by the overflow the streets are also in a dreadful condition in nearly all these cities and this fact seems to indicate to me a serious want of provision against these extraordinary catastrophes it is quite impossible to have any art unless you have good air good water and clean cities at this point mr wilde arose from his recumbent position and extended his hand to the reporter the hint was taken and a retreat was made in good order while mr wilde turned to the window and contemplated the sea of mud beneath him with a feeling it is to be feared that chicago was not an art centre end of section philosophical oscar the chicago times first of march eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain philosophical oscar second visit of the young aesthete to chicago what he thinks of this country opinions of men and women in england oscar wilde returned to the city yesterday from springfield where he lectured the night before and is at the grand pacific hotel during his western trip he has occupied platforms in st louis detroit cleveland indianapolis fort wayne and other cities he says he was particularly pleased with cincinnati its people have not only a great love of art but they're doing much beautiful work all schools of design he says which are young and inexperienced commit many faults but in cincinnati the work is good and the workers are going at it in the right way as to the west he says it interests the english more than the east because its civilization is made by the people for themselves 
there is so much in the east which is a mere reflection of european thought and so much a misunderstanding of it which is not met in the west the reporter called attention to the reports that mrs langtree and henry labouchere were to come to america and asked him concerning them of mrs langtree he said she is one of my greatest friends what is she like beautiful women are quite indescribable the beauty of her face is in the extreme sweetness and loveliness of her expression and the wonderful delicacy and transparency of her complexion the real wonder of her beauty to all of us who are artists is that whether one carved her in marble or painted her in colour she is equally lovely the hues of her face being as strongly worked and as definite in outline as a greek bronze and yet so perfect in proportion that the effect is one of the simplest loveliness in acting she has a wonderfully musical and well modulated voice a delightful joyousness of manner and real capabilities for her art the part that when she has had more study and practice she will make her greatest success in will i think be rosalind in as you like it was her first appearance really good no art would be worth doing if it could be done easily the first time but there has been no debutante on the stage in london for many years who showed such really remarkable power and such great promise she is now going to study frou frou to make a tour of england she is very nervous about visiting america but like many of us most ambitious to see your country and to make herself a position here are there many young actors of promise in england yes there are four or five now there on whom we all rest great hopes for the future of the english stage mr conway who will probably accompany madame majesca on her return to america mr bellew whose father was well known as a reader in our country and the messrs forbes robertson the elder of whom besides being a most romantic and beautiful actor is also a painter who has done most excellent work and the younger mr norman forbes robertson who has made several brilliant successes with madame majesca and who is anxious to act over here what about la Boucher? he is one of the most brilliant conversationalists and the most brilliant journalist in england one of the many democrats which the english aristocracy has produced he is bradlaugh's colleague in representing northampton and is a man of great importance in the radical party through his keen knowledge of all foreign affairs having been attache at all of the important courts he is the only brilliant enemy i ever had in england he has had more libel cases to defend than any man in england and he always wins them how old is he men are always as old as they feel and women as they look and i am sure that mr labouchere feels eternally young because he is always successful but if we were obliged to go down to relentless facts i should say he was a man of fifty how do he and bradlaugh work together politically he has been bradlaugh's staunchest defender and has been most loyal to his brother member the two best written papers in england are the world and truth you have already heard the editor of the world mr edmund yates lecture a very brilliant lecturer he is so i am sure americans will be interested in hearing the editor of the other paper how do you account for the radicalism of northampton the voters there are mostly poor and shoemakers are they not i do not think there is any connection between poverty and radicalism but there is between handicrafts and republicanism i mean that to work at any handicraft 
produces that sense of individualism which is the keynote of all republicanism. Then, in great cities, there is a constant spirit of discussion and a certain clash of ideas which make men think for themselves, so that the political thought of England progresses always in the manufacturing towns and never in the agricultural places. An agricultural labourer's view of politics is founded entirely on the weather. Mr. Wilde looks as if his western trip had agreed with him. End of section. Oscar Wilde, The Dubuque Herald, 3rd of March, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde, A Random Talk with the Apostle of the Dado, What He Thinks of Ingersoll, etc. Mr. A. Kitson, the gentleman who induced Mr. Wilde to lecture in our city, is evidently a wiser man today than he was before the nomadic English specimen introduced himself to a Dubuque audience. The lecture was not rendered in full, neither did Mr. Wilde give his lecture in as glowing colours and in as luminous a manner as Mr. Kitson was led to believe he would, and it evidently was quite fortunate for Mr. Wilde that he got his money in advance, for the man who engaged him did not think he came up to his agreement, and would evidently have questioned the payment of the amount agreed upon in full. In conversation with some gentlemen after the lecture, Mr. Wilde expressed his opinion on the press of America, and many other features concerning the American people. The press, he thought, had no comparison with the English journals, he considered American newspapers nothing but a lot of garbage, that they are the cullings of police courts and circulators of immodest literature, and he considers them so much beneath his notice that he will not attempt to answer any of their slanderous and unjust attempts to hurt his business in this country. He says he has been from London so long that he is beginning to believe himself a vagrant, and that he is losing all self-respect towards his own sex. He thinks, however, that if he is degrading himself, he is converting a large number of the American people to the appreciation of the beauties in scenery, and also cultivating their tastes in a manner that will be of great benefit in the future. He contradicts the statement made by Harvey Young that the aesthetic movement started in France, Mr. Wilde says that the aesthetic enthusiasm first started in England about a half-dozen years ago. His most intimate associate in Europe is the English crank Whistler, a man of considerable prominence in London for his many eccentric ideas. He thinks that the scenery in the vicinity of Dubuque is too utterly utter. He also was very much pleased with the ladies of Dubuque, thinking them quite refined. He remarked that his audience was small, but he considered it quite classic. Robert Ingersoll is, in the mind of the aesthetic, one of America's greatest men. Oscar says he shall positively have an interview with Robert on his return to the East. In answer to the accuracy of his general manager, Mr. Doily Cart of New York, paying some of the eastern newspapers to advertise Oscar as a cartoon baboon, presenting himself before the American people with an apple in his hand, he said it was positively false. Mr. Wilde says he heartily wishes he had some word illegible in this country that he could consider worthy of his notice, that he would like to make a defence in his own behalf, but that the American newspapers are too low for him to associate with. Mr. Wilde left yesterday morning for Rock Island. He lectures in Chicago on the 9th, if nothing prevents. He flatters himself on his appearance at the Opera House, because, he says, any man can make a speech or deliver a lecture, two or three words illegible, thousand people, but it requires nerve to deliver a lecture to empty benches.
End of section. Oscar Interviewed. The Rockford Daily Register. 3rd of March, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Interviewed. After the lecture last evening, a register representative dropped behind the scenes and met Oscar face to face, in his dressing room, where an extended interview was had. Mr. Wilde was semi-reclining like a withered sunflower upon a cushioned seat, while he held a darling cigarette between his teeth from which saffron smoke, probably the effect of the reflection of his countenance, lazily lingered a moment and then disappeared in upper air near at hand the great aesthete is very large and towering but his form tapers down in the tight breeches and stockings almost to a point to an interrogation as to how he liked the opera house he responded i am charmed i assure you with its beauty and beautiful design it is artistic in colouring and neat in detail your audience too though not large as i have been accustomed to displayed their cultured and sympathy by their intent attention he then went into a sort of aftermath lecture until the reporter fearing he was in for another hour's dissertation on art broke in with a query as to where he found his best american audience he replied in the west you are more natural here and one finds a deeper appreciation than in the east there they are too permeated with european ideas and follies which throw a sort of land and fog before anything new and accept too readily all the ridiculous notions engendered in europe in the west you are new and progressive and ready to accept an innovation if it comes well founded but of all audiences i have been most charmed with those in chicago they have been delightful so warm so receptive i cannot express my full delight with my chicago audiences i see you were advertised to speak on the renaissance how did you come to change oh, that is a very stupid piece of blandering and about equal to the unbusiness-like capacity of every business manager i have met in this country i once delivered a lecture on the renaissance in new york and never intended to deliver it again yet these foolish managers persist in unaccountably advertising that as my lecture wherever i go i have protested and begged but to no purpose until finally I allow them to do as they choose, and when I come to lecture, I do as I choose. Reporter. Would you have any objection to my taking your manuscript for a short time to give extracts of your choicest ideas? Oscar. The childlike simplicity of you gentlemen of the press throughout this entire country is something startling. In my early innocence, when I first arrived, i once loaned my manuscript to a reporter i did not get it back for four days and it caused me an infinite amount of annoyance before i obtained my property again since then i have guarded it myself most rigorously and have made it my rule never to allow any one to touch it at this juncture oscar himself turned interviewer and suddenly asked who is the most interesting person you ever interviewed this was rather a sudden jump at an inoffending bohemian, and for an instant his cheek deserted him, and he murmured something about that being a leading question. After his blushes had subsided, the reporter stated that after this noted interview had been filed away in the archives of his memory, it would always be a mooted question whether P. T. Barnum, Forper's ten thousand dollar girl, george francis train susan b anthony dr mary walker or his royal nibs were the most remarkable individuals who had dawned upon the reportorial horizon the carriage was then announced and apostle oscar drew on an intensely all but overcoat extending to his knees 
with a too too sincere soulful binding of mink fur the entire length and placing his pickerel like hand in the reportorial digits withdrew and where the sunflower had bloomed was darkness and fleshliness again end of section oscar interviewed the rockford daily gazette third of march eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain oscar interviewed the gazette reporter talks with mr wilde in bed and ascertains that he fails to practice what he preaches v aestheticism a reporter of the gazette called on oscar wilde the aesthetic apostle at his rooms in the holland house this morning by looking over the house register it was ascertained that his room was number twenty nine we rapped at the door of his room and a voice came from within come in on entering we found everything in perfect chaos knee breeches gaiters shirts stockings and shoes scattered indiscriminately about the room on the chairs and floor a something in bed covered with a blue checkered shirt called out pray what do you want i thought it was me servant we pulled out our pasteboard and after looking it over the object with the hair for this was about all that could be discerned except a huge and ungainly mouth remarked with a broad grin pray wait until i have finished me breakfast i have been travelling constantly for months and would like a short respite can't you come up in half an hour we replied that we certainly could and would and retired with the lasting impression that oscar was not very aesthetic nor as neat and tidy as has been reported of him and that he failed to practise what he preached at the appointed time we returned to the room rapped and was admitted upon entering we were much relieved at the sight for no longer were the articles scattered about the chairs and floor everything was in as perfect order as could be under the circumstances as the room was quite small mr wilde was dressed in a black velvet smoking jacket light brown pantaloons socks of the same colour and patent leather shoes with cloth tops to match the pantaloons he was just getting ready to depart and had on a seal brown overcoat lined with fur with fur collar and cuffs to match we were greeted with ah i see young man that you are on time and pray what can i do for you something aesthetic i suppose we asked for his autograph which was given at once after giving a volume of directions to his coloured servant and which scrawl is now on exhibition at this office in reply to a question whether or not he thought the audience was a small one last evening replied yes but very select and seemed to be composed of your best people who gave me very close attention throughout i do not care to address idle people but on the contrary to speak to manufacturers and merchants of which your beautiful city seems to be well supplied he referred to the action of the harvard students in boston and said they put their heads in the lion's mouth and with the same result as might be expected their parading was indeed grotesque and was simply a schoolboy's affair at brooklyn the audience in the gallery were ill-behaved people and applauded at the wrong points in my speech but i paid no attention to them and finished my talk without interruption the very worst place i have lectured thus far was at rochester new york where the audience bellowed clapped and acted like a pack of blasted fools at this point we were interrupted by the announcement that the hack was ready and after a good morning and cordial shake we left he took the train for aurora where he lectures this evening end of section oscar wilde in the west the new york herald sixth of march eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain oscar wilde in the west by telegraph to the herald racine wisconsin march fifth eighteen eighty two oscar wilde made his first appearance before a wisconsin audience last night there were not more than seventy persons in the hall the racine college lads 
had arranged to give him a sunflower reception but were deterred by the professors the lecture was only marked by occasional snickerings of an unappreciative audience the herald correspondent subsequently interviewed mr wilde as to any impression he might have formed of the west he said i like chicago even better than boston but then i have been to so many incipient little places of late and i am almost worn out with hunger i love my cigarettes and do not know what i should have done without them i have not been able to obtain a morsel of food that i liked and have lived on cigarettes the correspondent then asked him if he had given up his lily and he replied that the lily story was a newspaper joke he broke down in the midst of his lecture here saying he was exhausted and could not read his manuscript he goes to milwaukee tomorrow end of section david and oscar the chicago sunday tribune fifth of march eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain david and oscar mr wilde replies to professor swing's recent criticism of him mr oscar wilde was in the city yesterday afternoon and understanding that he had something to say in answer to professor david swing's criticism of him published in a recent number of the alliance a representative of the tribune called on him at the grand pacific hotel he lectured friday evening in aurora appeared in racine last evening and discourses on the beautiful in art to the philistines of milwaukee this evening as milwaukee has been represented to him as a good town for sunday shows he thought he would try his sunday experiment there first he greeted the reporter in his usual cordial manner yesterday and in answer to a question regarding professor swing's article he said while in rockford illinois recently i was informed that an important attack on me had been published by professor david swing of your city in a paper called the alliance i was told that this article had so influenced the proprietress of a ladies school there who had purchased two tickets for my lecture one for herself and the other for the best behaved pupil that she returned the tickets to the box office in consequence of professor swing's attack of course i felt that any attack which would have such a marked and immediate influence on a whole city must be most remarkable and intellectual and i quite looked forward to the pleasure of reading it this morning for next to a staunch friend the best thing that a man can have is a brilliant enemy there is nothing more depressing than to be attacked by a fool as one cannot answer and does not fight with the same weapons i confess however he continued with a smile to have been greatly disappointed at what i read this morning because if a man attacks one for the clothes that one likes to wear he should go for his answer to one's tailor and if a man assails one for the flowers that one admires he should discuss the matter with one's gardener and as regards the learned professor's sneer at me for receiving a fee for lecturing he is not the first clergyman that has visited me with such a bitter reproach which derives all its sting from the fact that it comes from a body of men most of whom receives large salaries for preaching the beauty of voluntary poverty as regards his remarks on me omitting the aesthetics of mind and heart said mr wilde as i feel sure that he is too honest an antagonist to wilfully misrepresent one i can only conclude that he did not attend my lecture had he done so he would have seen that i divided my lecture into two portions in the first of which i dwelt on the necessity of teaching the handicraftsman to work not only with his hands as though indeed he were a mere machine but with his head and heart always for unless a man does so 
his work will always be commonplace and poor and have no beauty at all in it i dwelt on the moral education that working in every art would give a man for all good art is founded on two things truth and honesty in the world of business indeed the liar and the cheat may escape detection all their lives but in art it is not so a workman who is dishonest in his labour or who tells a lie in his art such as painting wood to represent marble or staining paper to represent stone or pretending that the thing is solid when it is probably merely a hollow sham that man knows that in consequence of it his work is worthless and will not last for any time so much for those who work in art in the second part of my lecture said mr wilde languidly knocking the ashes off his cigarette and throwing away all but the butt i treated of those who only look at art and do not create or the ordinary man and woman of life and i showed of what value the refining influence of noble and beautiful art would be to them from their childhood to their manhood and i spoke of what influence the arts would have in producing between all countries a common intellectual spirit for no truth of history is clearer than this that national hatreds are always strongest where civilization is lowest and i acknowledge that i am surprised continued mr wilde to find that any one with the name of david should be fighting for the philistines he should be taking a pebble from the river brook and hurling it at that monstrous goliath of chicago architecture the water tower instead of praising it as being as he calls it calm and rational two most unfortunate epithets but perhaps i am wrong in taking the professor seriously for from what i have seen of american literature i have found that the sermon of the divine is always humorous and the writings of the humorous always depressing in my next lecture i hope to dwell at length on the relations between art and morality which have been so much misunderstood i lectured at central music hall in your city next saturday evening on interior and exterior house decoration how have you been pleased with your reception in the smaller towns mr wilde asked the reporter very well indeed in aurora where i lectured last evening they have recently started a decorative art school and are very enthusiastic in any of the cities which you have visited have art schools been established as a result of your lecture oh yes in philadelphia and in some other cities when do you leave this country i leave about the first of may and go to paris to visit the salons and see the artists i shall return to new england and lecture in boston and some of the new england cities before i sail however on leaving paris i shall travel through england and deliver lectures before the various art schools there have you ever lectured in england no sir i made my debut as a lecturer in new york city have you ever delivered your saturday evening's lecture before no i have not in fact i have not completed it yet i shall probably deliver it in boston but it is not a lecture to give a city at first i think it best to start by giving the principles of art and then enter into the details end of section professor swing and oscar from the daily interocean sixth of march eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain professor swing and oscar the apostle is rather disappointed over the professor's alliance article and gives forth no uncertain sound professor david swing's criticism of oscar wilde published in the alliance recently seems to have been read by the latter and to cause him some annoyance 
Mr. Wilde was interviewed by a representative of the Interocean on Saturday at the Grand Pacific Hotel, in response to a written request from the Apostle of the Lily and Kneebridge. He said, I lectured in Rockford, Illinois, lately, and there learned that Mr. Swing's article had induced the lady principal of a seminary, who had purchased a couple of tickets to my lecture, to return them to the box office. The audience was small. I felt that an attack that could so influence a whole city must be at least remarkable, and I looked forward to reading it with pleasurable emotions. I usually pay no attention to newspaper ridicule or criticism, and have long ago learned to entirely disregard it. But next to having a staunch friend is the pleasure of having a brilliant enemy. There is nothing so depressing as to be attacked by a fool, for you cannot answer him or fight with his own weapons. "'You have read the article, then?' said the reporter. "'Yes, but I confess to having been greatly disappointed at Professor Swing's article. If a man attacks one for the clothes that one likes to wear, he should go for his answer to the tailor who made them. And if he assails me for a preference in flowers, he should argue the matter with a gardener. As for his sneered at me for receiving a fee for lecturing, I can assure him that he is not the first clergyman who has thus condemned me, but this shaft loses its sting when I consider that it comes from a body of men, most of whom preach for a salary. I can only conclude, continued Mr. Wilde, that Professor Swing did not attend my lecture. If he had done so, he would have seen that I divided it into two parts, in the first of which I dwelt upon the necessity of teaching the handicraftsman to work not only with his hands, like a machine, but with his heart and with his head. If he does not do so, his work will be nothing more than commonplace, and have no beauty of art in it at all. I dwelt upon the moral education that working in every art would give a man the two things upon which all good art is founded, truth and honesty. In the world of business, it is possible for the liar and cheat to escape detection all their lives. Not so in art. A workman who creates a sham, or does a dishonest work in his art, such as painting wood to represent marble, or staining paper to represent stone, or pretending that a thing is solid when it is merely a hollow sham, knows that in consequence of it his work is worthless and will not last. In the second part of my lecture I treated of those who only look at art and do not create, the ordinary man or woman of life, and showed of what nature the refining influence of noble and beautiful art would be to them, from their childhood to their manhood, I spoke of what influence the arts would have in producing between all countries a common intellectual spirit, for no truth of history is clearer than this, that national hatreds are always strongest when civilization is lowest. I acknowledge that I am surprised to find that anyone with the name of David should be found fighting in the ranks of the Philistines, he ought to take a pebble from the banks of the Chicago River and hurl it at that monstrous Goliath of Chicago architecture, the water tower, instead of praising it as being, as he calls it, calm and rational. Those two epithets are very unfortunate in this connection. Perhaps I am wrong in taking the professor seriously, for, from what I have seen of American literature, I have found that the sermon of the divine is always humorous, and the writing of the humorous always depressing. I hope in my next lecture to dwell at length on the relations between art and morality, which have been so much misunderstood. When will you lecture here again? Next Saturday evening, in Central Music Hall, on Interior and Exterior House Decorations. Did you ever lecture in England? No, I made my debut as a lecturer in New York City.
End of section. Wild and Swing, The Boston Herald, 6th of March, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wild and Swing, The Poet's Reply to the Pastor's Criticisms, Special Dispatch to the Herald, Chicago, Illinois, March 5th, 1882. Oscar Wilde was smoking a cigarette when your correspondent saw him this afternoon in a Grand Pacific hotel parlour, he wore a dove-coloured sack coat of velvet, trimmed with drab silk braid, vest to match, pantaloons of light-coloured Scotch tweed, shoes of patent leather and very pointed at the toe, neck dress of brilliant red and pocket handkerchief to match. I am fond of sweet odours. I love perfumery passionately he remarked as he paid a boy four dollars who came into the room bearing six pint bottles of perfumery. Dictating in a deliberate, distinct utterance, he spoke as follows regarding the recent attack upon him in the alliance. Knowing of Professor Swing as a brilliant man, I had hoped that his attack upon me would at least be brilliant, for, next to having a loyal friend, that is for me no pleasure like that to be found in having an intelligent enemy, simply because one can answer him. I was very much disappointed when I read it, for if a man has anything to say against the clothes I wear, he should write to my tailor, and if he cares to speak unfavourably of flowers, which I think beautiful, he should address himself to my gardener, and— as regards his solemn attack upon me for receiving fees for the trouble of lecturing, nothing could, of course, be more foolish. Coming from a practical man of the world, such as Professor Swing is said to be, every man should be paid for the work he does. The bitter reproach which comes from the clergy to me has a grotesque side when one considers that it comes from a body of men who receive large salaries for preaching the beauty of voluntary poverty. As regards his statement that I omit to take account of the moral element in art, as I feel sure that he is too honest a man to try to misrepresent me, I can only conclude that he neither attended nor read my lecture. Had he done so, he would have seen that I divided it into two parts. In the first part, I said that the moral elements were necessary for good workmanship, that the ordinary workman worked with his hands and his heart, if the work has any beauty at all, and that all good art rests on two things, truth and honesty. That work dishonestly done or which pretended to be something else than what it really was, such as the painting of wood to represent marble, or the staining of paper to represent stone, was all dead, bad art, quite worthless and very ugly. There is no better school for anybody than is to be found in work in art, for while in the world about us the cheat and the liar may often go unpunished for a long time, if a man does untruthful work in art, he knows that he is bringing upon himself his own punishment, that he will be found out and won't last. In the second part I dwelt upon the effect that art would have on ordinary men and women who do not work in art, but merely enjoy it, I showed what its influence might be on children, and that it might have on nations. Now, as regards children, it would teach them to love the beautiful and the good, and hate the evil and the ugly, quite naturally and simply, the lesson coming to them so unconsciously and in such a joyous way that they would never forget it. As regards the nation, I advance the thought that art— by producing a common intellectual atmosphere, might be laying a sure basis for some universal brotherhood of man, and a humanity which would include all patriotism. And I reminded the audience how Goethe had felt this, and how he had no surer lesson to show one 
than that national hatreds are always strongest where civilization is lowest i am very much surprised that any one bearing the name of david should be fighting on the side of the philistines rather should he be the first to take the pebble from the river brook and hurl it at that monstrous goliath of chicago architecture the water tower instead of calling it a calm and rational building two most unfortunate epithets but perhaps i am wrong in taking the learned professor so seriously to task for of what i have read in american literature the sermons of your divines always seem to be humorous and the writings of your humorists most depressing end of section oscar wilde milwaukee sunday sentinel fifth of march eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain oscar wilde arrival in milwaukee of the distinguished apostle of the beautiful how the sunflower and lily young man looked and what he had to say a lecture on aestheticism this evening his impressions of the country long on hair and short on breeches the only striking peculiarities oscar wilde he of the sunflower and the lily the distinguished apostle of aestheticism arrived in milwaukee on the eleven thirty five o'clock train last night and was driven in a closed carriage to the plankington house there a number of men who were anxious to catch a glimpse of the young aesthete were waiting for his arrival and eyed him critically when he came tripping into the office the poet presented a striking appearance he is somewhat tall but disguises his lanky proportions by rounding his shoulders his hair brown waving and fluffy was parted in the middle and fell like that in the pictures of charles the second to his shoulders his face looked forth as between a set of soft window curtains white beardless smiling and mild the features were of irish much toned down prominent but not strong the brow the little triangular area to be seen of it that is was wholly placid and unmarked and the eyebrows were neat delicate and arched and of the sort coveted by women he was dressed in a travelling suit of some dark material breeches cut en train so to speak having discarded his short clothes and silk hose no doubt on account of the change in the weather oscar wilde was born in dublin october sixteenth eighteen fifty five he is therefore twenty-six years old his father was sir william wilde of merrion square dublin sir william was a remarkable man he was a celebrated physician and widely known through england and on the continent lady wilde the poet's mother was fully as remarkable as his father she was a woman of splendid beauty and conspicuous talent under the pseudonym of speranza she published several volumes of poems which demonstrated an undoubted poetic gift and achieved an honourable place in english literature he was mostly educated in the colleges of ireland entering magdalen college oxford at the age of nineteen graduating with considerable honour in eighteen seventy eight his literary career at once commenced and since that time he has been struggling as a disciple of the beautiful and has been lecturing in america for several months past he will lecture at the opera house this evening how he looked after mr wilde had been comfortably settled in one of the elegant parlours of the hotel a sunday sentinel reporter called and paid him his respects when ushered into the luxurious apartments mr wilde was found reclining on an easy chair but arose immediately and crossing the room courteously bade his visitor to remove his wrapping and make himself at home as he strode toward the reporter to welcome him mr wilde's figure is represented in the accompanying cut a talk with him mr wilde talks with ease and there seems to be nothing extraordinary about him with the exception of his dreamy eyes somewhat effeminate ways and looks and his long wavy hair he said that his stay in america had been made pleasant in many ways and that he was glad to visit milwaukee which he had heard spoken of as a beautiful city the weather permitting he expected to see a good deal of it to-day 
have you seen very many picturesque landscapes in america comparatively few my expectations in this respect have not been realised mr wilde would you kindly state the purpose of your visit to america regardless of financial considerations my purpose in visiting america is to propagate the ideas of the aesthetes of england of whom i am one money is a secondary if at all a consideration what is the purpose of the aesthetes that i will state at length in my lecture i will say however that the aesthetic movement has for its object the revolutionising of english and modern poetry and painting the aesthetes are pre-raphaelites that is to say they believe nature to be the most beautiful of all things and hence adopt it in its most beautiful forms and conditions as a model for their poetry and paintings the prevailing school in america and that which is fast disappearing in europe and in england especially is opposed to our school and believes the works of man to be more beautiful than those of god who is our teacher by what direct means do you intend to create in american artists a belief in your theories and inculcate in the american people a love for the beautiful presumably by means of my lectures but my entire plans i have not arranged as yet do you expect to awaken an interest in this matter among the poor or even the middle classes who have not had the advantages of a careful training those who have not had the advantages of a careful training replied mr wilde are already displaying the fact and manifesting their interest in the aesthetic movement by displaying in their places of business or about their uncouth persons huge pieces of cardboard furnished by quack doctors whose advertisements they bear and formed and coloured in the resemblance of a sunflower these two utterly practical mr wilde smiled people i have despaired of ever reaching by a direct appeal the fact is the mass of americans seem to be sceptical of all new theories in art and even seem to be prejudiced against the sentimentalism of their own artists i must therefore address myself more particularly to those who have cultivated a love of art and the beautiful and who if they accept my theories may in time influence the masses to the same end lily and sunflower your fondness for the lily and sunflower has caused some extravagant caricatures yes but i assure you they do not disturb me in the least on the contrary they are rather amusing neither they nor the extravagant and exaggerated opera of patience can prejudice sensible people against me you have been quoted as saying that the women's dresses in patience are not exaggerated oh the embroidery and paintings on the dresses are made for stage effect and are larger than are worn in what is called good society but in design they are correct patience has done our cause no harm ridicule may be a serious weapon but there should be that in a true poet of a genuine cause which is indestructible and there is indestructibility in our cause oh no people understand that patience is merely a burlesque i enjoyed it very much the music is delightful and that is certainly on our side even if the words are not speaking of dresses how do you like the beauty of their american wearers i am charmed with american beauty the women possess a certain delicacy of outline surpassing english women but the colour of english women is richer and warmer i think i saw clara morris on the stage in new york one evening and i was delighted with her as was sarah bernhardt who had told me very much about her charms and i have met many surpassingly beautiful young ladies since my arrival milwaukee bells by the way he added have you any beautiful women here oh yes replied the reporter we consider ourselves very fortunate in that respect i have been informed that the society of milwaukee is very good and that you have many wealthy fashionable and cultured people here 
Mr. Wilde stated that he had just received a telegram from his American manager, Doily Cart, announcing that the latter had completed arrangements for the presentation of his, Wilde's, drama in New York, at an early date, and that Miss Clara Morris would assume the leading character. "'How do you think the West compares with the East?' asked the reporter. "'The West interests us in England more than the East. You are making civilization by yourselves and for yourselves. So much in the East is a mere reflection of European thought, and so much of that a mere misunderstanding of it.' The reporter called attention to the reports that Mrs. Langtry and Henry Labouchere were to come to America, and asked him concerning them. Of Mrs. Langtry, he said, She is one of my greatest friends. What is she like? Beautiful women are quite indescribable. The beauty of her face is in the extreme sweetness and loveliness of her expression, and the wonderful delicacy and transparency of her complexion. The real wonder of her beauty to all of us who are artists is that whether one carved her in marble or painted her in colour, she is equally lovely, the lines of her face being as strongly worked and as definite in outline as a Greek bronze, and yet so perfect in proportion that the effect is one of the simplest loveliness. In acting she has a wonderfully musical and well-modulated voice, a delightful joyousness of manner, and real capabilities of her art. The part that, when she has had more study and practice, she will make her greatest success in will, I think, be Rosalind in As You Like It. Was her first appearance really good? No art would be worth doing if it could be done easily the first time, but there has been no debutante on the stage in London for many years who showed such really remarkable power and such great promise. She is now going to study frou-frou to make a tour of England. She is very nervous about visiting America, but, like many of us, most ambitious to see your country and to make herself a position here. Are there many young actors of promise in England? Yes, there are four or five now there on whom we all rest great hopes for the future of the English stage. Mr. Conway, who will probably accompany Madame Majeska on her return to America, Mr. Bellew, whose father was well known as a reader in our country, and the Messrs. Forbes Robertson, the elder of whom, besides being a most romantic and beautiful actor, is also a painter, who has done most excellent work, and the younger, Mr. Norman Forbes Robertson, who has made several brilliant successes with Madame Majeska, and who is anxious to act over here. End of section. Oscar's Opinion, Sedalia Weekly Bazoo, 14th of March, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar's Opinion. Says of the Chicago Herald of yesterday, Oscar Wilde returned to Chicago yesterday. The lecture has been very successful, pecuniarily, since leaving here, especially at St. Louis and Cincinnati, at both of which places he met crowded houses. At neither, however, did the receipts come up to those of the night when he lectured in this city, although they were satisfactorily large and the management has no cause to be dissatisfied. The reason why the proceeds of the lectures at these places is said to have been less than here is because those who flocked to see the Apostle of Culture were for the most part not willing to pay for the highest-priced seats. "'I am glad to see you back in Chicago,' said the reporter, as he entered his presence. "'I think that the readers of the Herald would be glad to read another interview with you. "'Have you returned here to lecture?' "'I shall lecture a second time in Chicago on next Saturday week. "'You have been to St. Louis and Cincinnati?' "'Yes. Did you like those places?' "'Yes, especially Cincinnati.' End of section. Oscar Wilde, The Jacksonville Daily Journal, 8th of March, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde. 
Oscar Wilde's movements. Mr. Oscar Wilde arrived in the city yesterday morning, coming here direct from Chicago. From here he goes to Decatur to lecture there. In Chicago, as he informs us, he had a pleasant meeting with Reverend Henry Ward Beecher and accepted an invitation to visit him in his Hudson River home in May. End of section. Our Aesthetic Visitor, The Daily Republican, Decatur, 8th of March, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Our Aesthetic Visitor, the only Oscar Wilde to lecture in Decatur tonight. Decatur is always at the front in securing all the first-class amusement attractions and lecture celebrities going, for which thanks are due to manager Haynes, who always tries to be in style and always succeeds. We have had Beecher, Tilton, Josh Billings, Goff, and other noted lecturers, and tonight we will have the privilege of seeing and hearing Oscar Wilde, the great apostle of aestheticism, who will appear at the Opera House. His subject will be art decoration. Mr. Doyley Cart, Oscar's manager, writes us about what we all know, that Mr. Oscar Wilde's visit to this country and his appearance upon the lecture platform has been an event of great interest this season. He came here chiefly to show the beginning, growth, and real aim of the so-called aesthetic movement in England, of which he is, by common consent, considered to be a leader. He has carried out this purpose by delivering an address entitled The English Renaissance, devoted mainly to an exposition of this new social movement. This address has been listened to by the largest lecture audiences which have been seen since the days of Charles Dickens, and has awakened a widespread interest in the poet and his topic, an interest which is daily becoming stronger. At the suggestion of many friends, he has prepared a second lecture devoted to what may be called the practical application of this theory to everyday home life, being the principles of aesthetic art as applied generally to the wide range of art ornamentation. It is entitled Art Decoration, and has met with universal success wherever delivered. Admission, 50 and 75 cents. Reserved seats, one dollar. A Republican interviewer found Mr. Wilde in room 72 at the new Deeming Hotel this afternoon. He is a young man of fine physique, tall, large head, high forehead, long brown hair parted in the middle, and languid eyes. He wore a Seymour velvet coat with a purple handkerchief peeping out of the left-hand upper pocket, and a tie of the same colour appeared at his neck. The young Englishman, who is a graduate of Oxford, is one of the finest conversationalists the writer has ever met. He talks fluently, has a fine command of language, and loves to converse principally about art and her devotees. He wanted to know at parting if there were any lovers of the beautiful in nature and the decorative art in Decatur, and, fortunately, the scribe was able to answer that there were quite a number, and that no doubt a few of them would avail themselves of the opportunity to hear your lecture this evening. While in Chicago the other day, Mr. Wilde met Henry Ward Beecher, whom Oscar thinks a capital good fellow, a man with whom it is indeed a pleasure to associate and converse. After closing his lecture engagements in America, he will return to England and spend the month of May in Paris. End of section. Gush and Greed The Daily Republican Decatur 9th of March, 1882 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gush and Greed Oscar Wilde, the travelling aesthete in Decatur his personal appearance and the talk. 
mr oscar wilde the aesthetic bundle of egotism from england who has an unmistakable and vulgar greed for american dollars filled his appointment to lecture at the opera house in this city last evening it was not expected that oscar would be greeted by a large or enthusiastic audience because westerners are not given to running after long-haired novelties no matter what ism they may represent the residents of decatur are distinctively a discriminating people and pretenders and egotists generally look upon vacant chairs when the curtain rises in our temple of music and comedy the audience which greeted oscar last night numbered less than a hundred and twenty-five people and was made up principally of members of the two art classes in this city and the curious who went to the hall expecting to be dreadfully bored and a few of them were not disappointed though they lingered until the snob had made his farewell aesthetic bow mr wilde appeared upon the rostrum at twenty minutes past eight and bowed rather awkwardly as he took his position beside the stand upon which was a lonesome goblet of water oscar is a young englishman whose age cannot be more than thirty years he is tall and rather slender but his head which is covered with long brown hair reaching nearly to his shoulders and parted in the middle is large his face which is fair and beardless is quite long his chin and nose being well developed as to size and length his eyes as seen by the interviewer yesterday are brown and languishing he stood before the curious audience last night attired in a rich suit of dark velvet the one he always wears when lecturing his coat was of the full-dress swallow-tailed pattern beneath the coat was a vest of velvet and the tight-fitting pantaloons of the same material reached to the knees the remainder of the aesthete's lower extremities being encased in black silk stockings the feet of the novelty were covered partly with patent leather slippers ornamented with black bows oscar's lily-white neck was encircled by a low standing collar oxford style and a billowy tie of white silk obscured from view his shirt front which was doubtless white as the driven snow on the left hand of the specimen of the english school of art was a cream-coloured kid glove and in this hand oscar held his manuscript for a while the right hand held an unused glove and from the coat tail pocket was fished out a dainty lace handkerchief when the lecturer favoured his hearers with the aesthetic cough such was the appearance of mr wilde when he commenced his talk for it was nothing else on art decoration as it has been viewed by him during his travels through europe the talk was beautiful and engaging in its way though at the beginning the hearer had to watch closely to determine when oscar reached a period for he is prone to close each sentence with a rising inflection but he got to putting in three m quads after each period and then it was more agreeable to hear him speak his piece with which he is so familiar the talk was wholly on art and the proper decoration of dwellings as it is understood by the english school of art and when this is said there is little more to add he enlarged upon the subject presenting beautiful word pictures and predicting the good feeling and happiness that would prevail among the people should they endeavour to make everything about them not only useful but substantial and beautiful homes that are now unsightly and cheerless should be adorned with tasteful ornaments such as are pleasing to the eye and not at all commonplace or vulgar oscar would not only have us decorate our rooms but also the exterior of our dwellings should be adorned with carved articles the jewellery we wear should be of the best and most artistic good taste should be displayed in placing proper figures upon dishes urns etc 
and nothing whatever should be formed without some display of the true artist's work the young man who spoke for just one hour and whose delivery was inferior closed with a gushy peroration on his pet hobby bowed made a military right about and made four strides which took him off the stage his long locks being somewhat agitated by the breeze which his rapid movement created there was considerable merit in the talk on art which is a matter of some importance to not a few people in this and other countries but there was nothing particularly new or striking in oscar's effort it was commonplace the lecture was clothed in the finest language such as we may find in any well-written book why wilde appears before the public in his masquerade costume is a mystery to some people but not so to oscar and his manager mr vale the englishman who stood at the door last night it is oscar's principal advertising dodge his lecture of itself would not attract a handful of people in any town but it is generally known that oscar appears in the so-called aesthetic costume and this being the case people in some towns particularly in chicago and in the east flock to see him by the hundreds egotistic oscar is a glaring fraud as a lecturer he may know something about what he calls true art but if he said all he had to say last night there are persons in this country fully as competent to teach and instruct in this respect as he pretends to be and there is no necessity for americans to recognise the new social movement inaugurated by the english school of art of which wilde is the special champion but oscar is not so much concerned about converts to his notions in this country the prime object of his visit is to capture american dollars to fill his depleted purse with which to waste his time in wandering aimlessly about european cities oscar told a reporter that he thought the provincial cities in illinois very commonplace towns and asked his visitor if he didn't feel bored living in such a small place a town where he said there was no opportunity to mingle with men of art of science and of letters he said he couldn't exist in such a town what an unfortunate lot of people we decatorites must be as seen through wilde's telescope on the rostrum wilde poses and talks gushingly and has nothing to say that will particularly offend his hearers but taken aside and alone he is the queerest piece of humanity that ever struck decatur in private he assumes the manner of the pampered english swell and will talk about little else except the nobility and his art everything else is commonplace and vulgar to him except perhaps american dollars the polished fraud departed for peoria early this morning he will lecture in chicago on saturday night on interior and exterior house decorations End of section. Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde, The Daily Leader. Bloomington, 10th of March, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde, The Leader Interviews the Famous Exponent of Aestheticism. Oscar Wilde, the latest and greatest furore in the modern lecture field arrived from peoria at eleven thirty this forenoon and was installed in number nine at the ashley this afternoon a leader representative called on the gentleman in the interest of the reading public and for personal satisfaction in response to a cordial come in the writer opened the door and stepped into the presence of a handsome specimen of physical development tall with broad shoulders full chest and well-rounded neck a smooth face effeminate perhaps in some of its outlines 
but beaming with intelligence strongly marked by a tolerably prominent nose and large expressive eyes and lighted by an almost perpetual smile revealing large but even and not ungainly teeth his hair is long and flowing parted hardly in the middle and completes a picture resembling the engraving of prominent characters of past ages he wore a brown velvet sack coat black pants cut in the prevailing fashion and patent leather shoes while a light blue tie caught in a sailor knot and a handkerchief of a corresponding hue protruding from a side pocket were the utter features of his wardrobe he was reclining on a sofa in the centre of the room confronting a small table covered with writing material other articles of the room were a mammoth fur coat a satchel and a handsome morocco case containing sundry bottles which perhaps in turn contained diverse spiritous concoctions there was an air of delicious languor in the appearance of the room which was in keeping with the character of the occupant mr wilde received the leader man kindly and gracefully entered into an easy flowing conversation developing a number of interesting facts without a very severe application of the press pump his experience in travelling to the small cities of the west through the monotonous prairie country had been anything but pleasurable he considered the inevitable jostle against the rabble and the draughts from the constantly opening doors at way stations as dreadfully dreadful he is considering an extremely flattering offer to visit california but the dread of the long and wearisome ride is weighing in the balance against an acceptance he goes from here to chicago by request to deliver a new lecture which he has prepared while travelling and thence projects a tour of the canadas he inquired the writer's opinion of anna dickinson's hamlet and thought that it must necessarily be shockingly defective he spoke very kindly of booth whom he had seen frequently on the stage in london and whom he pronounced a charming fellow with such a handsome face mr wilde is a personal friend of irving the pet english actor and said that the latter had assured him that he would make an american tour but feared that the people would not like his voice and certain mannerisms peculiar to the london stage the reporter innocently mentioned the name of mrs langtry the english beauty whose prominence in the london papers for a few years past has rivalled the queen and whose advent on the stage is the absorbing topic and evidently awakened a responsive chord in the bosom of mr wilde who by the way is quite intimate with the charming lady he said that he had remained in london a month longer than he had originally intended in order to witness her debut he considered her the most promising debutante on the modern english stage and was quite rapturous in describing her qualities he says she will visit america professionally the genial oscar seemed to disparage american scenery and by way of a corker the writer mentioned niagara falls and paused for the effect mr wilde laughed pleasantly and said that from above the view was too unbroken and was sadly defective as an ideal of grandeur but from below the view was both captivating and imposing mr wilde spoke in the highest terms of the american women and their efforts to cultivate true art but had little to say of the men and laughed heartily at the newspapers the writer left the presence of the aesthetic young poet with the opinion that he is nobody's fool being a young gentleman of superior education and culture but with an eye to the main chance and his making a fortune out of the credulity of his fellow creatures end of section oscar wilde the minneapolis tribune sixteenth of march eighteen eighty two
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde, arrival of this much talked of young man in this city yesterday afternoon. He tells a small audience in the evening what he knows about decorative art. An ass feet. Oscar Wilde, the apostle of beauty, and the most talked about young man of the day, arrived in Minneapolis from Chicago yesterday afternoon and registered at the Nicolette. Seeing his name in the hotel register, a Tribune reporter concluded to pay this ultra poetical, super aesthetical, out of the way young man a visit and sent in his card. He was at once informed that Mr. Wilde was at home and almost before he knew it was ushered into the parlour where the celebrity was sitting. The sight that met the reporter's eyes when he entered the room was quite too utterly utter, and nearly took his breath away. Mr. Wilde was reclining upon a handsome fur robe, carelessly thrown upon a lounge. He was dressed in a black velvet cutaway coat and vest, tightly fitting pantaloons of a light brown colour, patent leather shoes, and brown stockings. His vest was cut very low, and displayed a good deal of a shirt front, which the bellboy who escorted the reporter to the room swore positively was frescoed. A low turn-down collar and a light blue cravat completed his by no means unbecoming attire. His bonny locks, which were parted in the middle, fell to his shoulders, but the fact that he was slightly pigeon-toed detracted somewhat from his lion-like appearance. He arose in a languid manner to greet the reporter, extending a lily-white hand, speaking with a slight drawl with a strong English accent. Seeing that it was too late to back out, the reporter assumed as aesthetic a position as he knew how, and entered into conversation with Mr. Wilde. Wilde Statements In the course of his remarks, Mr. Wilde said that hitherto England had not expected much of this country from an aesthetic standpoint. In fact, she could not, logically. Now, however, the great questions were settled. The war was over, and Europe generally felt interested in the question as to whether or not this country would become civilised. According to Mr. Wilde, if this country wants to be civilised, she must give herself up to art. Industry without art is barbarism. When asked what the object of his visit to this country was, he stated that it was to create and foster a love for the beautiful, which he thought was greatly needed. The West, he said, was the place which attracted the eyes of Europe, as the East was a copy of England. He could not understand Americans, nor the gap that existed between the literature of the country and the people. Americans lived seriously, but never wrote of life seriously. Though simple and crude, they had some elements of greatness about them, and he felt hopeful concerning their future. His lecture in the evening. The announcement that Mr. Wilde would lecture in the Academy of Music in the evening filled that place of amusement with about 250 people, most of whom were evidently drawn there from motives of curiosity. The subject of the lecture was decorative art, and the discourse was as flat and insipid as could well be imagined. From the time the speaker commenced to his closing sentence, he kept up the same unvarying, endless drawl, without modulating his voice or making a single gesture, giving one the impression that he was a prize monkey wound up, and warranted to talk for an hour and a half without stopping. He wore a black velvet coat and knee breeches, black silk stockings, low shoes with silver buckles, while around his neck was a large white silk scarf tied into an extravagant bow knot. 
he came upon the stage unannounced and alone commenced speaking before the audience fairly knew he was before them and when the closing sentence of the lecture had been spoken bobbed his head and retired there was no applause or enthusiasm shown and though mr wilde when he first came upon the stage glanced apprehensively at the galleries no attempt of any kind was made to interrupt the lecture if he had a manuscript he never used it and by reason of his english pronunciation and drawling method of speaking it was hard to tell just what he said one could gather however from his remarks that the divine prescience of beauty is not on inheritance for such an informing and presiding spirit of art to shield us from all harsh and alien influences we of the teutonic and saxon races must turn rather to that strained self-consciousness of the age which is the keynote of all our romantic art and must be the source of all or nearly all our culture i mean that intellectual curiosity of the nineteenth century which is always looking for the secret of the life that still lingers around old and bygone forms of culture the truths of art cannot be taught they are revealed only revealed to natures which have made themselves receptive of all beautiful impressions by the study of and the worship of all beautiful things he then dilated upon the necessity of teaching our handicraftsmen and peasantry the beautiful in art told how easy it was to combine the beautiful with the useful if one only knew how and how the beautiful was the only thing that made life worth the living having finished what he had to say he bowed coolly gathered up his papers and calmly stalked off the stage leaving his audience to retire at their leisure a closing venture it is understood that the gentleman under whose auspices mr wilde came here is decidedly out of pocket by this speculation mr wilde charges two hundred and fifty dollars a night and expenses for inculcating a love for the beautiful among our peasantry and it is doubtful if the receipts amounted to two hundred dollars this will therefore probably be the only time that mr wilde will favour minneapolis with his presence he lectures in st paul this evening after which he goes to omaha and thence to the pacific coast to weep on the bosom of joaquin miller End of section. The Apostle of Asceticism, St. Paul Pioneer Press, 16th of March, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Apostle of Asceticism. He was greeted by an audience of only fair proportions last evening, and delivered his lecture on the English Renaissance in a monotonous tone to a curious audience oscar wilde the aesthete arrived from chicago yesterday afternoon and was assigned to room one one three at the nicolette where an interviewer was cordially greeted by him mr wilde in the course of conversation gave expression to remarks not particularly differing from those contained in interviews in other cities and heretofore printed in the pioneer press mr wilde as he stepped from the train was dressed in the dark green coat with a fur collar so frequently described in the newspapers and was the object of much curious interest the audience which greeted him at the academy last evening was not a large one numbering probably three hundred people it was for the most part a very respectful and intelligent audience still there could be detected an evident feeling that the vast majority of the hearers came to see the man more than to hear his lecture and the fact had further evidence in the constant going and coming of men who had been attracted out of mere curiosity 
the audience was bright and appreciative but they were cultured enough to know that the lecture would be a series of artistic platitudes without the slightest trace of artistic revolution they found before the lecture was ended that the youthful speaker was imbued with the egotistical idea that the american public know nothing of art as he pretended to teach them and ended by reciting axioms which have been the foundation of art for centuries the effect upon the audience can be summed up in the words of one who was heard to say i came to see wilde and i have seen him i did not expect to learn and did not with an eye evidently to impressing the truth of some of mr wilde's well-known assertions the stage carpenter had shoved into the grooves well down the stage one of the most outrageously inartistic and utterly vulgar sets from the collection of the scenery at the academy on the stage had been set a couple of chairs and a stand covered with a heavy old fringed table cover which was surmounted with a glass of water it was shortly after eight when mr wilde came on the stage and was greeted by what was suggestive of jeers from the gallery but he gazed into that disrespectful region while he wiped his lips and then waded into the subject matter of his lecture without further ceremony his long and bushy hair crowded in front of his ears and nearly to his eyes but it was brushed well off his forehead he wore a low-necked shirt with a turned-down collar and large white necktie a black velvet cutaway coat and vest of the same material knee breeches long black stockings and low shoes with bows a heavy gold seal hung to a watch guard from a fob pocket the poet had no flower in the lapel of his coat in his picturesque attire he was a study that seemed to greatly interest the audience he wore white kid gloves and when he placed his hands on the stand in front of him rested one of his feet on the base of the stand and raised his eyes as though bound to get a good view of the lofty ceiling he began to speak in a voice that might have come from the tomb it grew monotonous and it was the more monotonous since his pronunciation was so strongly english and so odd and even indistinct as to require the closest attention to follow him the sing-song tone and the enunciation so difficult of understanding made the hearing a labour sufficient to keep the audience from being lulled into slumber he carried in his hand a part of the time a manuscript well worn and rumpled which he pretended to read but rehearsed the lecture so frequently published without apparent variation and without local allusion he said in the course of the lecture the thing to be urged was bright and simple dress for the men and women and stately and simple architecture for the cities which is the foundation of art the school of design in each city should be a building of stately and noble design the best example of decorative art should be before the designer that he may do his best work soft shaded colours should be chosen for colour without tone is like music without harmony a mere discord and the dropping of a tint is like the loss of a measure or a note in a grand symphony effect is the essence of good design with a little spray of leaves and a little bird in flight the japanese artist will make one think he has covered the whole surface of a plate a fan or a lacquered cabinet simply because he exactly knows where to place each design the speaker had seen in a school of design in a city whose name he had not the courage to mention a young lady painting an elaborate set of moonlight effects and another a sunset work on china they might paint sunsets if they liked and moonlights if they dared but let them not do it on dinner plates a design which would be suitable for one material 
would not be suitable for another the use to which an object is to be put should be a guide to the subject such subjects as these if beautiful enough would be handsomely framed and hung on walls soup should not be eaten from them nor should they be sent down to the kitchen twice a day to be scrubbed by a handmaid all great art is comprised in local schools and schools of particular cities there never was an italian school but schools of particular cities and all the towns from venice to perugia had their peculiar school of art the question is not what new york or philadelphia is trying to do but what will make a beautiful art for one beautiful city the conditions of art are much more simple than people are prone to imagine they consist chiefly in a clear healthy atmosphere a healthy strong physique among men and women and lastly a sense of individualism about any man or woman this is the sense of art it is the desire of man to express himself in the most beautiful manner possible the grandest art of the world has always been the art of republics too well is it known what kind of art the folly of kings will impose on their people the speaker did not want the rich to possess more beautiful things than the poor but he did want the poor to possess them and every man is poor who cannot create all around lie these conditions if an american were to ask the speaker for subjects he would tell him to go first to the docks of any great city he would tell him to go to the universities to which the young men starting for a pole race leaping from a boat stopping to tie a shoe or playing a game of ball he should go to the meadow and watch the reaper with his sickle if he cannot find subjects for his art in such things he never will find them at all the audience did not care much for greek gods and goddesses and there they were right they did not care much for kings either and there they were right too what one has with him daily that should be by the magic of the hand and the music of the lips expressed gloriously to others the american people should never imitate unless they could make as good a design out the american turkey as the japanese out of his stalk the buffalo and the wild deer are the best for this country for the people know them to this country has been given natural marble more varied in colour than any the greeks ever had but if a building is to be built it should be carved with beautiful designs filled with sculptures or inlaid with beautiful coloured marbles otherwise let people build with the red brick of the puritan fathers end of section an aesthete in undress the sioux city daily journal twenty first of march eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain an aesthete in undress oscar wilde as he is when off the lecture platform views and raiment of the apostle of the beautiful the aesthetic minded reporter called around yesterday forenoon to pay his respects to oscar wilde on applying to the clerk at the hubbard house he was told that mr wilde's servant would take up his card the servant indicated sat by the office stove and was a likely-looking young man with just a tinge of the warm colour of the tropics on his intelligent face so this point is settled that the aesthetic thing in body servants is the light mixed liver ere long the servant returned mr wilde would see the gentleman he said and the reporter followed to the floor above and was ushered into the presence mr wilde greeted the man of the pencil kindly 
in fact much as a forgiving maiden aunt might have done his demeanour throughout was ladylike and his talk garnished with modest old english confidences he expressed his surprise at finding a daily paper in so small a town and his subsequent talk betrayed no hint that he had read the journal's railroad news he had been riding in a carriage through the country back of the town the day before he said and found the brown prairies so sombre and lonely they are so different from england where the grass is green even in winter but he preferred the west to the east new england is much like old england and being a copy is of course uninteresting as copies must be but if he were to live in this country away from civilization from london he would live in the mountains he anticipated much pleasure in his trip to colorado where he was going and was enthusiastic in the distant view of san francisco that city looking toward the east toward asia of his mission oscar wilde spoke briefly kindly reserving that for a paid lecture the people of this country understood making money but do not know how to spend it the rich man builds a hideous square house of marble at an immense expense and there settles down for the rest of his life this was because his knowledge of the beautiful was limited in england the science of the beautiful is cultivated the museum at south kensington is supported by the government at great expense and to it come artisans carpenters furniture makers and every kind of workmen to take notes and improve their taste in no country did the artisan and mr wilde divided the word to show that the mechanic has to do with art occupy so low a place as in america it is the ambition of parents that their sons be physicians or clergymen or professional men of some kind but not artisans this was because due importance was not attached to art in everyday life a lamp-post made two hundred years ago was an object of beauty because the artisan who formed it had good designs to work from mr wilde complimented the cincinnati school of design and the cooper institute at new york he wondered that a great city like chicago had nothing of that sort he had suggested in his second lecture in chicago a museum where artisans could be instructed and thought that something of that kind would be opened while inducting this aestheticism into the newspaper man oscar wilde occasionally moistened his wrists in a preoccupied way with perfume from a tiny flat vial his large liquid eyes rolled upward at times as he became interested something as a schoolgirl's when she speaks to an intimate friend of her latest love affair the full ripe cheeks and long chin of the apostle of the beautiful seemed alike guiltless of razor or beard the heavy black hair that was pushed back and fell almost to the shoulders was not parted exactly in the middle but careless like a little to one side soft leather slippers void of heel backs and navy blue hose silk apparently and embroidered with simple golden daisies ornamented his ample feet the knee breeches were not visible nor in fact much of any garment excepting a dressing gown of some dark woollen stuff with facings of flame-coloured silk a flowing silk tie of colour to match completed the costume neither the tie nor dressing gown were unaesthetically new or tidy but rather in old english disorder as it were but seriously mr wilde is a most entertaining talker his words come mellow and rippling like a meadow brook in his own england judging from his conversation 
and one cannot hear him without believing that he is honest and in earnest, he has read nothing, knows nothing, cares nothing, for the ridicule that crowds the press and convulses the street. Only once did he allude to it slightly, and then only to say that the art movement was not understood. What strikes one most forcibly is utter absence of anything masculine in the appearance of the man, not only his voice and countenance, but his unconscious enthusiasm, his gentleness, his way of arriving at a conclusion, all seem to belong to the sex of which he is the admirer, and by which he is admired. Oscar Wilde is very different from other men. End of section. Oscar Wilde, The Omaha Daily Herald, 22nd of March, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde, The Famous Aesthetic Poet and His Visit to Omaha. Oscar Wilde Interviewed. Mr. Wilde and his servant, and Mr. Vale, his business manager, arrived in Omaha yesterday from Sioux City, and ensconced themselves at the Withnell House. The day without the four walls of the hotel was blustering, and the wind swept occasional eddies of dust along the streets, rendering it very disagreeable for anyone not habituated to the climate who should venture out. Consequently, when the Herald Ambassador was admitted to Mr. Wilde's presence toward evening, after sending up his card, he found that gentleman not prepared to speak advisedly upon the architecture or other salient points of Omaha, and the conversation was rather general in its scope. En passant, it may be remarked for the edification of those who desire to know how Mr. Wilde exemplifies his ideas of dress in private life, that his negligee consists of a black velvet jacket, dark trousers, leather gaiters faced with yellow cloth, and that a maroon silk scarf is tied at his throat, and a handkerchief of like colour and material peeps from the breast pocket of his jacket. Impressions of the West one of the first questions put by the Herald representative was, How do you find our western cities? You have not the lower orders of the eastern cities, replied Mr. Wilde. I find less prejudice and more simple and sane people. He added, however, The west part of America is really the part of the country that interests us in England less because it seems to us that it has a civilization that you are making for yourselves and by yourselves, not the complimentary echo of British thought. American Architecture You have pronounced ideas upon our architecture. I find in all the eastern cities these general characteristics, the fault in American architecture is in an entire want of any definite conception of what style is suitable for your cities. The architecture should be as universal as the country, and as easily understood. Most of the buildings are mere constructions of incongruous anachronisms. A Life's Ambitions You have plans for future work, I presume. For my life, do you mean? And Mr. Wilde laughed merrily and lighted a cigarette as he threw himself back in his chair. Well, I'm a very ambitious young man. I want to do everything in the world. I cannot conceive of anything that I do not want to do. I want to write a great deal more poetry. I want to study painting more than I've been able to. I want to write a great many more plays, and I want to make this artistic movement the basis for a new civilization. The Artistic Movement 
that is the highest and greatest of all your ambitions i take it said the interviewer but do you consider that there is an organised aesthetic school mr wilde replied there is a definite school of criticism and of attitude toward art up to this in england we have always had great artists great portrait painters for instance in the last century and the great landscape painters at the beginning of this age but there has been an entire want of any concentration of artistic power the great men stood as it were in a sort of sublime isolation and their work was not understood by the common people and so not loved by them and so both sides suffered the artists missing the sympathy to which all artists are so sensitive and the people not understanding their work we on the other hand are concentrating all the artistic genius of england so that each art will gain and learn so much from its brother arts that the people will understand and love art more for the decorative arts will indeed become part of their daily life it will make beautiful the common vessels of the house and it will become so natural to beautify their surroundings that even if the people wish to escape from it they will not be able we also are making our artisans artists by giving them beautiful designs and noble models for all the decorative arts of england have been gradually falling into disuse and nothing that was made for the ordinary service of the house was either honestly made or beautiful we look to this as the real strength of our movement it is indeed to become a part of the people's life it must begin not in the scholar's study not even in the studio of the great artist but with the handy craftsman always and by handy craftsman i mean a man who works with his hands and not with his hands merely but with his head and his heart the evil that machinery is doing is not merely in the consequences of its work but in the fact that it makes men themselves machines also whereas we wish them to be artists that is to say men now you see what we want audiences in the west how do your audiences in the west impress you asked the interviewer i should never wish and no man could to have a better audience more simple more understanding more quick in their appreciation than the audiences i had in chicago cincinnati and many of the western cities concerning physical beauty mr wilde remarked that he had seen many men of marvellous physique and many beautiful women in the west and this elicited his opinion that physical beauty is really absolutely the basis of all great and strong art he believes too that all true art work must be wrought by healthy and happy men and women end of section oscar's expectations the omaha daily b twenty third of march eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain oscar's expectations he pines for a sight of the wild jack rabbit and army mule oscar wilde left on the noon train yesterday for san francisco accompanied by his manager mr vale speaking to the b reporter mr wilde said he presumed he had a very tedious and monotonous ride before him on being told that the rugged mountain scenery was very fine he said 
oh how very very beautiful that will be will we see any wild animals from the cars i mean oh yes was the answer you will see jack-rabbits between here and cheyenne and herds of antelope on the mountains with here and there a drove of grizzly bears buffalo and rocky mountain lions how unutterably lovely said the poet is it really so that will be too beautiful the disciple of aestheticism was not dressed in a very tasteful style and looked like big nose george the famous mountain bandit but his voice was mild and pleasant and his smile childlike and bland he is anything but good-looking and in his fur-collared overcoat slouched white hat grey velvet coat and light grey pants and a faded red ribbon at his throat he looked like a travel-stained tourist he will stop at various places in his return from the coast having an immense number of engagements on the books already end of section words with wild ogden daily herald twenty fifth of march eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain words with wild opportune observations of the original oscar oscar wilde arrived in ogden on friday evening on the eastern express train a large number of people were at the depot anxious to get a glimpse of him they went because they were full of curiosity and desirous to see for themselves the man whom the american press has so ridiculed upon arrival he was immediately engaged in conversation with a fellow countryman an irishman of ogden who held him the greater part of the time until supper mr wilde is a young man above the average height he has long dark brown hair which is parted in the middle and hangs down over the neck and shoulders his eyes are large and full they are of a mild dreamy poetic cast yet bright and wonderfully alert his face is clean-shaven when he smiles he shows his upper teeth which in connection with his long face gives him the appearance of a bashful simpleton he wore a green-coloured overcoat lined around the neck and in front with fur a red silk tie and a turned-down collar adorned his neck his pantaloons were grey as was also his broad slouch hat his apparel would go well with a wasatch cowboy the boots he wore were nicely polished were pointed in the toe all of which gave an english aristocratic appearance to his dainty feet when the conversation began to lag and when the crowd became too numerous around the stove of the waiting-room where he had been standing he asked his irish friend for some mormon publications he was then taken up to the newsstand of mr alf low and shown the book of mormon and other works the ogden herald was also handed to him with which he expressed himself highly pleased saying a very fine paper is it mormon he was told it was and was then handed other territorial papers all of which he carefully folded and put away for reference while in conversation here he was handed a bunch of cigarettes one of which he took lit and smoked with the remark to those who offered him you are very kind when the curiosities of mr lowe's shop had been shown him he was taken to the dining-room where it is probable he ate a lily and gazed upon a glass of water when he returned from supper he was tackled by a herald man his eyes did not look calm when he saw he had been tracked but he smiled an aesthetic smile shook hands with the reporter and the following conversation took place reporter you're on your way to salt lake as i learned from the papers of that city oscar wilde 
that is a mistake i go direct to san francisco how long will you remain the tour will occupy about three weeks during which time it is expected i will visit many of the cities on the western coast i will lecture in all i visit hence will be kept very busy but am in hopes that time will be given to visit the yosemite valley and other places of beauty and interest before leaving for the east will you visit salt lake on your return trip I'm not prepared to say but should very much like to as i should hate to leave america without having seen that city here mr wilde again questioned the reporter he asked if there were any flowers in this country what they were called and whether they grew in abundance also if the woods abounded in fierce wild animals and game when he was told that the bear wild cat deer prairie chicken etc were quite numerous he said with a fancy gesture and a poetic voice oh i should so very much like to hunt through the wild woods and the mountains this outburst of enthusiasm was not manifested however until after the report had said that if his arrival here had been about two months later the valley would have been much more beautiful the meadows then bloomed the willow branches hung in lines and vied with the bending grass to kiss the brooks which tripping over their pebbled beds decked leaves and flowers and grass with crystal pearls that shone like golden drops resplendent in the sun then each breeze that fanned the earth brought scents from wild flowers that blossomed over meads of waving green while sweet-songed birds resounded their morning lays tuning one's ears to sounds of melody how do you like the western country as far as you have gone the country this side of the mississippi for a long distance i did not like so well but that which we have travelled over to-day is grand i like the air it is so fresh and free i rode on the platform all day the sky is so clear enthusiastically i like the grey stones and the high hills it must be a beautiful country when the vegetation is growing considering the delight variations and beauties as it is to-day i see by the papers that you were to lecture in denver colorado how do you like that place the papers say a great many things of me that are not true i have lectured in no place west of omaha when do you return to england very likely i will return in may but will first visit the new england states and canada at this juncture the time was up and it was necessary that mr oscar wilde should get ready for the westbound train he therefore grasped the hands of the reporter and bid good-bye not however before the latter had expressed the desire to have him stay in ogden and lecture on his return from the coast to which desire mr wilde partially yielded stating i shall be glad to do so if it can be made possible on my return end of section ed burn and oscar wilde the logan leader seventh of april eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain ed burn and oscar wilde editor leader oscar wilde the darling aesthete passed through our city on friday the twenty fourth on his way to san francisco he is the son of sir william wilde who was an eminent oculist and surgeon oculist to queen victoria his mother was a poetess and novelist oscar had splendid school opportunities but neither at school nor college did he manifest much ability during the last three years he has been the leader of a class of persons in london society who profess to find the secret of life in beauty 
and who spend their time, or fancy they do, in the enjoyment of the beautiful, where less gifted mortals fail to find it. Some months ago he published a volume of poems, which contained some good verses, but was quite severely condemned by some critics. He has been in the United States since January 2nd, 1882. Mr. Wilde is a young man above the average height. He has long dark brown hair, which is parted in the middle, and hangs down over the neck and shoulders. His eyes are large and full. They are of a mild, dreamy, poetic cast, yet bright and wonderfully alert. His face is clean-shaven. When he smiles he shows his upper teeth, which, in connection with his long face, gives him the appearance of a bashful simpleton. He wore a green-coloured overcoat, lined around the neck and in front with fur. A red silk tie and a turned-down collar adorned his neck. His pantaloons were grey, as was also his broad slouch hat. His apparel would go well with a wasatch cowboy. The boots he wore were nicely polished, were pointed in the toe, all of which gave an English aristocratic appearance to his dainty feet. He was tackled by your reporter after he had dined. After Mr. Wilde had dined, reporters never dine, they eat when they get a chance. A long interview was had during which the Eastie said he would be absent on the coast about three weeks, that he liked our western country very much, that the papers told many untruths about him, that he would not visit Salt Lake, that he had lectured in no place this side of Omaha, that when he returned in May he would visit Canada. He also asked numerous questions about flowers, horses and wild animals in Utah. We gave him a vivid description of the country that we had learned from some book when we were young, which so fascinated him that he paced up and down exclaiming enthusiastically, Oh, I should so very much like to seek the lair of the fierce Wasatch bear, and over the lovely glade track the wild sage hen. Ed and Oscar then clasped hands and parted friends forever. Ed Burn, Ogden, March 27th, 1882. End of section. Oscar Arrives the Daily Record Union, Sacramento, 27th of March, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Arrives. The Apostle of Aestheticism talks plainly. He develops as the poor man's friend what he believes, the creed of his religion. As a fitting introduction to the Apostle of Modern Aestheticism, a record union representative yesterday morning met Oscar Wilde at the depot with a bouquet of the choicest flowers that could be culled from Sacramento's floral wealth, and being received by that gentleman with cordiality, the twain sat down to breakfast and had a chat, which, being unconcluded when train time was up, the apostle and the news gatherer having found themselves upon pleasantly debatable ground, continued the conversation in the cars as they went bayward. Mr. Wilde is one of the best talked-about men of the day. This cultured young English poet is, his friends claim, the most misrepresented of foreigners that ever visited the country. The Oxonian, who is a genial companion and an admirable conversationalist, showed no disinclination to unbosom himself, and the determination being announced to give him for once a perfectly fair show in a representative American newspaper, responded to the questions propounded to him with ready fluency and sincere earnestness. He is scarcely twenty-six years of age, very tall and quite slender. This build gives him the appearance of slightly stooping in the shoulders when he addresses men of ordinary stature. He dresses plainly, to the severity, indulges in a broad turn-down collar, a simple knotted scarf without jewellery, and wears a broad-brimmed white sombrero 
decidedly spanish in style his clean-shaven face is long broadest at the lower jaw with a full round and oversized chin a large and well-developed nose a broad mouth with full lips opening over large prominent teeth the upper lip a shade too short and eyes very full large and handsome and an apology between grey and blue are arched by delicately lined eyebrows his forehead is high narrows as it ascends and on either side his straight brown hair which from a middle parting falls to a level with his chin in unstudied negligence and shades a neck rather long and with a tendency to crane slightly forward the expression of his countenance is very amiable and a constant smile of perfect content rests upon his overfull features which are almost effeminate in apparent lack of vigour and force but which in that respect belie the man whose conversation proves him to be shrewd perfectly self-possessed and entirely able to take care of himself in this world with a chesterfieldian bow he returned his thanks for a buttonhole bouquet a sacramento lady sent by the newsman for the lover of the beautiful and the aesthete settled himself in the cushions of a palace car and signified his readiness to be put upon the categorical rack what he believes the news gleaner opened the ball are we to correctly understand you mr wilde that your belief is that a true love for art for its own sake and in its highest development marks the best forms and systems of civilization most easily attainable the aesthete yes life without industry is barbarism industry without art is barren we should first teach the people to use their hands in the work of art all that is artistic must begin in handicraft devotion to beauty you have been quoted as pronouncing the devotion to beauty and the production of the beautiful as making a man's life immortal would you be understood as erecting that into a creed of a religion of culture the best service of god is found in the worship of all that is beautiful such a worshipper can do no wrong wilfully we should remember that all things worthy should be satisfying the religions of the world too often tell us to love the creator without keeping in view the created things how starved is such a belief it sees the creator and is blind to his work it teaches of him but makes no effort to teach of his work's beauty and grandeur pleasure in one of your addresses mr wilde you speak of the necessity of every household possessing the things that give pleasure to the user and were a pleasure to the maker do i understand from you by that that if we surround ourselves and children by beautiful things and keep both within as you put it the atmosphere of fair things that we will soonest bring the race to the purest state and to despise and utterly forsake the vulgar and coarse and wicked yes indeed the man who lives in such an atmosphere must be a better man a better workman a better citizen and there will follow such a better civilization the mistake in our educational systems has been that we have sought to teach truth abstractly great special truths must grow up in us truth comes to the child through the atmosphere of his surroundings purify that and you purify him surround him by the beautiful the useful and the good and what must result 
the theory of beautiful surroundings that finds expression in europe is true of nations the life of every nation is influenced by its surroundings taine in the history of literature is constantly turning to the hills and the valleys to the scenery of england he could not resist it nor dissociate them from his theme formerly the products of the man's mind were treated abstractly the man was treated abstractly and not as to his surroundings the first thing to teach the boy is to use his eyes his ears and his hands but we are always trying to educate his mind before we give him a mind for mind is creative the child is endowed with intellectual faculties but the mind is the result of growth and i need not say to what extent we control that to a child the teaching of abstract truth is folly the secret of life you conclude one of your lectures with the words the secret of life is in art would you add a word and tell us how the masses can best attain a knowledge and love of art i hope that the masses will come to be the creators in art that is what i mean that art will some time cease to be simply the accomplishment and luxury of the rich but the possession as it is the rightful heritage of all poor and rich alike the difficulty i have felt and met in america is not that there is a lack of interest in art not that they do not love it not that they are not receptive no they have a great love for the beautiful but the difficulty is that they do not hold the handicrafts in greater honour and respect i would dignify labour by stripping it of its degradation and that by developing all that is beautiful in the labourer's surroundings and opening his eyes to it ah oh, i would speak to the hard-working people whom i wish i could reach through the prejudice that shuts them and me away from each other why it is to the mechanics and workers of your country that i look for the triumph that must come why back here in the west i met a railroad repairer a man working out on the line at a hard laborious task it was his daily business he talked with me wanted to know what we are trying to do why that man quoted pope to me analysed his method discussed my positions with me understood me and where he doubted gave his reasons in homely phrases but unmistakably and clearly he took an interest in the best of life was keen kindly receptive and pugnacious in need withal altogether a charming fellow now in england in men of his class such a conversation would be simply impossible here i learn that a man is fairly representative of a myriad the decorative craze mr wilde the decorative art rage as it is called is thought by many to be indulged in to the extreme do you think there's a danger to true art culture in the rush and push in the former line or is it one of the signs of our renaissance oh of course for the people have not had the opportunity in all respects as yet to get on well so they are constantly going wrong still the desire to go at all is something and much has been and is being accomplished but if this desire is to culminate in anything great it must be by the affectionate study of art and beautiful things the truth about 
decorative art like all in art is to be revealed to those who are receptive to the beautiful the present revelation is the cause of the revival in decorative art the drama's place there is one question i much desire to ask you whether you think the drama most popular now the spectacular and the class that appeals more to the fancy and the eye and the emotions than to the intellect and the reason whether it is not a stumbling block in the path to higher art culture no no so far from that being the case the fault i find with the modern stage is the departure from the true spirit that intended it for the pageant in this modern life where we have given up so much of colour so much of the beautiful let us leave on the stage all we can in beauty of dress in richness of scenery in graceful groupings the trouble is the controllers of the stage belittle these spectacular effects by sensational scenes of the most improbable kind and work up all sorts of morbid situations with flying trains and sinking steamers and all that the stage is art in action see how much we have fallen away from that ideal on the stage we should see all we can of rich colour beautiful drapery and grouping and all things that will cultivate a taste among the people for beautiful and chaste things when they thus see how beautiful things can be made by their surroundings they will look to their own and discover possibilities before unknown to them good for america in your first address in america you spoke of the hope of perfection in your movement that you felt there was in america because we are young do you mean by that that the absence of the influence of the architecture the art schools and culture of europe etc is no drawback to our people in art advancement no art is better than bad art i'd sooner the people studied no art than some of the bad art of europe they would be more receptive of the true when it does come to them why sir architecture in england is deteriorating the handicrafts are falling into disrepute against this it is to be said that england has had great examples and eminent exemplars but they have isolated ones like turner they were surrounded by masses that did not appreciate them they had admirers votaries supporters but not in the masses against this non-appreciative spirit we are fighting so i say that a new people not under the dead weight of crowded europe give hope for quicker appreciation of the true and the beautiful as i have said the very absence of tradition with you is the source of your freedom and strength making fun of him you have been much caricatured and your theories much satirised how has that affected your judgment of the american people i rarely think of it when i do i think nothing of it it does not in the slightest degree represent to me the strength or the sanity of a great modern nation one must always remember that wisdom does not brawl upon the street the voice of folly is always shrill and very loud but it passes away of one thing i am convinced and that is the fool has no influence he may for the moment that is all harper's monthly criticises you in a little dash this month and dislikes your extravagance and eccentricities 
do you call that a little dash i call it as cruel as it is unjust suppose it is true admitting it for argument's sake only that people come to hear me out of curiosity well i get a hearing and still hope to do some good in my day but it isn't true i found in america truly appreciative audiences true caricature and misrepresentation have excited curiosity why in chicago i had an audience of three thousand people and spoke for an hour and twenty minutes and only one man left the room before the close and he came to apologize for the necessity requiring it that speaks of appreciation at least for respectful hearing i think the west is very fair to those who address it so you do not fear ridicule indeed no i want what i have to advance to stand on its merit i ask no quarter i have not the remotest doubt as to which side will win i think the school i am in will win because it represents great principles and they are working for us no matter what i may do blistering the press but has the press given you a fair show oh the papers they run in grooves a good deal they might just as well take the other side the praise of the man who can't understand me is quite as injurious as the abuse of any enemy can be there is no limit to the nonsense some men will write if it raises the circulation of the paper from one to two an opinion what do you think of this country so far as you have had opportunity to observe does it come up to or fall below your preconceived ideas mr wilde with a merry twinkle of the eye my dear sir i was sensible enough pardon me not to have any preconceived ideas about it i came to see and learn well thus far i find far more independence of thought here than in europe the commercial spirit you are reported as saying that the commercial spirit in england is killing nobility and purity coupling this with your expression of hope for art culture in america are we to infer that you think this nation of traders less sordid than your people i mean the spirit of commerce as misunderstood some of the most beautiful cities have been built by commercial men as genoa florence venice but in england men have been made machines quite as soulless and ignoble as the whirling wheels of machinery i don't speak now of the flood of bad patterns and ugly designs as resulting but i speak of the injury to the workmen themselves so deep that they cannot realize the nobility of life in america i don't think it goes to that extent i don't think the american workman will submit to such a position art expression i have read in emerson's essay on the poet these words the beautiful rests on the foundations of the necessary do you agree with that sentiment mr wilde the moment art becomes a luxury it loses for it must arise out of necessity all art is the expression of the noble and joyous in life luxury gives us the gaudy the vulgar the transient it may help but it never creates art for instance luxury gives great prices for french landscapes of the modern school now while i admire french landscapes the indulgence by luxury in them 
does not dignify american handicraft at all or help home effort an art question but mr wilde if surroundings have so great an influence does not the architecture the great models the atmosphere of art in europe account for the preference familiarity with the beautiful in architecture does not belittle it with him who appreciates it it grows on you italy is the loveliest country of europe but italy gives you no landscapes from her studios you speak of the broad field for the study of the lofty and the beautiful and awe-inspiring in california well it is not necessary to have great natural wonders at home to develop art it is in the eye and the heart of the artist where we find the secret of success the landscapes of italy are all satisfying and so the italian artist does not reproduce them you must go to the cloudy the misty lands for great landscape painters the blue and the golden light of italy is unapproachable an american woman mr wilde has written of beauty in lines with which you will accord i presume mrs sarah j hale never heard the lines they are beauty was lent to nature as the type of heaven's unspeakable and holy joy where all perfection makes the sum of bliss mr wilde yes certainly copyright by the way mr wilde what do you in england think of the international copyright question that a country gets small good from a literature it steals but you are retaliating now very little it don't change the principle why in all your cars i find newsmen selling my poems stolen i never can resist the impulse to read out a lesson on the heinousness of the offence but there is a genuine american edition oh yes by a boston house i heard you were getting out a work in america that is a volume of poems by a friend rennell rod an english officer it will appear in philadelphia why not issue it in your own country i desire to introduce the author to the american public i think it will appreciate him it will have an introduction that i have written in that i point out the strong quality of this young man's work and show how the artist can best use the life around him young workers in art are apt to go too blindly in they perceive too often without rule or principle and don't cultivate our sense of beauty they are slow to perceive how all art is a desire for perfection conclusion the conversation was continued at much length what has been given exemplifies its tone and character wilde has an apparently affected drawl in his speech but it is evidently his normal style of delivery divest him of his flowing locks add crispness to his enunciation and vigour to his tone and there would be nothing about him to give ground for ridicule except perhaps his expressive and languidly poetic eyes the almost boyish fullness and effeminacy of his face and the full lips that speak of the possible voluptuary his friends on the train complained bitterly of the rudeness of the crowds at small stations on the road beyond the sierras especially of the attempt at corinne utah of a grotesquely accoutred crowd with a band that sought to invade the car some of the crowds will probably be chagrined to now learn that the oscar wilde many of them saw 
was not the oscar wilde but was that inimitable comedian john howson of the comely barton opera troupe who being on the train several times put on his bunthorn wig contorted his features into an admirable resemblance of the ever-dwelling smile on oscar's countenance and showed himself at times to save his friend and to have a bit of fun on his own account at sacramento there was no embarrassing staring at wilde and no crowd gathered about him he was not subjected either to any vulgar inquisitiveness by the great crowd on the oakland ferry-boat the people hunted him out glanced at him and passed on without offensive staring mr wilde expressed often his warm admiration for what he had seen of america and its people in all his conversation many will be disappointed to learn he never used the words superlatively beautiful ravishingly beautiful too utterly utter too too or any phraseology to which ridicule and satire have given point as to aesthetes the sunflower concerning the sunflower which is in the popular mind so intimately associated with wilde's name it may be added that he has himself explained about in a lecture in these words you have heard i think a few of you of two flowers connected with the aesthetic movement in england said i assure you erroneously to be the food of some aesthetic young men well let me tell you that the reason we love the lily and the sunflower in spite of what mr gilbert may tell you is not for any vegetable fashion at all it is because these two lovely flowers are in england the two most perfect models of design the most naturally adapted for decorative art the poet aesthete and romantic philosopher will remain on the coast three weeks and will put in one day at sacramento when all the curious can for themselves see the present lion of curiosity these things impressed the press representative yesterday after a long conversation with mr wilde and after observing him in a great crowd of representative people and making note of their expressions he is scholarly studiedly polite a gentleman shrewd fearless observant self-possessed and of poetic temperament he has been considerably misrepresented and unduly ridiculed he is apparently sincere and earnest he is however ludicrously odd to the american eye in personal appearance is eccentric or affected in this regard and lacks the manifestations of manliness in his countenance and frequently in his manner if he was more an object of curiosity than respect to californians yesterday it was due to the latter causes to the ridicule showered on him at the east and in part to the present public conception of the tendency of his teachings end of section Oscar Wilde, The Daily Examiner, San Francisco, 27th of March, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oscar Wilde, An Interview with the Apostle of Aestheticism, The Sunflower Poet Described, A Talk About Art, His Favourite Poem, The New School of Poetry and Design Explained oscar wilde arrived in this city at noon yesterday by the overland train the news that he was on the train induced hundreds of curious persons to go over to the oakland depot in order to catch a first glimpse of this new lion to these persons a cursory inspection revealed a tall well-built clean-shaven eccentrically dressed young man with remarkable features a sombre melancholy face lighted up at intervals in the conversation going on around him 
and directed entirely at him by a frank pleased smile that came readily and passed away quickly leaving the face in repose as before wherever he moved the crowd guided by a large wide-brimmed white slouch hat he wore followed not obtrusively but quietly and respectfully mr wilde was dressed in a style that would attract general attention anywhere outside of an artist's studio or chambers and there was no need for any one to point in order to identify him from beneath his large white hat fell long light brown hair reaching in somewhat straggling masses to the shoulders half hiding a face inclined to sallowness a close-fitting black velvet frock coat showed off strong square shoulders manly waist and hips pants done brown highly polished pointed shoes a velvet waistcoat low wide collar puce-coloured tie folded wide yellow gloves completed the appearance in dress of the outward man a boutonniere somewhat withered made up of heliotropes a brightly foliated daisy and a tuberose decorated his coat front a dark olive green summer overcoat was carried carelessly over his left arm and the right hand when not resting lightly against the chin as if aiding the poet in thought grasped a thick ivory cane thus the object of curiosity appeared to those who yesterday saw him crossing the bay to this city a first glimpse of the bay a quiet conversation with oscar wilde would have disclosed nobler material than dress anomalistic of the man unfortunately this converse could not be had yesterday in the rush of car and boat each bend in their rapid onward flight cityward revealing to the ardent lover of nature scenes of picturesque beauty silencing ordinary speech and thought a changing panorama of soft murky outlines and hazy tints of colour the centre always the sea-green bay spangled with grassy yerba buena and the gold of alcatraz which sparkled like brilliant splotches against indistinct backgrounds of black and indigo colouring the far-off woody mountain summits and curving shorelines the golden gate lost in a sunlit mist beyond san francisco's hills roadways houses dimly seen at its feet a mist from which rose the tall straight masts of merchant ships tapering above the mist that hung over the wharves not alone the poet but every one ending the weary journey here were impressed by what to nearly all was the first view of the uttermost occident mr wilde was met at port costa by several persons who for one reason or another laid a claim to his attention among them an examiner representative all were met with the quiet dignified courtesy of a gentleman and a man of the world in speaking mr wilde preserves a cold but polite and attentive air and it is only when some favourite subject is touched upon that the face lights up and the grey-green eyes seek those of the person who has aroused his deeper attention and smiles encouragement or appreciation the long rather thin face the pointed chin and well-shaped nose seem to feel the influence of the smile and an otherwise homely face appears momentarily handsome a second later the spurt of enthusiasm or interest having passed the face becomes again immobile the eyelids lower the eyes grow dull with a far-away glance or seek the ground as the tall body bends slightly to come to a nearer level with its companion mr wilde's talk talking mr wilde speaks in a low melodious tone the broad english pronunciation being harmonised almost to rhythm 
he gesticulates very little and from constant practice has a habit of brushing loose hairs back behind his ears after apologising for the intrusion the reporter asked mr wilde if the trip overland was a pleasant one partly he replied but excessively long and tedious does the mountain scenery meet your expectations hardly i saw it at an unfavourable time i suppose the view from the top of the sierra nevadas however was beautiful do you like our country mr wilde or are you disappointed with america and americans there is very much here to like and admire the further west one comes the more there is to like the western people are much more genial than those of the east and i fancy that i shall be greatly pleased with california mr wilde merely smiled when told that california audiences would never think of showing him disrespect and the only thing that might appear annoying to him will be the curiosity of all classes to see the man who has lately been so much read and talked about i like your country and its people he said as though apologising for the latter there is something quickening in the young life of a powerful nation there is a wonderful opportunity for the growth and expansion of art in a country where a national life is unfolding but there are too many amateurs here amateur art is worse than no art a dissertation on poetry reporter mr wilde do your admirers believe that you have created a new school of poetry oscar wilde they certainly should not that is if i have any admirers the pre-raphaelite school to which i belong owes its origin to keats more than to any one else he was the forerunner of the school as was phidias of grecian art dante of the intensity passion and colour of italian painting later burne jones in painting and morris rossetti and swinburne in poetry represent the fruit of which keats was the blossom the turn which the conversation had taken had evidently aroused mr wilde from apathy for his face and manner showed that he was thoroughly interested in the theme the reporter improved the occasion to remark judging from the tenor of your own poems i fancy that charmides pronouncing the name with a soft accent is your favourite poem mr wilde char charmides he replied correcting yes that is my favourite poem i think it my best it is the most finished and perfect the people of america have taken very kindly to my arwe imperatrix however perhaps a feeling of nationality prompts this choice probably so does the sonnet to liberty voice your political creed you mean the sonnet beginning not that i love thy children whose dull eyes see nothing save their own unlovely woe whose minds know nothing nothing care to know no that is not my political creed i wrote that when i was younger mr wilde is twenty-six now perhaps something of the fire of youth prompted it mr wilde's recital of the lines was surprisingly impressive and pleasing a perfect modulation and an earnest almost pathetic tone giving the recital deep interest if you would like to know my political creed he said after a short pause read the libertis sacra fames i think it is the seventh sonnet the sonnet referred to is as follows albeit nurtured in democracy 
and liking best that state republican where every man is king-like and no man is crowned above his fellows yet i see spite of this modern fret for liberty better the rule of one whom all obey than to let clamorous demagogues betray our freedom with the kiss of anarchy wherefore i love them not whose hands profane plant the red flag upon the piled-up street for no right causes beneath whose ignorant reign arts culture reverence honour all things fade save treason and the dagger of her trade and murder with his silent bloody feet his views on poetry mr wilde one of your critics has denounced your poetry as impure and immoral a poem replied mr wilde is well written or badly written in art there should be no reference to a standard of good or evil the presence of such a reference implies incompleteness of vision the greeks understood this principle and with perfect serenity enjoyed works of art that i suppose some of my critics would never allow their families to look at the enjoyment of poetry does not come from the subject but from the language and rhythm art must be loved for its own sake and not criticised by a standard of morality the conversation turning somewhat upon his life mr wilde said that he felt proud of his irish birth and parentage i live in london for its artistic life and opportunities he said there is no lack of culture in ireland but it is nearly all absorbed in politics had i remained there my career would have been a political one when do you expect to return to london mr wilde if lecturing does not kill me very soon then you do not like lecturing yes i do he responded quickly i like lecturing because it brings me face to face with those i desire should hear me in england this is impossible by this time the train had run into the new depot on long wharf and the passengers filed into the waiting-room here the conspicuous figure of the coming lecturer attracted general attention even the shaggy fur overcoat made famous by de maurier's sketches in punch caused a crowd to gather where the porter laid it with the valise in the corner the ferry-boat on the ferry-boat mr wilde placed himself so that his back was turned to the crowd the sights on the bay interested him greatly and he asked many questions about the city whose streetways appearing like huge bleached ribs of a gigantic skeleton with the head pointing oceanward were distinctly visible he asked many questions about the chinese and had the chinese quarters pointed out to him speaking of chinese art he said that it possesses no element of beauty the horrible and grotesque appearing to be standards of perfection their art and music he said are extraordinary developments of national life i have seen much that is admirable in japanese art but nothing of excellence in chinese art when i was a lad i heard a chinese fiddle or so it was called at the paris exposition but i could discern no music in it when the shah of persia was in london the only music he cared for was the violin in answer to a question as to whether the harbour is fortified alcatraz and fort point were pointed out mr wilde impressed all those with whom he came in contact as being a very perfect gentle knight 
his manner is courteous deferential and self-possessed his language clear and forcible without ever descending to those excesses commonly attributed to him as daily talk nothing in his manner would attract unusual attention and certainly not ridicule the market street slip reached mr wilde and his agent mr vale took a carriage for their hotel end of section oscar wilde's views the morning call san francisco twenty seventh of march eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain oscar wilde's views he expresses some characteristic ones to a call reporter he caustically reviews his reviewers and tells why he loves the sunflower and lily his arrival here yesterday oscar wilde arrived here yesterday on the overland train a call reporter who met him at port costa was introduced to a tall large-faced man with pleasant light brown eyes winning smile muddy complexion and a charming manner the two things about the gentleman which have given gilbert's pen and de maurier's pencil such an amount of material to work upon are the use of extravagant and unusual adjectives in praise of art or anything artistically pleasing and an unusual style of dress gilbert has outrageously but brilliantly burlesqued the first de maurier has faithfully reproduced the other together with a heavy sensuousness in wilde's face when in repose on the train yesterday he wore a wide-brimmed white felt hat a velvet jacket concerning the fit of which he should have a word with his tailor and ordinary trousers and shoes the striking features of his costume were his cravat and handkerchief so much of the latter was shown that it can be classed as part of his costume they were both apparently from one piece of material and were of a startlingly brilliant yellow a bouquet of wild flowers pinned to the lapel of his jacket and his long straight light brown hair completed the peculiarities of his appearance deprived of them he would be voted on sight by the average american a strapping big clever fellow the much advertised aesthet in conversation quickly showed himself to be a man of quick perceptions deep insight and practical views in the hour and a half's trip in mr wilde's company the reporter conversed with him on subjects ranging from chinese art to the cause of the muddiness of the sacramento river any subject he was not already familiar with he displayed a vivid interest in being informed about impressions of our people in the course of the conversation the reporter asked have you been in this country long enough to have formed any general impression about it and its people well this country is too large to admit of its being comprehended in one general impression in fact no one impression would answer for two regions of this country i find not only different degrees but different kinds of development in different cities my various impressions of them may be stated in detail in the future what asked the reporter aghast you propose to write a book about us human nature may be hardened to almost any degree of endurance mr wilde responded laughingly i may even dare to write a book that mine enemies may read and criticise it if you are not yet prepared to give impressions regarding the eastern states you of course are not regarding this state not regarding the state certainly but i must say that after the brown barrenness of the states and the endless snows of the mountains 
it was very joyous to me to see the harmony of colour nature has painted upon the california hillsides and plains we have crossed to-day californians always expect that much praise yes interrupted mr wilde and i have another pleasant impression about this state the names of its towns now in one of the states i stopped in a place called gregsville a shocking name the aesthete shuddered now is that not the ultimate of vulgarity why not gregtown or gregs but gregsville here you have beautiful names and he ran over with every evidence of delight a score of the euphonious spanish names of the coast county towns but you have yet to visit the mountain counties where they have murderers gulch hangtown etc what are they compared to gregsville proper they at least convey an idea an association and the reporter interrupted in order to restore if possible mr wilde's tranquillity and boldly asked what mr wilde is your own definition of the english renaissance of art concerning which we have been chiefly misinstructed by the satirists yes satire has paid the usual homage which mediocrity pays to genius blinding the public to what is noble and beautiful then the satirists have not followed this subject sufficiently close to outline it not only those who have written of it but all those who have not asserted it are supremely ignorant of the work that morris rossetti burne jones and swinburne and keats admirers have undertaken to know nothing about these great men is one of the necessary elements of english education and to disagree with three-fourths of england on all points is one of the first elements of sanity which is a deep source of consolation in all moments of spiritual doubt this savage sword thrust at his english burlesquers was delivered with a charming coolness the reporter after a moment's admiration of the poet's vigorous prose again returned to the attack and said but your comprehension of the art renaissance after all else that we have heard will be doubly acceptable english renaissance well said mr wilde earnestly the english renaissance has been described as a mere revival of the greek modes of thought and again as a mere revival of mediaeval feeling rather i would say that to these forms of the human spirit it has added whatever artistic value the intricacy and complexity and experience of modern life can give it is from the union of hellenism in its breadth its variety of purpose its calm possession of beauty with the adventive the intensified individualism the passionate colour of the romantic spirit that springs out of the nineteenth century in england as from the marriage of faust and helen of troy sprang the beautiful lady euphonia the modern love of landscape dates from rousseau and it is in keats that one discerns the beginning of the artistic renaissance of england he was the forerunner of the pre-raphaelite school speaking of the pre-raphaelites what are they if you ask nine-tenths of the british public what is the meaning of the word aesthetic they will tell you that it is the french for affection or the german for a dado said mr wilde 
switching off slightly to give another vigorous slap at his scoffers. If you inquire about the pre-Raphaelites, you will hear something about an eccentric lot of young men to whom a sort of divine crookedness and holy awkwardness is drawing all the chief objects of art. Yes, but the pre-Raphaelites. Well, said the Aesthete, smiling at the reporter's unesthetic impatience, in the year 1847, a number of young men in London, all admirers of Keats, were in the habit of meeting together and discussing art. They had determined to revolutionise poetry and painting. To do so was to lose, in England, all their rights as citizens. They had those things which the English public never forgives. Youth, power, and enthusiasm. These young men called themselves pre-Raphaelites, because, as opposed to the facile obstructions of Raphael, they thought they had found a stronger realism of imagination, a more careful realism of technique, an individuality more intense. But, of all things, it was a return to nature. Gilbert's Satire your explanation is indeed radically different from that humorous portrait of Gilbert's, the reporter said, vaguely conscious that he had taken down much more than he had taken in. But you must not judge of aestheticism by the satire of Mr. Gilbert, any more than you judge of the strength and splendour of sun or sea by the dust that dances in the beam or the bubble that breaks on the wave. Don't take your critic as any sure test of art, for artists, like the Greek gods, are only revealed to one another. You have found some savage critics in this country, have you not? Yes, like a rainy day, such things are inevitable. But, like a rainy day, I accept them as unpleasant in themselves, but not of a character to make me unhappy, if I only do not notice them. What have you found the American reviewers most object to? The aesthete was thoughtfully silent for a moment, as though trying to determine in his own mind which of the many American objections to his works had been the nearest universal. Then, he said slowly, Well, I suspect some of my verses have come in for the greatest amount of attack, and on the ground of their immorality, as set forth by one Higginson. They insist upon an increased moral sense, or moral supervision of literature, Indeed, one should never talk of a model or an immodel poem. Poems are either well written or badly written. That is all. Mr. Wilde, there is one point I know you could satisfy thousands of call readers upon. By telling me why it is that two certain flowers have become connected with the aesthetic movement in England and said, I hope erroneously, to be the food of some aesthetic young men. Well, let me tell you that the reason we love the lily and the sunflower, in spite of what Mr. Gilbert may tell you, is not for any vegetable fashion at all. It is because these flowers are, in England, the two most perfect models of design, the most naturally adapted for decorative art. The gaudy, leonine beauty of the one, the precious loveliness of the other, giving to the artist the most entire and perfect joy. Coming along the bay, Mr. Wilde frequently expressed his delight with its loveliness, and with the beauty of the surrounding hills. On the train and boat, 
he was the observed of curious hundreds many of whom had apparently made the trip across the bay purposely to see him he hurried from the boat upon its landing and with mr locke drove directly to the palace hotel end of section Low the east Seed, san francisco chronicle twenty seventh of march eighteen eighty two this librivox recording is in the public domain lo the east Seed. arrival of oscar wilde in san francisco sunflower and lily in full bloom the poet's reception on the cars shocked by a yellow handbill and restored by a violet the eight o'clock ferry-boat to oakland yesterday morning carried a committee of reception self-appointed to meet oscar wilde the apostle of aestheticism the committee consisted of manager locke several bohemian club men and the usual flock of reporters that gathers on the railroad approaches to the city when some hapless celebrity is to be waylaid and ruthlessly rifled of his ideas of california the committee having evidently had little more than forty winks of sleep showed on its countenance the aesthetic pallor which bespeaks a true appreciation of utter beauty and a too joyous sympathy with poetic sentiment manager locke as the uncommissioned chairman of the committee hastened to show that the aestheticism of his party was not merely skin-deep by dashing instinctively for the lunch-counter where the too exquisitely utter cooking range was imbuing a plate of fried sausage with the exalted spirit of culinary art the lofty example of the managerial aesthete proudly poised on a stool as high and dangerous as a norman charger and wielding half a yard of steel with the vigour of a thirteenth-century crusader was instantly followed by the committee and the range glowed and flamed in the intensity of its industrial zeal until the sun-kissed citizen in front of it looked like a spot on a harvest moon before the refreshed aesthetes laid down their napkins and readjusted their sunflowers the ferry-boat had touched the oakland side and been made fast this is especially worthy of note as it is the first instance on record where anything but a collector was made fast by touching at oakland the aesthetic committee of reception as the committee filed out to the train for port costa an opportunity was given to note the aesthetic beauties of their attire manager locke who had evidently been studying a cut of a medieval saint had donned a dark blue coat and a bright yellow necktie which contrasted so violently with the unsubdued hue of his moustache that he looked like julian rix's sensational picture of the redwoods on fire each of the bohemian club men sported a large breastpin on which a one-legged silver stalk gazed pensively on a bronze frog as if deliberating whether to go hungry or risk the terrors of strangulation and dyspepsia the reporter of a morning journal which caters to the aesthetic aspirations of jesse and natoma streets and keeps the police department and the aristocracy of minna street mutually intimate boasted that in humble recognition of the coming aesthete he had shaved off his moustache on careful examination this was found to be a fact the other journalists who found themselves attached to the tail of the committee of reception had contented themselves with the most ordinary attempts at aesthetic adornment and by their sameness of colour helped to distract public attention from the party and save it from the suspicion that it was the advance guard of a milliner's picnic or the board of trustees of the oakland cockpit meeting the aesthete the run to port costa was pleasant and rapid flying over broad fields green as the imagination of an aesthetic poet 
and whirling along the pebbly shores of the bay with its sparkling waters blue as the theatrical managers who have not dug into the bonanza of aestheticism the committee of reception met the overland train and oscar wilde at ten a m marcus meyer formerly of the democratic party of san francisco and now the agent of the divine patty conveyed to the committee from the fore platform of the train the pleasant news that the poet had breakfasted he was presented with a magnificent bouquet of sunflowers and camellias by mr woodson at sacramento said the cheerful agent unconscious of the intimation which the remark conveyed the medieval splendour of manager locke's attire gained him an immediate audience with the poet who was in the rear portion of the sleeping car paying his morning devotions to a pansy presented by a venetian aesthete the moment the manager entered the floral sanctuary the door was closed by the poet's coloured valet and the committee was left to its own envious thoughts after minutes which seemed hours to the anxious aesthetes the door of the sanctum was opened and the manager came out hurriedly and looking as if he had been worshipping a thistle or paying a compliment to a nettle manager locke's mistake i ought to have known it myself said he bitterly to mr vale the poet's travelling agent and he took a poster out of his coat-tail pocket and exposed the offensive advertisement what gasped the terrified agent is that the way you've billed him a plain yellow poster without sandhill cranes or lilies or sunflowers not even a line in old english text the guilty manager looked utterly woe-begone not even a marguerite or a frog on the border continued the agent with a withering glance at the offender the manager groaned and hung his head you haven't shown it to him i hope gasped the agent the manager nodded despairingly great caesar exclaimed the agent and he bounded into the poetic retreat the alarmed spectators were about to follow but the valet closed the door and faced the crowd grimly presently the agent reappeared looking very pale where's that camellia that was presented us at reno he anxiously inquired saved by a valet the valet fished the precious souvenir out of a silver ice pitcher and the agent snatching it dashed into the sanctuary once more bring them violets he yelled a moment after to the valet while the coloured servant was climbing over the baggage on the rear platform to reach the box of violets on the roof of the car the audience heard a deep sigh of relief from the sanctuary ah that is so beautiful so joyous put it away vale i feel much better already take another sniff replied the sturdy voice of the agent and immediately the painful suspense of the audience was relieved by hearing a long-drawn inspiration followed by another exclamation of aesthetic gratification how delicious how sweet how surpassing and too utterly sweet is the incense of the wild flowers of the joyous springtime i guess so replied the soulless agent as he handed the poet his cherished bunch of violets and came out to announce that mr wilde would immediately appear to the visitors the rapturous aesthete in a few moments the eminent aesthete stepped through the doorway of the sanctum and bowing to the group of admirers advanced to the middle of the car the poet was still pale from the effects of the severe shock to his sensibilities but the sight of the distant hills purpling in the morning sun completely restored him they looked nice remarked a prosy admirer ah yes how utterly lovely how exquisitely beautiful 
observe the softness of the outline so full of the grace and perfect harmony of nature's handiwork having delivered himself of this rapturous compliment to the wooded peaks of marin the poet clasped his hands and gazed out of the window for some moments lost in the too utterly joyous abstraction of the aesthetic while the poet's eyes were fixed on the environments of the hoary tamil pious the chronicle's representative was making a mental sketch of the midday dreamer and found when the picture was completed that it was an odd one for this outlying post of civilization in an older community the aesthete might have passed with slighter attention but his figure was certainly one calculated to excite the most intense curiosity in california an off-hand sketch of the aesthetic he did not look more outlandish than a trapper from the wilds clad in the trophies of the climb but the outlandishness was of a kind to which western people have not been in the smallest degree accustomed mr wilde's hat was of the sombrero pattern light brown pliable and of itself would not astonish the californian the poet's face was almost boyish and the closer we examined it the more juvenile it seemed it was the face of a man of twenty-one years a long face made up of a pair of eyes set rather deeply a large aquiline nose full lips and a decidedly heavy chin the dress of the poet was not less remarkable than his face and consisted of a short velvet coat rose-coloured necktie and dark brown trousers the lower garments were cut with utterly sublime disregard of the latest fashion but the aesthete had yielded sufficiently to his shoemaker to allow that worthy artisan to fit him with the newest production of his last the poet wore the perennial sunflower in his buttonhole and allowed his brown locks to float over his shoulders and just show enough ambition to curl to prove that they shared the wearer's hatred of the rigidly straight the amount of ink that has been expended in england and america to prove that mr wilde in the dress of aestheticism is a very remarkable person is the best proof that his figure is sensationally uncommon matter of fact and rhapsody the chronicle man had expected to meet an odd-looking person and prepared himself against surprise but as the poet lounged into the railroad car and leaned out of the window to revel in the picture of blue sky and purple hills the reporter forgot his resolution and stared and stared again in mute astonishment what was particularly mystifying was the fact that this strange being who looked as if he had no part in the everyday affairs of our prosy life could not only talk of the matter-of-fact when he pleased like a man of education and refinement but like a man who was capable of deep thought and vigorous conclusions as marcus mayer who has carefully watched the aesthete for days elegantly remarked in forming his estimate of the poet any one who picks him up for a fool will get left and don't you forget it though occasionally willing to show his ability to discuss the affairs of the world of man the aesthete could with difficulty be kept from raving over the world of art he appeared to be able to give points to ruskin in artistic rhapsody and to discount every one but charles warren stoddard whom he so greatly resembled in manner and sentiment that the bohemian club men could scarcely believe that the poet of hawaii had not come back in disguise to greet them with a poetic and tender embrace the aesthetes talk i like your names here so much said the poet after he had fed his soul to satiety on the purple of tamalpais and the blue of the sky over san rafael 
how delightful it is to hear such names as san antonio san pablo and san lorenzo after one's ears have been horribly shocked by such terms as gringsville the poet shuddered as he thought of the presumptuous borough of the east which has proudly taken to itself the title of gringsville the fierce suggestiveness of your western names such as bloody gulch and murderer's bar have in them something of interest he continued but in such a name as gringsville there is nothing but utterly unmitigated and offensive vulgarity Ugh! and again the aesthete's velvet coat shook with the violence of his emotions coming to a stretch of green meadow enriched by the wealth of wild flowers the poet exclaimed with the enthusiasm of a woman and not a very strong type of western woman at that how joyous it is to see a spot of green after one has grown so weary of the desolate stretches of brown and grey the lack of colour in your american landscapes has been to me a source of much regret in the old countries neither the winters nor the summers make much difference for the landscape is always green always full of colour it is a garden throughout the year and there one can at all seasons appreciate to the fullest the beauty and the perfection of nature his criticism of the east when asked how he felt towards his critics of the east the aesthete sighed for those sordid and short-sighted persons who in the blindness of their ignorance of aestheticism know not the rapture that they miss it would be more profitable said he to listen to the sighing of the wind for that tells of the power of the infinite but to listen to those who can only see in the well of truth the reflection of their own substantial ignorance would be time misspent the poet refrained from speaking the kind words of the american people and expressing the unstinted praise of california which distinguished visitors generally bestow before they've reached the oakland wharf i find in the eastern states said he too much of a reflex of english manners and customs and reflections of themselves are not admirable what i like best is the civilization which the people of the west have formed for themselves at this stage of the aesthete's recovery an english admirer thought it advisable to drag him into a controversy on the land league the poet having several times intimated that the st patrick's day celebrations throughout the country had greatly interested him i read of a great demonstration in san francisco on the seventeenth of march said he you had an oration and a magnificent parade and a poem who by the way was the poet don't mention it said one of the paraders he's already dead aesthetic view of the land league the land league said the poet is the most remarkable agitation that has ever taken place in ireland for it has through the influence of america created a republican feeling in ireland for the first time the agitations that preceded it would if successful have resulted in the establishment of a monarchy now success would mean the foundation of a republic do you think so said the british aesthete with a glare i don't think so i know it said the poet with so much energy that a second after his nervous system utterly collapsed and hastily apologising he staggered back to his sanctum 
and for half an hour had to be treated to fresh applications of violets with an occasional whiff of the reno camellia and mr woodson's floral offering arrival in this city on arriving at the oakland ferry and during the passage the poet was the observed of all but though his strange appearance provoked many smiles he was treated with the courtesy of silence by the curious crowd the only question he deigned to ask about the city which he viewed from the upper deck of the steamer where he stood poised on one leg like the decorative fowl of aestheticism was have you no old ruins in your city when told that the mission dolores boasted of an old church and a number of adobe shanties the poet's face brightened but the joy was short-lived presently borne on the wings of the western wind came the odoriferous offerings of the waterfront churned into aggressive life by the ferryboat and the poet with an appealing look at mr locke turned and fled to the cabin on arriving at the san francisco side the poet was adroitly whisked into a carriage and driven to the palace hotel he will remain some weeks on this coast and meditates a visit to japan his fellow passengers including john howson the actor speak of him in the kindest manner and tell sorrowfully of the reception which he got at corinne where forty bogus aesthetes with big sunflowers and a terrible brass band serenaded him End of section. The Only Oscar. The Daily Report. 27th of March, 1882. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Only Oscar. Arrival of the poet and pioneer of the new aesthetes. A pen picture of the patron of the sunflower and lover of the lily how he appears in the garish light of a california sunday his manners his words and his ideas oscar wilde the disciple of the intense the prophet of the utterly two two arrived in san francisco yesterday morning by the overland train he was met at port costa by manager locke of the bush street theatre under whose pecuniary auspices the lily worshipper comes to this coast and by a heavy delegation of journalistic interviewers to whom he in due time submitted himself first he and his manager and manager locke had a little business confab in the alleged poet's private compartment of the sleeping car and then the a p emerged with languid step drooping eyelids and wide loose smile to greet the waiting newspaper men he was attired in a broad-brimmed light drab soft felt hat a velvet coat brown trousers a rose-coloured silk necktie and varnished shoes with very pointed toes his hair hung or rather stuck out down to the collar of his coat a handkerchief or what might have been one of the same colour and material as his necktie protruded in a rumpled bunch from the outside breast pocket of the coat and some faded wild flowers adorned the lapel impression du wild the newspaper men on being presented to mr wild and invited to take a seat with him removed their hats mr wild did not remove his seeing which the daily report representative at once resumed his tile and wore it as long as mr wild did his in other words to the end of the interview as wild left the oakland ferry-boat and walked to the carriage to enter a hack that was waiting to convey him to the palace hotel a lady in the crowd of bystanders was heard to remark that oscar wilde why i thought he was a gentleman and she had not seen the hat episode at port costa either mr wilde condescended to converse in low tones with the newspaper men he considered himself somewhat disappointed with the continent of america there being in his opinion a sad lack of colour and variety about its great landscapes 
he had been ineffably bored and distressed by the vast brown levels over which the central and union pacific men had been inconsiderate enough to build their transcontinental railroad not knowing wilde was coming and the snow had wearied him too the change to the green grass and varied foliage of california had therefore been very joyous our working classes he had also it seemed been partly saddened and partly inspired by the lack of appreciation of the truly beautiful and the really artistic which he had observed in this large and vulgar land inspiration and hope had however been aroused in his velvet bosom by the fact that the working classes of the united states were actually free men and not merely nominally free men and actually slaves as were those of england they were therefore at liberty to go in for the intense and brace up to the transcendental as it were and his mission was to give them a leg up in that direction at one dollar a leg however as the mohammed of the new art movement mr wilde is hardly as supremely satisfactory as he might be he is all but the very reverse as a britisher who has come across the ocean to tell americans how to attain the beautiful and worship the truly lovely mr wilde is hardly a representative of his own profession or an exemplar of his own aims he is a rather untidy person and does not suggest even personal cleanliness in the poet of the aesthetic and the herald of the latest renaissance frayed and grimy shirt cuffs are disappointing and a wretchedly ill-fitting coat wrinkled all up the back of the shoulders is a dreadful shock to all beholders to say nothing of the trousers which are evidently english besides mr wilde's teeth were not submitted to the professional eye and hand of a dentist in early life a disadvantage which in later life has not attracted as much attention as it might have from the person principally concerned the leader of the aesthetes is in brief an untidy prophet and is not as clean as the average english gentleman prides himself on being seen upon the streets of san francisco by an ignorant and benighted american who had never heard of charmides or red panthea mr wilde would be taken for a corn doctor in reduced circumstances or a dethroned king of pain that mr wilde believes himself to know a great deal is evidenced by his poems that he believes american working men to know very little is evidenced by a remark he made about a miner with whom he conversed on his passage through nevada why said mr wilde he quoted four lines from pope he actually did and i was so pleased to see that men of his class read such authors i should dearly have liked to have seen that man's home this very complimentary allusion to a man who preferred to express himself in the words of an old poet instead of puzzling his listeners by becoming a new poet himself was a pretty good clue to the knowledge mr wilde has of the intellectual status of the americans whom he comes to teach oscar wilde is very vain vanity sticks out to use an aesthetic term in all he does says and looks for example he remarked to the daily report representative that he had been particularly struck by the lack of personal beauty in the chinese he had seen and he considered that the lack of personal beauty had had its effect was reflected in the absence of beauty which their works of art showed their decoration being involved and obscure and the effects simply grotesque yet mr wilde professes to be ready to lead the world into realms of newer and more perfect artistic beauty and mr wilde is not beautiful himself quite the reverse his face is homely his figure is ungainly and his manners are not very good talking about his manners the new arrival's demeanour is very peculiar it is exceedingly effeminate and would lead the listener and observer to the conclusion that oscar was a mother's boy that he had first been endowed with his mother's mentality then instructed at her knee and through her lips and altogether pretty thoroughly coddled and spoiled as such boys generally are pre-eminently english himself 
after a certain fashion mr wilde expressed regret that he should have found the american people so anglicised the daily report representative informed him that we were certainly anglicised a good deal just at present but not enough to hurt that our adoption of english modes and fashions was merely a craze of the hour and that next year we might be as german or russian as before we were english we were french the poet admired very much the names of california towns and stations san pablo he thought was just quite too lovely for anything and he rolled his eyes at san rafael the reporters maintained a discreet silence regarding geyserville national city petrolia shingle town yokumville ubet yankee jim red dog linkville shingle springs and twenty-six mile house for oscar looked absolutely ill when he spoke of a place called griggsville somewhere in the east mr wilde who names his poems impression du matin la bella donna della mia mente amor intellectualis impression du voyage etc thought it was too awfully dreadfully vulgar to append to the name griggs the word vil forgetting perhaps that old griggs had as good a right to tack vil on to his shebang as wilde had to affix a latin or greek title to an english poem marcus r meyer the distinguished dramatic agent and democrat who had had the privilege of travelling across the continent with oscar confided to the reporters his opinion that wilde is no sardine and anybody who picks him up for a damned fool will get left that was precisely the impression mr wilde gave the daily report representative if wilde had been born in the united states and had by a kind providence been denied pen and ink and preserved from the perusal of poetry he would very likely have made a fortune as a travelling physician and would have attracted the attention by carriages and four academic robes and the other favourite advertising methods of that class which he now attracts by peculiarity of dress and affectations of speech and manners mr wilde is quite a shrewd young man and probably knows every time on which side his bread is buttered he is quite careful to avoid expression of opinion upon topics which would have an effect upon the size of the audiences at his lectures and changes or stops the conversation adroitly when he can rudely when he must as soon as dangerous ground seems to have been reached his conversation is exceedingly wordy and delivered with an air of superiority and authority which might with some listeners cover up its vagueness and indistinctness what ideas the boss aesthete may have in conversation are clouded by his words to such an extent as to lead to the belief that the speaker himself is not as certain about them as he might be one could imagine a spiritualistic medium who had graduated at oxford and read much poetry talking in very much the same strain at charter oak hall on a warm sunday afternoon as a proof of the vagueness spoken of it may be said that the three very intelligent gentlemen who yesterday interviewed mr wilde for the morning papers have had for their reports to-day to draw upon their own resources very largely in order to supply a tolerably connected and intelligible conversation and one of the enterprising gentlemen has evidently expended ten cents on the seaside edition of wilde's lecture on the english renaissance and made mr wilde's conversation consist of extracts from it as for the daily report representative he remembers that mr wilde embroidered his sentences considerably but he cannot recall anything original or striking that he said travellers have before rejoiced in the green of california noted its spanish nomenclature admired the line of its coast range said its chinese were not pretty and professed a desire to remain in california longer than their money-making engagements elsewhere would permit but they have not been able to do it in quite the same style as oscar for example when he says merely i should like to visit japan he says it with such a rolling eye such a sweeping smile 
such a languid accent and such a general air that the unaccustomed hearer is really at first almost forced to believe that mr wilde has given him a new revelation of the beautiful till he pulls himself together and remembers that he could have said the same thing himself and said it just as well perhaps better had he thought it worth while or that anybody cared to know his wants and wishes mr wilde was driven to the palace hotel when he landed and will lecture tonight at platt's hall upon the english renaissance end of section